Good, uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, State Bar Committee of Bar Examiners uh, uh, members and staff. Uh, I'm Robbie Brody, the chair of CBE. Welcome to our uh, meeting today and tomorrow. Today is Friday, August 21st, uh, 2020. It looks like we have all of our, our members that are planning to attend the meeting today here, except for Dr. Bolton, who I, oh, and I see Dr. Bolton is, is here now. Good morning, Dr. Bolton. Um, uh, before I ask um, uh, Ms. Wong to take the role, I want to say that one of the most amazing things about uh, volunteering with the state bar, uh, although we are a, uh, an organization that serves the court uh, with respect to lawyers and lawyering in our state, is the uh, amazing contributions that we get from non-lawyers who are on our committees. Uh, I, it has been my experience that our public members, which is what we call our, our non-lawyer members, uh, uh, sometimes bring the most uh, to a discussion. And that's certainly been true with the Committee of Bar Examiners. In fact, I can remember when I first joined this uh, committee as a volunteer four years ago, I remember sitting and listening to a fellow CBE member, and that member was so thoughtful and eloquent and uh, uh, impressive with their comments that I was sure the person was a law professor and it was a public member. Of course, I'm talking about Dolores Heisinger. So uh, good morning, Dolores. And I, I say that by way of introduction for the newest member of the Committee of Bar Examiners, who's Dr. Michael Cow, who's in, on my screen up uh, next to me, uh, is our newest uh, new addition to the CBE. And I think that you are going to find that he's awesome. Uh, Dr. Cow is a graduate of the Medical College of Wisconsin, uh, a state with only two medical schools. And the one Dr. Cal went to uh, is consistently ranked as one of the best medical schools in the US. It's also where my GI doctor went and I love her. So Dr. Cal, wow, well, welcome to the uh, Committee of Bar Examiners. Uh, I, I, I hope that it is enriching for, for you as it has been for our other volunteer members. Um, Having said that, let me ask you, Ms. Um, Wong, if you'll take the role of, of all members today. Sure. Esther Lin. Here. Anjali Agatha. Here. James Bolton. Here. Michael Kao. Here. Alex Chen. Present. James, <clears throat> James Efty. Present. Karim Gongara. Present. Dolores Heisinger. Here. Michael Iseri. Here. Larry Kaplan. Here. Paul Kramer. Mr. Kramer. Paul, you are muted. Alex Lauren. Here. Bethany Pig. Here. Vince Reyes. Here. And Chair Robert Brody. Present. Okay, thanks very much. And we, we did receive word that uh, uh, David Torres uh, is in trial at this time, and Judge Shelley Toriaba was uh, uh, also uh, otherwise engaged today. But uh, absent those two, we have our members, and of course, our new member, uh, Dr. Cow. I, I was going to go around and ask everybody to say a little bit about themselves for, for our new member, but my understanding is that we have another new member who will be starting at our next meeting. This is a, a Supreme Court appointment to replace uh, our past chair, Jim Fox, who passed away. 
uh, but he had been appointed for another term and I believe that his replacement is going to be uh, appearing at our next meeting. We also have one additional opening, which is a Senate confirmation appointee to replace Amy. I'm sorry, what was her name? I'm always blanking on that. Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Judith Gillespie. Name. Yeah, Ms. Gillespie, who, who had to bow out after being appointed. So maybe we'll have two. So Dr. Cow, if you don't mind, I know we're, we're all very mysterious looking, but maybe at our <laughs> next meeting, uh, all will be uh, revealed. There are, uh, we, we also are going to have a new uh, chair of the CBE and vice chair and I believe that those appointments are going to be announced by the Supreme Court uh, next week. So this is my last meeting as chair, but I think the introductions would best be saved for uh, when we have our, our new uh, members and our new chair and vice chair. And um, there are a couple of us who I believe hope to be reappointed to the Committee of Bar Examiners and those announcements will also be made uh, next week. So uh, stay tuned. Now is the time for uh, public uh, comment. And of course, uh, uh, Dr. Cal, you're probably getting a, a, a taste of this. We do receive a fair amount of public comment in writing uh, between our meetings. It's distributed to all members of the Committee of Bar Examiners and uh, I suspect that most members are, are like me. They uh, they devour those uh, those co those uh, thoughtful uh, comments. But this is the time at our meeting for those who wish to speak to the committee of bar examiners. And I, I do see there are some uh, uh, public members who have raised their hand. Uh, I'm going to limit our. Uh, uh, a commenter's speaking time to three uh, minutes. Uh, and Kim, I'll keep track of that uh, myself. Uh, so let's see if I'm able to see uh, either raise your hand. Uh, yes. Um, okay, it looks like uh, uh, members are doing that. So Kim, can I just go to the first uh, person? Yes, That's Mr. That's Mr. Aguirre. Mr. Aguirre? Yeah, you, yes. you're, you're unmuted, James Aguirre. So uh, please uh, go ahead with, you, with your comments this morning. Good morning. And uh, I, I did want to address an issue that I didn't readily see on the agenda, but I, I think uh, it probably is something that is before the committee, and if not, it will be uh, something that the committee will probably be addressing on the 24th with the Board of Trustees. And uh, that is a waiver form that apparently was sent to applicants for the upcoming bar exam. And uh, I want to express some comments on that because it may be the only opportunity prior to the, the Board of Trustees meeting. And the, the comments that I have relate to both the appropriateness of issuing such a waiver as a condition uh, proceeding to, to being allowed to take the bar exam. In other words, it, it is uh, essentially now a qualification to sit for the bar exam according to what I've seen. And the clear indication is that it was issued just a couple of weeks ago with the deadline of today to turn in the signed waiver form on penalty of uh, being excluded from the bar exam if, if you did not sign and return that. Um, I'm not aware of a Supreme Court order imposing that requirement. I'm not aware that this issue ever came before uh, the committee or the Board of Trustees for comment of any kind or input of any kind. And I've, I've looked at the uh, the State Bar Act and, and the other provisions in the Constitution and the codes to see if there was any provision for it. There isn't. Um, I realize that the committee and uh, in particular the committee as a former member has constitutional authority where admission to practice is concerned, but it is still subject to, to reasonable regulation rules and requirements. So uh, at this point, I want to raise the issue. I'd also like 
like to ask if someone can provide me with the authority for imposing uh, that requirement at this late point in time, distracting these applicants from what was already a near impossible task of preparing for that exam in the first week of October. So if someone can provide me with that, I would appreciate it. I'm sure you have my, my email address, my cell phone, and every other way to contact me. I don't want to take any more of your time. I, I know how hard it is to sit in your chair, so please don't take any offense at, at my raising this. I raise it because I know it's probably in the, in the forefront of all of your minds as well. But uh, so are the applicants who uh, are facing some incredible challenges along with all of us. Um, I, I thank you for letting me express myself. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Gary. Now let's see, the next hand that I see is from uh, Mr. Selvan, Matthew Selvan. If you're present, you're unmuted. You're welcome to share your comments today. Hmm. Hello, everyone, can you hear me? This is Matt. Yes, we can. Okay. Um, uh, nice to meet you all via Zoom. Um, I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm uh, the attorney for Benjamin Cohn, um, who is an applicant for the upcoming October exam. Um, he is seeking disability testing accommodations. Um, I think many of you are familiar with Mr. Cohn from past exams. He's a three-time uh, uh, test taker. He's, he's taken it three times already, uh, sought disability accommodations each time, hasn't yet passed it. Um, so hopefully this time around, uh, we can get him the accommodations that he's looking for. And I, I really do wish him good luck in passing the exam. Um, he's listening here today, by the way. So hello, Benjamin. Um, so we've got the complaint filed with the, with the Northern District of California. Uh, if anybody has an interest in ADA claims or ADA testing accommodations claims, um, I would encourage you to have a look at it. Uh, there's a, there's a lot of, uh, he's got a lot of different medical issues. So it's a, so I think it's sort of an interesting case. Um, so again, if anybody has any interest in it, I really would encourage you to just have a look at that stuff. Um, the other, uh, just to build on James's comments, because um, I saw that waiver as well. And um, one uh, extra note there that I wanted to add was that it says that it, it kind of seems to imply in the first paragraph that it doesn't apply to, uh, to test takers who are, who are granted disability accommodations, um, that they're gonna be testing in person, most likely. Uh, or, or on site, I should say, not at home, not online, uh, due to the accommodations and the nature of granting them those accommodations. And yet it still asks them to sign um, sort of uh, sign this waiver for the online exam. So it seems a little incongruous. Um, I would have liked to seen a different waiver for those who are granted um, disability accommodations because they're not gonna be testing online. And it almost seems to say if they don't agree to these terms, they can't take the exam but of course they're not gonna be taking it online, at least not right now, from my understanding. So I'd, it would have been nice to see something that said they can take it online with their disability accommodations or some clarity that they're not gonna be signing this waiver. They don't need to sign the waiver because it doesn't really apply to them. So um, yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say. And okay. uh, like I said, I'll keep it brief. So I'm finished. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Uh... Selvan, for your uh, for your comments, uh, I I don't see any other hands. Uh, Ms. Wong, I, I don't see anyone else has uh, asked to speak. I see there are some uh, other listeners, but I don't see anyone has asked to speak. If there is anybody else who wishes to offer a comment, uh, please raise your hand. Otherwise, I'm going to uh, move on in our agenda and I thank you very much for uh, being here and listening. Okay, I, I, I don't see any. Um, I, I, I should say at the last meeting, um, I received it, which went very long, it was a, like a, a really a marathon meeting because we tried to get it all done. Uh, and I, I think we were in our seats for over nine hours and I received a lot of feedback that it was a bit much and we felt rushed at the end and uh you know these these are are pressing issues that are before the cbe i don't want anyone to feel that there is any rush in our discussion or any um motions that we make so i i put this meeting back to what 
the CBE meetings were for many years, which are two day meetings. They were Friday. Traditionally, we would have a dinner together on Friday evening on, on our own time and at our own expense and then complete the meeting on Saturday. Um, we, we, we stopped uh, doing that, but I think that uh, if need be, it makes more sense. And that, that's what we're doing today. I, I have scheduled this to be completed tomorrow. Um, if we finish our business today, that, that's great, but I don't want anybody to feel that there, there's any rush on their commenting on, on any of the, uh, uh, the issues before the CBE today. Um, let's go on to our next agenda item, 0100, which is uh, approving the uh, minutes from our last meeting in June. I'm sure everybody's had an opportunity to take a peek uh, at those. Um, anybody uh, have any uh, comments or want to move to approve those minutes? I'll make a motion to approve. Motion by Ms. Lynn. Um, and by Angela. I'm, I'm sorry, who said that? Angela, second. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Agatep, uh, second. All right. Um, Ms. Uh, Wong, would you like to go ahead and... Caroline, do we need a person by person? Yes, we do, Mr. Chair. Yes. Oh, okay. All right, go, go ahead then, Ms. Wong. Sure. Esther Lynn? Yes. Anjali Agapta? Yes. James Bolton? Yes. Michael Kao? Yes. Alex Chen? Mr. Chen? James oh, I thought I said yes. Yes. James Efting? I'm going to vote yes, but I have a procedural question. Um, I don't want to uh, insult Michael, but can Michael vote on the minutes for the last meeting? Well, no, he should have he, oh, and Dr. Cow, I, I guess I should say, uh, because this often happens when we miss meetings, uh, when we're asked about things that happened at the last meeting, if we weren't there, generally we abstain. So with respect to the minutes, uh, only the the members who participated in that meeting that I, I suppose can review and, and attest to their veracity would be moving on that. Uh, you know, I, I figured you probably looked at them and thought they were fine, but I suspect that to be uh, uh, totally compliant with the rules that your vote on um, uh, minutes from a meeting that you did not attend would be abstain. So would you mind uh, changing your vote from a yes to an abstain? I abstain. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Efting for um, uh, pointing, pointing that out. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Karim Gongora? Aye. Dolores Heisinger? Dolores? Dolores is muted, but. Michael Isseri? Yes. Yes. Larry Kaplan? Yes. Paul Kramer? Alex Lawrence? Yes. Bethany Pick? Yes. Vince Reyes? Yes. Uh, Paul Kramer? Sorry, yes. The motion passes. Okay, thank you very much. Let's go uh, to our next uh, agenda item. This is 1D, the, um, uh, the NCBE testing task force. We were uh, very fortunate to have two CBE uh, members participating in that. Uh, how, how lucky were we to have uh, uh, Ms. Peek and Mr. Chan? So uh, would the two of you care to share your report with us? Please do. Yeah, so um, I just wanted to briefly bring back some of the ideas that were discussed. Um, for the people that don't know, the NCBE um, testing task force, what we were doing was 
essentially brainstorming and discussing discussing ways to revision and re-examine the bar exam. And so the idea was that we pretend that we don't have the current bar exam and create one that we think is a more um, efficient way to test for minimum competency. So there was a lot of discussion and a lot of the things I don't know if they're public or not. And so I'm just gonna be very broad about some of the general ideas that were discussed because I do think it's important for us as the committee to know what the NCBE is thinking of and what other states are planning about because obviously that's gonna impact our bar exam because we use the MBE. So with that said, um, one of the, and I'll, I'll say this also, Alex and I were in different groups. They had different groups, so Alex probably has different um, uh, observations than I do because we weren't together. Uh, but in my group, most people were pretty anti the MBE, which I don't think should come as a huge shock. Um, I know I'm very anti MBE. And so um, there was a lot of discussion about ways to transition away from that and find another way to assess specifically for the doctrinal um, skill sets. And so some of the, of the ways discussed were short answers that could be computer graded. So it would be a simple answer like, you know, the elements of negligence are, and you leave three and then the applicant would have to enter the fourth one. Um, also, there was discussion about short answers that aren't necessarily computer graded, that would be human graded. Um, Another thing we discussed was the option for the bar exam to be taken pre-law school, pre-law school graduation. So I know that um, Arizona has done this already. I'm not sure which other states, but we had discussed um, after a certain number of credits, the option to be able to take the bar exam. So it wouldn't be mandatory. And um, I think the group ended up settling on only part of it would be available to be taken pre-law school grad and then at the second part can be taken after law school. So that was also something else that came up. Um, let me see, incorporating computer simulations. So this was more in respect to testing for actual legal skills. So there was talk about, you know, how would we do this? That this was one of the more contentious ones in my group because people are saying, you know, it's difficult to assess for skills via computer simulation. And also there's another issue with, you know, just subconscious biases and, and cultural differences um, where how do you assess for how you're communicating with the client? That's dependent on the client, it's dependent upon the person, it's dependent upon a number of factors. So there was a lot of talk about if that's even something that is doable. Um, but the idea would be that it would probably be something similar to like the, um, not the MBE, the, uh, oh, the, PT, the performance test and having you know a client come in with a prompt and you then answer some questions. Um, I, I acknowledge that I do think that that is a hard thing to test, but I do think that it is useful in the fact that this is, we're going towards a virtual world. Like right now we're doing you know Zoom appearances for court because of COVID, but that's probably never gonna go away. And so applicants are gonna have to get used to the fact that you're gonna be meeting with clients and talking to judges and communicating with people not in person. And so I, I think that is a very valuable skill to be testing for in terms of minimum competency at least. Um, just a few more I had. Um, there was a lot of discussion about the compensatory or the conjunct the conjunctive model of scoring. So the compensatory is how we do it now. Um, conjunctive is essentially where you can take different parts of the bar exam at different times. And if you pass one part, you don't have to retake that part. You would only retake the part that failed, uh, that you failed. And so um, obviously there's difficulties there with trying to, for scoring purposes, right? If you have someone that has taken in one part, you know, 18 times, and they're probably going to score a little better, maybe. And there were some issues with, you know, how you're going to get um, reliable scoring, which I'll admit, I don't know anything about any of that, but I do understand that that is an issue that has to be resolved. Um, but I think that that is another important thing just to point out for the committee that that's something that's seriously being considered is, you know, altering how the test is scored, because that will impact us in terms of our MBE and our own test that we have um, for the second day. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to note something that someone had said in my section that I thought was important to remember and that they made the point that for a bar exam, we're testing for minimum competency, which means that ideally, if we believe that our law school education system works well, the bar exam should only be catching the outliers. It should only be catching those people that really didn't pick anything up in law school and shouldn't be practicing and it shouldn't necessarily be excluding um, 
large swaths of people. It should kind of be the opposite if it's a minimum competency exam. So those were the highlights. We talked about a lot. We met multiple times, but I'll pass on to Alex to share his thoughts. Thanks, Bethany. I think Bethany touched a lot on, on the key issues, but let me just jump in and um, to give you a little more ideas about the models that the NCB actually considered. So the task force considered four different models and each of those models has its own key differentiators in terms of structure, decisions and timing. Uh, that said, the first model is what we call the weighted compensatory model, where there are two components of the bar scored and evaluated collectively, and then both would be administered after law school. That's the first model. The second model that we considered is what Bethany just said. It's called the conjunctive model, where there are two components of the bar scored and evaluated, just like the first model, but they would be scored and evaluated separately. Let me touch on that a little more. The first component, which focuses on doctrinal law, is administered after the applicant has uh, 60 credits. And then the second one, which focuses on the lawyering skills, is administered after law school. That's the second model. And then we have this third model, which is really the hybrid of the first two, that also involves two different components of the bars scored and evaluated collectively, but there's a minimum requirement for each one of them. And you have to meet that minimum requirement in order to pass. And both components, just like the first one, are administered after law school, but not necessarily as a single event, meaning after law school, you, you could take those two components at separate times. And after a series of discussions and debates, uh, we've so for some reason, we came up with this fourth model out of nowhere, which really involves uh, a combination of the first three. And what it is, essentially, is it involves two components of the bar, scored and evaluated collectively, with one over a pass and fail decision, but with a minimum performance expectation for each component. That said, applicants would then be eligible to take the first component, again, after completing 60 credits of law school, but not required to take the first component during law school. If so, if they want to, they can take it after law school, but they'd be giving a choice to take it during law school. Also, candidates would have the option to prepare for and test on each component separately and retest on a single component if necessary. Now, for those wondering what the hell, you know, the trinal law involves, uh, it really entails application of the core doctrinal law from civil procedure or contract or criminal law to things like torts and con law and business associations. That's really the first component. And then the second component focuses on the application of lawyering skills, which really is very much akin to our PT right now, testing applicants on legal research, legal writing, issue spotting, but also with some nuance. They will also be tested on client counseling and client relationship and management or things like negotiation and dispute resolution. So those are sort of new stuff. Um, of course, the biggest strength, you know, as I'm explaining now, and I'm sure it, it's probably in your mind right now, the biggest strength in the fourth model is that it is much less stressful for applicants. And it is able to test their doctrinal knowledge closer to when it is learned as opposed to two years later, like what it is now. And also testing their skill set after law school also shows preparedness to practice. And of course, the flexibility in terms of the administration timing for that trial law, which again, which you can take it during law school, allows students to make choices as to when it would best for them individually to take that first component and then they can be tested more than once before graduation. So that offers a lot of flexibility for both the school, the bar, and also for the applicants. Uh, with that, I know the NCPE, um, it, it's really working on finalizing the implementation, but it's not clear, at least to me, when that will take place. Of course, you know, we'll update the committee as, as we get more updates uh, from the NCPE about that. So that's all I have. Let me know if I'm missing anything, Bethany. No, that was a good, a good summation of the, of the models. Oh, Welcome back my time. Th th thank you, Alex and, and Bethany. That, that is, that's awesome. This is an ever-evolving 
world in terms of, uh, of testing. Does anybody have any uh, comments uh, or questions for them? Oh, Mr. Kaplan? Yeah, I have two questions. One, um, how much uh, discussion was there over all of the DEI issues um, in regards to how standardized testing impacts that? And two, um, did anyone have the temerity to even question the fundamental value of an entrance of an exam that um, basically is the gatekeeper to entrance to a profession? So I'll um, respond to those, Larry. So in, in my group um, for the first meeting day, um, we talked a lot about um, diversity and inclusion issues. Largely, they came up in the context of discussing why the MBE needs to go, <laughs> um, just because it's, you know, the same issues with all standardized testing that are multiple choices. Um, and then, again, mainly in discussing the lawyering skills, that was where we talked a lot about who's going to be assessing what is appropriate, you know, how, how, what is this appropriate um, exercise of a particular skill. And this is when we were talking about client interaction, where in some, for one person, depending on where you're raised or how you are, like you might communicate differently and it doesn't mean that that's necessarily wrong. It's just different and it could be appropriate for your client. And so we had a lot of discussion in my group about whether that's even something we want to do because especially for foreign applicants also, we don't wanna be excluding people just because of they don't meet, are meeting our American, you know, mainstream norms. So we talked about that quite a bit. Um, I had at least one person in my group suggest that the bar should be more like the NPRE, where it's a, a short exam, you can probably study for it in a matter of days, and as long as you're studying and focusing, you're probably going to pass. So that's probably the closest to your, your latter question, um, but no one really suggested. I think everyone agreed that because we are licensing, that there should be some form of licensing test to make sure that people know the bare minimum, um, and then it varied between people that think that what we're doing now is fine and those people that think that we need to scale it back entirely and redo the test so that almost everyone is passing. I hope that answers you. I don't know if Alex had something else. No, my experience is very much the same. Uh, there are key issues that we all considered in terms of fairness. You know, what flexibility um, should we consider when it comes to diversity and inclusion? Um, how do we consider and implement that as part of the design process? And so those questions were discussed um, uh, quite a bit. Um, although there wasn't really anything um, that came out of it. it I mean, I, I think as part of the design process, everyone was really aware of the fact that we need to make the exam more fair. And that's why we have a couple of judges um, uh, uh, from different courts, um, from different ethnicity participate in that process. Uh, with that said, your second question, was there any discussion on on the en entrance exam? No, I, I think everyone came into the task force understanding that this is the NCBE's direction. So we weren't really there to sort of discuss whether we should even have an exam. Instead, we want to make sure that our voice is heard in terms of making sure that the exam is fair for everyone. Um, and, and, and sort of designing an exam that would tailor one race over another. So that was really the focus. I'm sorry if that wasn't really the answer that you would like to hear, um, but really with so many constituents and stakeholders participating, it, it was somewhat difficult to, to try to tell everyone that, you know, this is not the type A exam or, you know, for anyone, or, or it should not be an exam that should be administered at all. Uh, Robbie, a question? Oh, go ahead, Mr. Kramer. So I gather, I'm glad that we're giving these reports now because um, otherwise we're all, some of us are off representing the whole of our body and um, the others don't even know what's going on. I, I didn't even know that this task force existed, but um, am I correct in assuming this was a basically a long range look at the, um, the, the national bar exam? Is that, is that a fair characterization? It has nothing to do with the um, the current COVID crisis or the need to test um, uh, in alternative formats. Is that right? Yeah, it's my understanding that this was unrelated to COVID. It was a pre-existing discussion. Okay, thanks. Okay, any other uh, comments uh, on Alex and Bethany's presentation? Wow, thanks guys. Uh, 
I agree. We, we, we all can't be everywhere at once and it's great to have uh, CBE committee members that will go the extra mile on these things. Thank you guys. Let's go to, and uh, I should say, uh, uh, Dr. Cow, I should just take a, a moment to say that in addition to the volunteers that form the CBE, you'll see seven or eight other uh, people in our checkerboard here who are the State Bar staff who, uh, we, you know, we, we provide uh, advice and advise them and, and they're, to a person, they, they are pretty awesome. Uh, um, uh, the director of admissions, who's going to go next, is Amy Nunez, and she has just been such a, uh, I think, a dynamic leader for our group in, in very turbulent uh, times, to say the least. A lot of change going on, and she has been a, a, a steadfast uh, uh, rock steering us uh, away from the icebergs. So, uh, and Dr. Cal, hopefully you'll get a chance to interact with our, uh, with the incredible bar staff uh, as your term goes on. But uh, having said that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Amy Nunez, uh, the Director of Admissions for our next uh, agenda item, which is uh, 2A, and that's the key statistical indicators. So everyone, please pull up O101 if you can. Um, uh, Dr. Cal, do you, did you get instructions on how to do that, on how to pull up the agenda as a member? Yes, sir, I did. Okay, great. All right. I'm sorry, Amy, go ahead. <laughs> All right, no problem. Thank you for that intro, Robbie. Uh, so this report, um, the uh, report on key statistical indicators, is a standing agenda item. What I usually do is highlight any of the applications or items that have a 15% um, change in either direction uh, when compared to the uh, last year. So for this report, um, I'm going to highlight about seven areas. So the first is our attorney applications. We have 28% more in this report than we do at this same time in 2019. Uh, the same goes for our general bar examination. There are 25% more applicants uh, compared to 2019, um, along with attorney examinations. Uh, those are two application types for the bar exam. We have 34% more compared to 2019. As for the first year law student exam, we have 27% less uh, than compared to 2019. And just as an FYI, um, the first year law exam has been reducing from one year to the next, um, uh, but this is a, a big uh, jump um, from 27%. Also, um, this has been, uh, the other areas that I'm about to highlight have been areas where we have, have experienced um, an increase um, when compared to even uh, the last three CBE meetings. First is the MJP applications. We have 86% more compared to this time in 2019. And just to be clear, the MJP applications include registered in-house counsel, registered military, military spouse attorneys, and uh, registered legal aid attorneys. Um, the next is the PTLS program. We have 45% more applications this year uh, compared to the same time in 2019. And lastly, Pro Hoc Vici applications. We have 42% more uh, compared to 2019. Uh, so with that, does anybody have any questions about the um, key indicators? Okay. All right, so I will move um, to one second. Oh, yes. Excuse me. Sorry. So we have to take a motion. We have to take the roll call. Yes. Sorry about that. It's okay. Uh, Mr. Chair? You stepped away for. Okay. Who wants to make a motion to uh, approve the key indicators? I'll make this the motion. So move. Is that Lynn? Uh, Esther Lynn? Yes. Okay. And who second? I'll second. It? Okay. Korea. Um, Esther Lynn? Yes. Anjali Agapte? Yes. James Bolton? Yes. Michael Kao? Yes. 
Uh, Alex Chen. Yes. James Afting. Yes. Karim Gongara. Yes. Dolores Heisinger. Yes. Michael Iseri. Yes. Larry Kaplan. Yes. Paul Kramer. Yes. Alex Lawrence. Yes. Bethany Pick. Yes. Ben Sirius. Yes. The motion passes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Sure. Uh, the next one is a schedule for the October 16 and 17 committee meeting. So not much to uh, uh, say about that, except that that is when our uh, next meeting is, where I think that we're going to stay with our two-day format as we did before at, on an as-needed uh, basis. Gosh, you know, who knows what the future holds, but I would like to say that I wish our next meeting at the least could be in the LA and San Francisco offices, maybe with some social distancing and maybe a link between the two. I don't know, Amy, if you think that is a, a possibility. Uh, um, you know, I, I think we'll have to um, just see what COVID conditions are like um, uh, around that time. Um, the other thing I do want to highlight about that meeting, um, again, it's a two-day meeting, but also October is traditionally our orientation meeting. So we have an orientation session for new members. And I, uh, what we're planning on doing is an orientation for all members, given the number of changes with the CBE, you know, policies that we have incorporated. So we'll be doing a full orientation on uh, for that meeting. Oh, that's great. So again, Dr. Cow, I apologize. You're you're such an early bird to the to the game here. But uh, at the next meeting, we will go through each of the uh, divisions within the CBE and the things that we we do and the things that we monitor with a little bit of an overview of of how that happens. And and by then, uh, whoever is our new uh, chair and vice chair will have made the selections for who will be working uh, more specifically in each division, whether it's uh, moral character or accommodations or um, uh, well, all of our things. So stay tuned, Dr. Cal. Don't give up on us yet. Uh, that, that, thanks, Amy. So let's see, going um, on. We have to take a motion for the... Oh, I don't think so. For the meet the upcoming meeting, I think that's just okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so let's see. The next item, which I think is also just a uh, information item, is our meeting schedule for uh, uh, next year. Um, yes. You can uh, see this uh, is O one O three. Um, it's got the remaining meetings for this year, and then we've got our uh, meetings coming up for 2021. H how those meetings will look, I suppose, as uh, Amy said, is anybody's guess. Amy, did we add a meeting back into the schedule that we had taken out for 2020? Yes, as um, you'll note, uh, there's a March meeting that was added back to this year's, um, to next year's schedule. Um, the gap between January and April was much too long, so um, that meeting is back in here. So we have the same number of meetings that we did in 2018. Great. It, it was Paul Kramer many months ago who first brought this to the uh, my attention, certainly, and everybody else. So, Paul, you better know what you wish for because it's come true. We have one more CVE meeting thanks to your... Uh, uh, insistence and of course rightly so um, okay uh, anybody have any comments about that uh, schedule for uh, the rest of this year and 2021 Wow seems like a million years away but it, it'll be here in, in, in no time um, okay so let's uh, move along to uh, Amy's, this is uh, item D, uh, wow, the update on the Office of Admissions and State Bar uh, activities. I know there's a lot of interest in that Blue Ribbon Commission, so Amy, please uh, 
Yeah. Spill, spill the beans. Okay. So um, at its May 14th meeting, as you recall, the State Board of Trustees approved the establishment of a joint uh, Blue Ribbon Commission on the future of the California Bar Exam in partnership with the California Supreme Court. That commission will be charged to consider the uh, California Practice Analysis Working Group report and recommendations, as well as the 2020 job analysis that was conducted by the National Conference of Bar Examiners. Uh, that group will also be assessing whether there's sufficient alignment between the California and national job analysis, and also um, uh, looking at any plan for changes to the uniform bar examination, that is to consider adopting the UBE. Uh, this group will also develop recommendations to, uh, to the court and the state bar regarding revisions to the California bar exam in the event that the UBE is not recommended for adoption. And also, um, this group will recommend whether to adopt alternative methods other than those used in the current bar exam uh, to ensure minimum competence in certain subject areas or skills. So it's a similar um, practice than uh, that was happening with the NCBE testing task force. Uh, the Blue Ribbon Commission will consist of 16 members appointed by the California Supreme Court. Uh, members are going to represent key institutional entities, um, attorney practice sectors and settings, and will reflect the state's uh, demographic and geographic diversity. So at least two members shall have been admitted to practice law in California within three years from the date of their appointment. And these are the categories that will be nominating, uh, that nominations will be sought from. Uh, former members of the Kappa Working Group, Committee of Bar Examiners, NCBE Testing Task Force, Council on Access and Fairness, California Lawyers Association, Law School Deans, Judges, the California Department of Consumer Affairs, current uh, state, uh, state Bar Board of Trustees, a national expert on examination development or grading. And the commission will also be staffed by the state bar and include liaisons from the Supreme Court and may include liaisons from the legislature. And where we're at with solicitations is um, uh, announcement will be made shortly um, that will announce uh, you know, the call for solicitations. We will send that out to the CBE as well as to the law school dean, California law school deans uh, for any interest. Uh, the format in terms of um, uh, submitting in, uh, any interest will be similar to CAPA, where you submitted a resume and a cover letter, and um, the, the uh, Supreme Court will be making those decisions. Wow, thank you. So I, I would encourage, uh, you know, having been on the CAPA working group, it, it was a, a fascinating, diverse group of lawyers, law school deans. Uh, Jackie Gardina, I know she's, uh, she's here somewhere, was on that with me. Uh, uh, well worth the time. I, I'd encourage everyone on the CBE. Mr. Gupta of the Supreme Court, I believe, is going to be fielding those applications. And any participant, I see we have over 70 participants, uh, I would encourage you, uh, in addition to your public commenting, if you want to be a part of the change that you wish to see in the bar, that you submit an application to the Supreme Court. Uh, I, I don't think has the format officially been posted yet, Amy, or that's going to happen next week? That's going to happen shortly. I don't know about next week. but um, it's okay, So watch the State Bar website, please, or check in with the California uh, Supreme Court, because the time I spent on the CAPA working group, which was almost a year, was invaluable, very eye-opening to work with people from other states and uh, uh, really leaders in different areas of the uh, legal field in our state. Very well worth it. Okay, anyway, thanks, Amy. I, I know there's been a lot of interest in the Blue Ribbon uh, Commission. This, uh, as Amy said, these are going to be appointees of the California Supreme Court. So I suspect it's going to be a, a much watched uh, commission. Um, and it sounds like hopefully there's going to be some representation from the CBE on that, just like there was on CAPA. Okay, th thanks, Amy. What what else, what other news do you have for us today? So um, essentially, I, I mentioned this last time. Um, at that May 14th meeting, the Board of uh, Trustees made a lot of, um, uh, provided uh, directives to the CBE 
um, on a variety of items. I will keep them on this agenda to make sure that they uh, everybody's aware of where we're at and kept apprised of any progress we've made on them. The next one is um, related to the definition of entry level attorney and minimum competence. So one of the directives was for the committee of bar examiners to review the CAPA recommendations regarding the definition of what an entry level attorney and minimum competence is. And so we, um, I'm, I'm listing this um, so that we can keep um, everybody on the same page as to where we're at. And the idea is we're going to dedicate an upcoming CBE meeting um, to have this discussion. We'll most likely invite ORIA staff to come and help um, uh, you know, interpret the CAPA uh, recommendations related to uh, these definitions and, um, and gather the uh, CBE uh, uh, perspective on, on this. Uh, to bring it back to the uh, Board of Trustees. So this is simply just um, uh, a, uh, an, a highlight of what's forthcoming related to um, the entry level attorney and minimum competence definition. Okay. okay. A question about that. Sure. Um, so I presume you'll, you'll present a recommendation to us and uh, hope that we will then make a final decision in October, is that right? Um, in October uh, for this item specifically? Yeah, with we, we, you said we need to report back to the Board of Trustees on, um, on this, this subject, right? Yes. But, and, um, oh yes, go ahead. Paul. So are you expecting us to do that in October, to adopt a report in October? No, I mean, um, I, uh, I think we, uh, it's not necessary, it doesn't necessarily have to happen in October. We could do it at another time. The idea is um, for, to let you know that this is a, a, one of our tasks that's upcoming. Um, and it's also gonna require a little bit of um, background information that we're hoping to, somebody from Oriah could come um, who's worked on the CAPA report um, to provide uh, background on um, how uh, the minimum competence defini definition was derived in that report. Okay, well, my only uh, point is that if you're, if you were expecting, for instance, us to, to make a final decision, decision in October, um, more advanced notice than we've been getting lately uh -huh. of what what that w might say, and also links to the background material should be disseminated, even in advance of the 10 day posting requirement uh, for the agenda, um, if you can do it. Uh, you know, so we, because we're, we're so crammed lately, um, if we can get some of the reading out of the way ahead of time, uh, that would be very helpful. And while, you, while people can be made, I guess, to go find the previous reports, you know, from all of our various agendas, I think it would be helpful to, to have those all, uh, you know, the links provided to us at least so. Okay. So we um, we don't have to become, you know, very competent um, bar uh, Arcania researchers. Okay. Uh, what we could do is probably provide the previous report as well as a PowerPoint because I think that is um, summarizes a lot of the material in the reports as well. We could send that out. Okay. Thanks very much. Any other comments for Amy's news? Um, Actually, um, Robbie, I have a few more items, but. Um, oh, yes, okay. <laughs> okay, so um, as I mentioned, um, there were a few directives. The next one was related to reviewing the bar exam grading policies. Uh, specifically, this directive was to revisit the greater eligibility criteria as outlined in the DCA report. Um, that is uh, to examine uh, the recommended timeline also for um, the content of the grading rubrics. And so um, we're gonna coordinate that um, in, under the um, exam subcommittee uh, at the CBE. So we're incorporating that in the 2021, uh, uh, 2021 goals as well. Okay, and then the next item is the um, bar exam administration policy on uh, flagrant cheating. And uh, I think Tammy will pre be presenting on that portion. Good morning, everyone. So um, also back in the May meeting, the Board of Trustees directed that the Committee of Bar Examiners 
uh, modify our bar exam administration policies, specifically to revisit our flagrant cheating policy as outlined in the 2020 Department of Consumer Affairs report. Uh, this is going to be something that I will be incorporating under the Operations and Management Subcommittee, and I'll also be reaching out to prepare a proposal with other members so that we can provide it to, for consideration to the CBE. Uh, this is going to actually fall under my operation and management goals for the 2020-2021 year, and we will start working on that once we start up the new CBE session. I just had a, a question. Chairperson. Go ahead. Uh, Who, who's not speaking? Uh, this is Vince. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Reyes. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Tammy, uh, because of uh, this sessions and probably future sessions uh, being remote, so are those kinds of, uh, as we are trying to characterize it, AI sort of um, precautions being built into these uh, new um, protocols? So the flagrant cheating is really has been focused more on what it is that we're doing when we're doing the in-person examination. So this is something we're working on that will be geared towards when we can go back to doing the in-person examination. Uh, that's what the DCA report was focused on was how we administer exams in person. Uh, of course, at that time, we were not under the conditions we are now. So this aspect was not considered as part of that report. Um, but of course, this is a new world with the online exam. And we, of course, have put some stuff in place for the online exams and how we look at if there's any suspected cheating. And I'm sure we'll continue to, um, you know, mold those as we go, uh, depending on how long we continue to do this. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, you. Oh, go ahead, Mr. Kramer. Tammy, could you just ever so briefly summarize what the DCA said about our policy? So I know with the, uh, I don't have the report printed out in front of me, but I do know that the main thing is looking at flagrant cheating in person at an exam administration is when we are on site at an exam and proctors observe an applicant to appear to be cheating, uh, looking at a neighbor's paper to their left or their right. Um, and it's something that is being observed. It's being observed more than once or for a longer period of time. It is brought to the attention of our staff. Our staff will go and observe that information or that situation. And after looking at it and determining whether or not we really think somebody is trying to do some observational cheating, we call it into the office at this point and we make it known to uh, myself or Amy that this is what's going on. However, we do not approach the applicant during the exam so that we do not, you know, uh, disrupt everybody and that we need to look at that policy to make sure that that is actually the correct way to do it or if we need to change the way that we approach that. Yeah, okay, now I remember. They, they basically want us to hook them up and haul them off to jail. Um, I can't imagine how that's not going to be disruptive. Good luck. Oh, thank, thanks, uh, uh, Tammy. Tammy, are you going to be addressing today the um, suspected cheating from the February exam, or I should say the findings? Are you going to be talking about that today? I don't know what we have remaining from February, but I know. Oh, wait. wait, Tammy, you're you're a little boomy. Not sure what we have left to talk about for February. Um, the last offer I see I have written down was count one, count three. Uh, I'm sorry. Were you going to be talking about that today? What I was did. discovered from our AI observations? So I'm going to be presenting the June first year law students exam report. Yeah. That's what I'm going to be presenting. Um, of course, that's in a closed session. Uh, but yes, we will be discussing how the June exam went with the first uh, online exam with AI. Okay. Th thank, thank you, Tammy. You're welcome. All right. Well, um, Rob, I have one last item. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Amy. I'm, 
I'm not, <laughs> I'm not rushing you. I'm not. <laughs> no, no problem. Um, the last um, uh, directive that the um, board um, is asking CBE to take action on is related to the differential item functioning analysis report. And I just want to remind everybody about that report. So um, the diff analysis was an analysis that evaluated our bar exam questions, the essays and performance tests to de determine whether there's uh, different groups perform consistently better or worse on specific questions. Um, findings stemming from a diff study helped to identify potential issues of bias in a test item. So this analysis looked at essay and performance questions on, on the bar exam from July 2019, 2009 sorry, to February 2019. So it's a total of 20 exams and the analysis uh, was conducted on 152 written questions. Um, 116 essays and 36 PTs, and it consider, considered three primary variables, gender, race, ethnicity, and law school type. Secondary variables were also included. Uh, considering the proportion of question items flagged with diff, as well as the size of the diff indicator, the overall results of the diff um, study reported no major concerns uh, for, the C, for the California bar exam by gender and race um, and race ethnic groups. Nonetheless, um, to better understand the results of the diff analysis, as well as to proactively uh, monitor for any future uh, diff incidents, the board has directed that the CBE work with the Council on Access and Fairness to convene a panel that's charged with reviewing the questions that were flagged for diff in the 2020 um, analysis, and to also develop guidelines for minimizing the risk of future uh, differential item functioning. Um, so what we want to do is we're seeking two to three volunteers to serve on this working group. Um, as I mentioned, it's a coordinated effort with COAF, the Council on Access and Fairness for this initiative. And so if anybody's interested, uh, you can email either Audrey or you can email me and, um, and we will um, uh, uh, coordinate um, on the developing plan that we're coordinating with co the COAF staff. And if you're interested, please let us know by September 4th so we can um, start incorporating you into whatever plans uh, arise from that. So that is uh, the last item. Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> the next is on um, provisional licensing. But before we move that, do you have any questions on DIF and the next steps for the DIF working group? Amy, I'd like to fall into you. Okay. Thank you, Michael. And anybody else interested, just send an email to Amy. You have some time. Yes, thank you. All right. So the, the next uh, is the provisional licensing working group. And I think Mr. Kramer and Ms. Isinger have something to say about that. I'll let Dolores go first if she wants. <laughs> thank you, Paul. Um, so as, as you all know, in mid-July, the Supreme Court directed the State Bar to implement a temporary supervised provisional licensure program, um, which is a limited license to practice law under the supervision of a licensed attorney. And subsequently, a uh, working group was put together, which included uh, Paul Kramer and myself representing the Committee of Bar Examiners, um, as well as I believe there were a total of about 19 people on the on the working group. Um, we met two times and uh, during those two meetings we uh, were tasked with developing everything from what to call the program and what to call the participants uh, to the application requirements, the eligibility requirements, uh, the responsibilities of the provisional license lawyers and the responsibilities of the supervising attorneys, plus many, many other things. Um, and currently, uh, we, we completed the, the task and a draft is being completed, which will, I believe, first go back to the working group um, for our review and then to the Supreme Court and then out for public comment. So I'll, I'll let uh, Paul give more details. Okay, yeah, it's, it's clearly not going to come, come to this body as a whole, or I guess not even to the Board of Trustees 
And we won't actually be meeting again as a group to go over comments on the draft. We'll just be submitting them to staff who will then integrate them. Um, but we did have a draft of um, uh, parts of the rule at our last meeting and we went over them. Uh, some of the major themes were, um, you know, there was a, a trying to balance um, the requirements so that they're not so onerous that it, it discourages employers from hiring people, um, you know, because it would be just too much of a pain, but also providing public protection. Um, uh, the one major theme was that rather than have a lot of specifics about, for instance, how um, a provisionally licensed lawyer will be supervised, uh, will, will the supervisor have to be in court with them? That sort of thing. Does the supervisor have to sign documents? Um, uh, leaving all of that up to the discretion of the supervising lawyer with the idea that um, that lawyer's license is on the hook if something goes wrong and therefore they're not going to they're not going to be too lenient or, you know, let somebody who's not ready um, to make a court appearance on their own, for instance, do that. Um, one thing that I fought for, uh, a, a, another provision that's a little unique is that um, to enter into the program, you do not have to have a positive moral character examination, uh, moral character determination. You simply have to have an application on file. And so, um, there was a there was a bit of a tussle about whether if after the moral character um, application is processed by staff and and staff says well we can't give you a positive determination whether the person should be immediately removed from the program or allowed to stay in until uh, twenty um, twenty two I think it is right Dolores I don't know. yes yes uh, when the program expires. And I, I said um, that would provide an opportunity for gamesmanship where people would perhaps appeal their negative moral character determinations, you know, and drag out that process in order to continue to be um, uh, in this program. And uh, the group did finally agree that no, if, if, you, if you can't get a positive determination once one is made, you, you will be suspended until you resolve that. You just can't um, keep going on. Um, so it was an interesting process. We had representatives from the legislature, um, big law firms, um, public law firms like DA's offices, um, public defenders, um, county councils association, all of that stuff. Huh. Wow, very interesting. I have a question, this is Angela. Go ahead, Dr. Agatep. So um, since the supervising lawyer will have their license on the line. Is there any provision of a gimme to that supervising lawyer to try to facilitate a large group of lawyers to participate to assist these these applicants? Or I guess the provision provisional lawyers? Um, I, I'm not I, sure. I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, we we did debate whether there should be a limit on the number of um, provisional licensees that any one lawyer could supervise, and and that was another thing that was left to their sound discretion. Um, I guess if I was a licensed lawyer being asked to um, supervise said provisional lawyer, um, and my license is on the line, I I'm not so certain I'd want to participate unless there was like something other than knowing that I am a nice person. Oh, there were, there were a couple standards for, um, we did set a minimum uh, uh, time in practice um, so that we're not gonna let a brand new fully licensed lawyer supervise a provisionally licensed lawyer. Um, although some didn't even wanna see that standard. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, are you asking if there's some kind of support network for them? Maybe even financial or like, can we offer like the supervising lawyer, you don't have to pay your um, bar dues for two years? Uh, <laughs> well, that didn't financial, the financial issues were more around um, the fee for the provisionally licensed lawyers. Um, and it was a really interesting discussion. Um, 
we're going to have one later um, where it's hard to it's hard to know um, you know what number is right. Um, it's hard to estimate the program costs, for instance. Um, even harder to estimate how many people are going to take advantage of this. You know, and and that's another that's another factor in that calculation of the right amount. So it um, uh, there we just didn't know, and so we we picked a number that was less than what a, a bar exam. Uh, passer would pay to be member of the bar, but um, more than what um, practicing law students would pay to get into that program. I think that um, in, in the final analysis that this program is going to benefit mainly those um, individuals who already have jobs lined up with law firms or who are already uh, maybe clerking uh, with a law firm. And this will just allow them uh, to transition into a, an attorney, a supervised attorney position before they pass the bar. So uh, it's, uh, there's so many unknowns because this has never been done before and we've never been in the situation uh, with COVID, like with COVID to, to even, uh, require a program of this sort. So we, it will remain to be seen. Now, what uh, one, one thing I raised during the um, working group meeting was the, the notion of evaluation of this program. And I, I think that uh, it will be very important to keep close track of uh, the details involved in this to, so that two years from now, if for some reason, um, the Supreme Court wants to continue this program, we'll be able to give them information about the efficacy um, of, of how it has worked. So we, you know, as, as Paul said, there's so many unknowns. We, we, uh, we're going to give it a try. And it's, in, and it's all an effort to help, help the, the students who uh, are in you know, in a, in a bind with uh, all the, the COVID stuff. I have a question. Go ahead, Mr. Kramer. Kaplan. Yeah, um, back Mr. to moral, that moral character. Can't they just say that you don't get provisional uh, certification until you pass moral character? It's the same way now, you know, you don't get a license, you don't get sworn in until you pass moral character. Can't they just do it that way? Well, that, well, that, that was the original, that was the original thought. Um, however, it was pointed out that um, many, many, many applicants have not even begun the uh, moral character process or they're in the, in the pipeline and there's no, uh, you know, guarantee that that they will, their their moral character will process will be completed soon. But if there was an exam, if it was the, the old way, they wouldn't be able to practice until they got more, through moral character anyway, right? No, you're that, correct. And, and that was an argument that was used to explain why it's at least very reasonable once they get a negative determination to say, time out, you're suspended. and unless you can uh, reverse that on appeal. Oh, wow. Thank you very much. Oh my gosh, this is, talk about uh, uh, we're, 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 we're figuring it out as it's happening. It's awesome. Thank you very much, Paul and uh, Dolores. I mean, uh, unprecedented, the, you know, this directive from the Supreme Court, it's just a couple of weeks old and already we've got the policy being formulated uh, largely, you know, with the efforts of the CBE. So thank you, you two. And Robbie, can Mr. I- Mr. Chair, I had, I had a comment. Oh. Who, who is speaking? Uh, Kareem. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Gungor. You're, I can't see you for real, so I couldn't tell that you're <laughs> It's just someone in the snow. I believe that's <laughs> snow, is that right? Yeah, it was taken in uh, December. Yeah, uh, I just had a quick uh, point of clarification. Uh, when is the the go date for this program? 
I, I can I can answer that. Um, okay. The goal is to have an operating program as early as October 2020. That that's our goal right now. Uh, oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. and I, I, this is this is Donna Robbie. I, I point out that right there are there are a number of factors that'll get us that that could sort of stand in the way of that date. But that's you know certainly um, I was going to work up a calendar um, to sort of see where we could you know sort of how early we can get it. But keep in mind right we're going to send out um, today, ideally, to the working group, the uh, the draft rule following uh, Tuesday's meeting, give them, say, a week to respond uh, to the, um, uh, to make comments on whether or not the rule that's presented to them accurately captures the discussions from the working group, go out for a minimum 15-day public comment, um, depending on, then we'll have the group get together and meet on the public comments. Um, if we need to make changes, do we need to send it out for a second public comment, then get board approval and Supreme Court approval, and, and we have to automate it. And although we can start a lot of the automation now, we can't complete the automation until the requirements are finalized, which, right, is part of this rule process. So, um, so we're trying to do this as quickly as we can, um, but um, depending on sort of the timing of some of these things, it could um, you know, that could impact our, our uh, desire to get this done uh, as quickly as we'd like to. Th thank you, Donna. And Dr. Kale, I don't think she was there earlier, but Ms. Herskovitz uh, is the acting director of the State Bar of California. Wow. So she stepped in when her predecessor uh, resigned um, and is really, you know, just came in at, at such a turbulent time, both in terms of, you know, everything going on in our world and at the bar. And she's really uh, also done a, an amazing job of, of keeping things moving for us and for our applicants and for the public uh, who, who we ultimately serve. So thanks, thanks, Donna. And thank you for those uh, comments, everyone. All hey, right. Hey, Robbie, sorry, this is Bethany. One quick question. Oh, when sure. this goes out for public comment, could we be notified um, so that we know and can look at the draft and make our comments? Of course. Okay, thanks, Donna. Um, so I, I think this is uh, quite a long time to be uh, sitting. Uh, it's been an hour and 15 minutes. Let's just take a 10 minute breather. Anybody wanna use the restroom or grab something and we'll come back um, around. Amy, is that okay? Yeah, I was gonna say we have one more item under my time and this is oh. the October 20. Oh. Do we want to do that first and then take a break and then we could get into uh, move to examinations? I'm, I'm sorry. I thought we were done again. I'm yeah. not <laughs> rushing you. If you want to do your, what is your last thing? Is it, it's, is it a hard one? I was going to briefly give an update on the October bar exam. Okay. That is a hard one. That's a very hard one. Let's take let's take <laughs> our break because we want all ears on Audrey Ching. Uh, so let's let's take uh, ten minutes and come back around um, ten thirty-five. Everybody, uh, see you soon.
which is why nobody has been paying attention. So,
What do you think, Dr. Kalb? Don't give up on us. Oh, this is a great meeting. Oh my gosh, I'm learning so much. <laughs> so okay. fascinating. All right, good. All right. <laughs> Michael, will that, that twin be making another appearance today? All right, we are uh, filing back in here, it looks like. Um, I see most of us back here. Let me see. Dr. Bolton's here. Dr. Cow is here. Brody's here, Chan. Jim Efting's here, Mr. Gungora's here, Ms. Heisinger's here, Mr. Isiri is here, where is Mr. Kaplan? Mr. Kaplan, I don't see him yet. Uh, Mr. I'm Kramer. here. Oh, there he is. Mr. Kramer's here, uh, Mr. Lawrence. Esther, Vice Chair, Ms. Peak, Mr. Reyes, where, oh, there he is, Violet, and that's everybody. Okay, um, let's um, resume our, our uh, Friday, August 21st uh, meeting of the Committee of Bar Examiners. Um, when we, just before we took our break, we were still in uh, section two of our, of our open uh, session agenda. We were up to the October 2020 California bar exam. Wow. Uh, so Ms. Ching, are you ready to give us an, an update on uh, a very anticipated uh, exam? Please. Talk. I am. Okay. Thank you, Robbie. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome, Dr. Cao. I'm Audrey Ching, the Assistant Director of Admissions. Um, so, yes, we have a bar exam scheduled October 5th and 6th. Uh, we have about 12,000 applicants who applied by our final filing deadline of July 24th. Two weeks ago on August 7th, we sent them an acknowledgement and acceptance of testing conditions form. So they we're well informed of the remotely proctored testing conditions and what some of the uh, conduct and sanctions for that remotely proctored exam were going to be. It's due back today at 11.59 p.m. Um, I checked the numbers during our break and we have uh, 10,500, a little over that uh, number back already. So we've sent several reminders trying to get everyone who's uh, applied to know if they want to withdraw, if they want to uh, list in that document, they can have an open text uh, form to talk about any extenuating circumstances they have, if they don't have a quiet testing space, if they're worried about their Wi-Fi. So we have that option on the form as well. Um, in terms of the format of the exam, we remotely proctored the June first year law students exam. We learned a lot about that process. And this time around, the applicants will be provided the opportunity to complete two mock exams. So they're really comfortable and familiar with the format. Uh, some of the things they're gonna practice are uh, just getting used to what the format will be, like where to get the password, um, how to highlight, how to enlarge the text, um, how to copy and paste. And some of the practice will be with actual past California essay questions, a performance test question. Uh, the uh, NCBE is giving uh, multiple choice questions to use for practice for the MBE. So we feel like giving the applicants two mock exams to practice with in September, they should be ready um, and feel less anxious about the bar exam when it comes to October 5th. 
there are going to be some uh, backup plans for administering the password. Uh, the, pass the applicants all upload their answer files well in advance and then they unlock them one at a time for each uh, essay session or performance test or multiple choice and they're going to be some backup plans in place for how they access that password um, we're going to have the the tech support for the vendor exam sauce is going to be increased uh, we've been told significantly for exam day we're not the only jurisdiction testing on october 5th and 6th using the same vendor there will be a virtual scratch paper for all parts of the exam. It's been enlarged uh, to 70,000 characters, which is uh, many, many pages of virtual scratch paper. And for the performance test, it, uh, they will be allowed physical scratch paper, eight pages that they will show front and back to the camera before beginning the performance test. Uh, we're going to give the admittance ticket out to all the applicants, uh, again, so they're well aware of the instructions and what to expect uh, three to five weeks before the exam. Uh, hopefully all the applicants by now know how to communicate and we've been getting a lot of communication from applicants through the, their applicant portal. Um, obviously also calling in and uh, we've had the FAQs up now. Um, since July 20th, so that's been a living document where I don't know if you've, uh, you've seen it on our website, but there's been a frequently asked questions document up um, that we've been updating. Our most recent updated section was all about questions related to testing accommodations. Um, so again, the testing conditions form is due tonight. Uh, applicants will still have until September 8th to withdraw with a full refund. And then um, that last week of August, first week of September, we will start with those mock exams. So everyone will have practice um, in the actual platform. And hopefully that, again, will alleviate a lot of concerns and questions. And can I answer any of your questions? Wow. Wow, exciting. Thank you for helping to put that together. Anyone have any comments or questions for Audrey about our upcoming first time remote administration of the California bar exam. Wow, historic. I have a question. Um, I have a question. Go ahead. Oh, my, Michael Isiri uh, was first. Go ahead, um, Michael. Thank you. Uh, my question is about the Texas exams. Um, do you know how long will be the length of it? The mock is, exam? Yeah, the mock exam. Uh, yeah, the no, it's, they're 90 minutes. Okay, and so um, they'll be scheduled at a reasonable time and they just log in, see what it is and see about submission and all that? Yeah, so it's not like a synchronous experience where they all have to go in and do the mock exam at the same time. They will be able to um, register. Oh, you know, something I forgot to mention, they also practice uh, taking their photo ID and then matching um, their baseline photo in that mock exam as well. So again, they'll have plenty of practice about taking a photo where they're in the, you know, the, the rectangle, making sure there's enough lighting and then matching their exam. That'll be part of the mock exam as well. Awesome. Great. I'm sorry, who else had a comment or question? I do. Oh, I, it's Bethany. Oh, I'm sorry, Doris, go ahead. Um, Audrey, what is the waiver? Uh, form that was uh, referenced during the public comments. So what I assume um, they were talking about is this acknowledgement and acceptance of testing conditions. So, you know, the conditions have changed. Uh, people have been registering for our exam for long before um, we moved it to an online remote proctored exam. So we want to send it out to all applicants so they know these are the conditions. This is what it will be like to have a remotely proctored exam this will be the conduct that we expect uh, you to adhere to during the exam. And if you have, if you disagree and want to withdraw, that's an option on that form. If you're worried about your um, exam area, you know, you've got multiple people in an apartment, you don't have a quiet space, you're worried about internet connectivity, there's a space for extenuating circumstances as well. Um, so we, yeah, I'm assuming that's what uh, folks were talking about during public comment is this acknowledgement of testing conditions form that we sent out on August 7th. Why is it called a waiver? It, it, a waiver it usually implies that you're waiving some right. The last part of the uh, testing conditions form is the uh, waiver about exam soft in the software vendor. And anyone who's ever tested um, on a laptop at our in-person testing sites as well, they, they also would have to uh, sign a waiver related to using that same software. Okay. 
Robbie, this is Bethany. I have a quick question. Go, go ahead, Bethany. I missed the dates of the mock exams. So we're looking to release the first one, I think September 1st. So as we, I said the week of August 31st, which I think that September 1st might be the Tuesday in that week. And then there'll be another one released uh, by September 18th. Okay, cool. Thank you. This I is had a quick question. I, I have question. a question. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Doctor. Was it Dr. Agatep? Go yeah. ahead. Um, so with the mock exam, is there going to be the opportunity to play and practice with the virtual paper? Yes. Yeah. So the virtual scratch paper uh, will be there and turned on as well so they can practice um, typing into there, cutting and pasting from there into their answer. Um, yeah. So everything that will be in the actual real environment will be enabled during the mock exam. Is there going to be a further discussion about the process with the in-person proctor exam later on today? Uh, about how our plans, our plans are for those people who need to test in person? Yes. I don't know that we're going to, I don't know that that's on the schedule to talk about um, further today. You can let me know if you have any questions now about the in-person exam. Has the locations been identified? So what uh, Tammy has been working on was looking at all the locations for a typical July administration that we use for um, testing accommodation hotel space. So everyone knows it, we're not really able to book any kind of convention center space or any large meeting room space because of all the restrictions on public gatherings. So we're looking at all the different hotel room space that we would typically use in a July administration for testing accommodations and getting contracts at those hotels. Yes, I have a question. Oh, go ahead, Mr. Reyes. Uh, yeah, my question is related to that, uh, Audrey. Uh, how, how do we um, monitor uh, folks with accommodations who are, you know, taking this online? Is, is there any change or the proctors, you know, uh, oriented in, in a specific way? So taking it online would mean the, a remote proctoring process. So we do have, um, we, we're trying to be flexible, right? What the, thing, the most we can accommodate online is what we want to do. And most of the applicants really want to test online as well. Um, and Lisa can speak more to this if she wants to uh, interrupt me, but we are going to accommodate um, testing accommodations applicants in the online environment. And we'll have, you know, we'll know, we'll have lists of those applicants and what their accommodations are. So when anything comes back to us from the remote proctored um, files from the vendor, we'll know to match those up with the testing accommodations applicants. Okay. Yeah, so Vince, I'll, I'll just have a little bit more to add to that. Um, in terms of uh, um, accommodations, you know, there, everything is determined on a case by case basis. Uh, we look at uh, all the complete set of accommodations that have been granted to any applicant and we look at those and see which ones, um, if all of them or some of them or none of them can be, um, you know, effectively delivered and um, uh, um, securely uh, administered online in a remote proctored environment. And so, you know, certain ones, um, for example, if, if all you have is extra time, uh, if you have extra time, the same amount of extra time across the board, we can accommodate that. Um, certain things like, uh, you know, if you need to um, have water, have food, uh, get up and stretch, um, to get up and stretch, you would need to make sure that you stay within the view of the um, camera, webcam, uh, things like, um, having to have water or food, you know, there will be, we will be cross-referencing with applicants who have those certain accommodations and uh, be sure not to, um, you know, issue chapter sixes or flag them for things that they have been granted accommodations for. Uh, do you know yet if this means uh, more or less proctors that have to be involved? It would be the same amount of proctors uh, as we're, we're planning on for, um, for everybody else in terms of you know the AI and then uh, um, on top of that would be human proctors, uh, various levels of that. And um, you know we would just make sure that uh, those people with accommodations that are testing online remotely proctored, uh, you know that they don't get uh, flagged for something that they have been granted accommodations for. Or they might be flagged but they won't be receiving any kind of sanctions for that. Thanks. I have another question. Go, go ahead, Mr. Isiri. Thank you. Um, you brought it up a little bit, but I was curious um, 
about stress testing the submissions of the files to make sure that you mentioned that ExamSoft is helping other jurisdictions at the same day because they're a vendor. I'm more concerned about the service capacity and the submission files and how lengthy and do not at all how much of a time frame you're providing for people to submit their tests or questions so that way they don't have to be under egregious stress during the process, especially since um, there might be some speculation in terms of um, the systems might be impacted at first because of all the submission of people trying to submit and then resubmitting the same stuff. Um, I'm concerned about if there's any, so to summarize, twofold, first question, will there be any stress testing conducted during those mock exams? And second, um, do not the length of people's application of tests, questions, answers, responses, do you know how long that they'll be able to submit them? Um, well, the way the software works is that anytime the applicant is connected back to Wi-Fi or if you have an Ethernet connection, it starts in the background uploading the file. So they don't have to even, so it just kind of starts if they, if they have, if they're during their break, if they have Internet um, connected, it might zip up an answer file right then and there. Or if they keep exiting out or who knows what's going on with their own connection, they could that first night, you know, it could be could leave their laptop, you know, on and all the answer files will be uploaded or that second night and then they will have until for the standard testing they have until noon on the Tammy might have to correct me the, the following day so noon on the seventh to upload all the answer files. That is, um, there's also a two week window where they can keep uploading their answer files and there'll be small deductions for uh, uh, lack of timeliness along the way from, deduct, uh, from uploading their answer files. Um, in terms of stress testing, so our vendor uh, exam soft has had a synchronous test. Uh, it's not, it wasn't a bar exam. It was um, a synchronous a college admissions test, but in another country with uh, similar conditions where they had over 160,000 um, test takers on the same day synchronously. So from the assurance side with us, even with all the other jurisdictions, they have assured us that that uh, stress on their system won't be an issue. Uh, thank you for that. I guess my final thing is, I really think that this should be more than just the next day noon time to upload file exams because I know how systems work and how people actually react um, and how long it takes to um, recover from massive problems like system downtimes and all. I really believe that it would be better for the system itself as well and for applicants if that time might be extended by a day or two. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, and Mr. Reyes, I think we're going to talk in, in closed session when we talk about the first year exam, what it was like with AI uh, doing the proctoring and recording uh, what appeared to be uh, people cheating. And by that, I mean looking at materials during the bar exam. So I think you're going to get a, a closer view of exactly how this works when people uh, are not honest and uh, try to, to destroy the integrity of the bar exam. Uh, but I, do. I, I appreciate I, that. that. That that is to come. I, I, I you know and be, be prepared for your jaw to um, strike the ground when 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 you when you hear about that. I, I think is what's going to happen. But thank you, Audrey. And, you know, uh, Dr. Kelly, it, it sounds like we're just talking about you know what we do every day. But this is just this is such a big deal. Uh, because we, we've never done this before in the history of our state's bar. And we were asked to, or the state bar was asked to put it together in a very short period of time to accommodate applicants who have graduated from law school and want to practice law and require a license to do so. And these are just such extreme conditions 
that uh, the bar was asked to put something together in a very short period of time, and it looks like it's going to happen. Audrey, if I'm right, we have a lot more applicants for this bar with the new lower cut score and the online exam than we usually do for the summer exam. Is that right? You are right, uh, but keep in mind, ooh, keep in mind that the uh, applicants still have until September 8th to withdraw with a full refund. So the, the melt of that number of 12,000 is, is, I'm still not sure, but um, so far from the testing conditions document that we sent out, um, people are not withdrawing at a very high rate. So we'll see how high the numbers stay after September 8th. Wow. I mean, just to put things in perspective, last summer, wasn't it more like 9,000? Yes. Wow. So that's quite, a, quite an increase uh, in the number of, of applicants for a, a, an exam we're going to be giving in a, in, a new, in a new way. Thank you for that uh, presentation. Uh, you know, more, more to come. Um, let's go to our, our next uh, section uh, of examinations now. Um, Lisa and Paul, I think you are on uh, attachment uh, uh, 201, which is the grading systems uh, applicable to the bar in light of the Supreme Court directive of uh, just uh, a few weeks ago. Um, so Lisa and Paul, do you want to share that presentation with us? Yeah, Lisa, if you want to go ahead and ex set up the explanation, um, then I'll, uh, I'll bat clean up. This, this sure. is item 201. Yeah, sure. So um, if the committee members will recall, um, and they're at your uh, April 24th, 2020 uh, meeting, uh, that there was an item on the agenda that uh, also involved grading and uh, phase grading and um, Dr. Roger Bolas, um, our psychometrician, presented his report on that. And the committee ended up um, uh, making three changes to the bar exam grading that were to be um, to be uh, implemented as soon as practicable. And those three were, um, number one, uh, eliminate the um, third phase of grading. Uh, there are three phases of grading for the bar exam. There's first read where every single uh, applicant's every single answer is read. And, uh, and then if they don't meet the, uh, at the, the old cut score was 1440 out of 2000. If that uh, cut minimum score was not met, then uh, there was a, a regrade band or a regrade uh, range of scores that would be then um, automatically sent to second read where the uh, applicants, all of their answers would get a second read by a different set of graders. And that, uh, that um, regrade band uh, with your 1440 cut score started at 1390. So basically it was a 50 point um, regrade band where all of those applicants that were within that uh, score range would get all of their answers reread. And then the third phase of grading would be any answers, uh, any one answer that um, had more than uh, 10 point, um, just what we call a discrepancy, which means a 10 point difference between the first read and the second read. Um, and remember, we do grade in five point increments. So 10 points may sound like a lot, but it's actually um, not that much. And so more than 10 point uh, discrepancy would get a third read by the, um, the uh, supervising edge team member, supervising um, lead, lead grader, um, who would read that question a third time and basically assign a what we call a resolution grade. Um, and that resolution grade would take the place of the, the two reads. And so what you decided was to eliminate that last third phase of grading um, what the uh, what Dr. Bolas's report found was that there was a very very small, um, like 0 0.01 or 0.1, um, um, you know, a number of graders, a number of applicants who actually end up there, and then very very small number of those, tiny number of those would end up passing possibly. Um, so you uh, eliminated the third phase of grading, and then you also um, authorized the uh, grading department to be able to add uh, two graders. 
to all, each grading team. Remember, there are six questions on our bar exam. And so uh, right now, what we have are 12 graders per grading team. Uh, those would be the graders that are actually grading the bar exam. Um, and then we have a number of between usually three, four, something like that, apprentice graders who are graders who are generally either never, never actually graded a bar exam, you know, new people who are kind of um, learning that we're trying to bring on, on board. Um, so basically, uh, you authorized adding two graders to that 12, which would make it 14 graders per grading team. And then the third thing that you decided was to um, decrease the uh, regrade band. So instead of a 50 point regrade band, you went to a 40 point. Um, Dr. Bolas's report had modeled a 25 point, which would be a 50% reduction in that regrade band. But um, um, I think based on um, the report seeing that at 1400 cut score, I mean not cut score, but 1400, which is a 40 point um, regrade band that basically no one uh, on, on the uh, bar exams that he studied, no one had achieved a score under 1400 passed, ended up passing the bar exam. So those were the three changes that you made to the grading system. Since your uh, April meeting uh, on July, July 16th, uh, the California Supreme Court uh, reduced the um, uh, passing score on the bar exam from 1440 to 1390, and that is a prospective, prospective uh, reduction which would apply to all future bar exams, uh, including our uh, October bar exam coming up. So what staff wanted to do was to bring those um, uh, grading changes that you made back to you to see whether or not you want to reaffirm those same changes in light of the new cut score, um, you know, make any modifications to them. Uh, and in particular, what staff is recommending is to maintain that uh, elimination of the third read, um, to uh, maintain the increase of the uh, um, bar graders to 14, which would mean an additional two, but also to modify that um, that change to allow the bar staff to be able to have the flexibility to add potentially another two, which would bring the total number of graders to 16 per grading group. Um, and especially in light of, um, you know, we may be seeing a, a, um, a significant increase in the number of uh, applicants that will need their exams graded in October. Um, so the, the one thing that we are, uh, the staff has not made a specific recommendation for and are leaving it to you is to decide whether or not you want to um, uh, maintain the 40 uh, point cut, uh, 40 point regrade band that you had determined for your 1440 cut score and apply it to the 1390, which would mean that um, at 1340 is where you would begin your second read uh, regrade band or to go back to your original 50-point uh, uh, regrade band, which would mean that anybody who, uh, any applicants who scored um, a scaled score of 1340, between 1340 and the cut score, uh, would have their um, exams reread. Re so that's uh, where I'm leaving it for you. The um, agenda item sets forth some um, uh, tables that uh, we'll give you some information to help you in determining whether you want to, what you want to do with that regrade band. So um, I'll give it back to Paul. You have comments, Paul? Um, couple questions. Uh, so uh, do you have enough uh, additional graders who have been adequately trained um, to be able to add the extra two per team? Uh, is, I don't know if Christina's, uh, my understanding is yes. Okay, um, and would they be added all the time or just when we have um, larger um, numbers of applicants or test takers? So the two that the committee already approved, so that would go from 12 to 14, that would be something that we would implement going forward. Uh, it's the additional two on top of that that staff is recommending, um, you know, that flexibility to allow grading staff to, um, to implement uh, would make it go to 16. That would be kind of on a, yeah, a, a discretionary case by case, see what happens kind of uh, situation. Okay, and would that be for the same team would be on February? Um, so we have a, um, you know, a, a pool of graders that we, um, we normally go to with um, 
seeing whether or not they're interested in grading. And then we also always have solicitation ongoing for new graders that new people that might be interested in, in grading and those would be our, our apprentices. Um, so it's not always the same exact set of graders that are used for every exam. It, uh, it varies from exam to exam. Same numbers though. So same 12 numbers. and okay. So you'd be less likely to use the extra two in February. Correct. Depending on the numbers. I mean, normally our February exam is, uh, you know, lower number of applicants, but we don't know, um, you know, what February holds in terms of how the exam is going to be administered, um, how many, you know, how many people are going to be, be interested in, in taking the bar exam. So yeah, there are a lot of unknowns. Okay, so do if, if the last two people are going to be used maybe only once a year once we get back to normal, do you have a way of maintaining their skill set so that they're as calibrated as all the others who are working twice a year? Yeah, so as I mentioned, it's not always the same set of graders. We solicit every time. So we, um, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, sometimes graders bow out because, you know, for example, in with the July exam, a lot of times those graders with, say, young children or, you know, have summer vacations planned, a lot of times those are not the same graders. They, they may grade, uh, tend to grade for February, but maybe not for July. And um, again, the grader pool is always being supplemented with new apprentice graders. So it would, um, you know, and, and um, as you know, the graders always go through a certain amount of training and calibration process during every exam. So, um, so they would always be, um, you know, always be a potential for having um, more experienced graders or, you know, less experienced graders uh, in uh, any exam. Okay. And, and the difference between 50 point range and 40 point range, um, although we've never tried to, to regrade people in these new ranges, um, is, there, is there any reason to think that uh, the conclusions that Dr. Bolas drew the last time would be any different um, with this yeah. sort of sliding the scale downward? Yeah, my, my understanding is that um, you know, you're talking about uh, uh, different demographics when you're getting down to um, that much further down to what we studied, what Dr. Bolas has studied. So, so the exams that he looked at, um, you know, none of those people who were down in the 1390 uh, and below would have gotten even a second look at their uh, at their exams. So, um, the, the, the what I presented to you with the tables is is just the indicators that. You know, when you get down um, in those uh, areas that were reflected in those numbers, you tend to have more, the, the demographics indicate you tend to have more people, of uh, uh, the minority uh, people. And, and, and keep in mind that um, the statistics that we currently have uh, with the bar in terms of past, you know, exams are, um, you know, those uh, uh, Hispanics, Asians, Blacks, and then compared to whites. And so, um, you know, the bar is in the process, obviously, of, um, you know, obtaining better demographics, more specific, more uh, granular demographics. But um, as in terms of historical information on the bar exams, you know, that those are the, um, the demographics that we have. So as you reach further down into, it it's, indicates that the statistics and the numbers indicate that as you reach further down into those lower um, uh, scores that you're going to be reaching more um, uh, uh, of the minority categories. Okay, so let's look at the, um, the, the tables then um, for February, because I don't understand what these numbers mean. Um, so this is on page seven of the PDF. Um, so um, in the 50 point range, it says the non-minority percentage is 15.4% and the minority percentage is 15 point. I mean, let's look at July because that's, I think that's more representative because that's a broader sample. Um, uh, so it says, um, Non-minorities are 12.2%, uh, minorities are 14.3%, um, and then there are smaller percentages in the 40-point um, range. But what, is, what does that mean? Uh, yeah, so if you look at the notes, Paul, that are beneath those two, so table one and table two are essentially the same uh, categories of information. It's just one is for the 50-point and one is for the 40-point. And so, um, 
if you look at those, uh, the notes, it indicates that the percent and regrade, what that indicates is the percentage of all test takers within that, those particular, you know, with ethnic groups that scored within that range on past exams. And keep in mind that um, we're talking about minority, meaning um, uh, Blacks, Hispanics, and Asians versus the non-minority, which would be the people who indicated that they were, uh, you know, quote unquote, white. Um, so that, that's the, those are the, um, you know, the, the kind of contrast that you're looking at. So then this means there's not a significant difference between the two groups. Um, there's a little bit of a difference, um, but it's not Correct. significant. Is that right? Correct. And so in the previous analysis, we found that nobody outside the 40 point range um, was, um, was uh, changed from not passing to passing status by virtue of the regrading. And therefore we thought there's no reason to attempt to regrade them because it's not gonna help. And it does save us time and allows us to get the results out sooner, right? In terms of between the 40 and the 50? Right. Yeah, I mean, it's t it tends to be that the people who are scoring in the lower, um, the lower echelons of the regrade band uh, have a, a less chance of passing than people that are closer to the top of the regrade band. But there was nobody in the bottom um, 10 points range of the 50 that, that ever made it, or maybe one person, but um, statistically insignificant number were helped by the regrading if they were um, in the 50 to 40 percent below the cut score. Yeah, I don't, know about these number, I don't know about these numbers, Paul. I mean, you know, I mean, this, I'm, I'm venturing into the territory of psychometrics and the statistics, and I, I'm not, I, that's not where my expertise is, and I'm not comfortable answering any of those questions. So, but, you know, I, I mean. Okay, well, um, does anyone else have questions? I've been monopolizing, and I apologize for that. Yes, you have, Paul. Uh, does anybody else have anything that they want to share? But before I do that, I, Tammy, I, I mean, Lisa, re, remind me, because I was a, a against this uh, eliminating the third read. The, the goal was to be able to re release bar exam results faster. Is that right? We were eliminating the third read because in the end, statistically, it didn't make much of a difference and we could complete our grading that much sooner. Correct. So, so basically, um, the third phase of grading takes about a week uh, so of grading time. So you would be eliminating a, a, a week of grading time. Uh, and adding the, the two members to the grading team and maybe two more, the goal there is also to increase the speed in which we can complete grading and issue results? Correct. It will help, it will help towards that, yes. Uh, so even the two more that you proposed for us to talk about today will speed it up even more. Um, well, you know, right now what's been publicly announced is that uh, the goal is to uh, try to release results from the October, um, you know, 2020 bar exam in mid-January. Uh, and, and that was um, based on our normal uh, populations. And at this point, we're looking at record populations upwards of possibly, you know, uh, uh, if, if we don't have any uh, significant amount of withdrawals, 3,000 uh, applicants more than we would normally have. Right. And so, you know, in order to try to even hopefully um, uh, continue to, um, you know, make that uh, mid-January uh, goal to release results. I, I think that it would be uh, very helpful if the grading staff had the flexibility to be able to add more, even more graders uh, under those circumstances so we can try to meet that goal. Okay. Did anybody else have any uh, uh, comments? Uh, then I'm going to move to, you know, making a motion. Dr. Agatep, you're muted, but I think you are motioning in a way that says, yeah. I would like to participate. Yes, I, I just, the Zoom life uh, leaves for me a lot to be desired. And in saying that, um, I do have concerns about this assumption that 
there was really no impairment in performance when we changed from graders from 11 to 12. But I do think that maybe the jump to 14 or maybe 16, we can't make that assumption that it will speed things along. And I'm saying that based on um, when I attended an in-person calibration, and I really did appreciate all the conversation that occurred um, versus the Zoom calibration that I went through, which was, I thought, unfortunately tedious and seemed to proceed at a lot slower rate. So I am concerned that while there is this hope that adding two or more to the graders um, might increase speed, my perception of the Zoom calibration is I'm not convinced that that will happen. Oh. Any other uh, comments uh, about this uh, process? Dr. Cow, I know you, you've got a lot of catching up to you, but it's very interesting, right? Where our, our state is often, I don't want to say criticized, but derided for the very long amount of time that it takes from when the bar exam is given to when results are issued. Uh, there are a number of, of factors that contribute to that, but I think one of them is that we're, they're very thorough in their grading. And of course, we have a large number of uh, applicants. Um, uh, we're, we're, I don't know, Lisa, do we take the longest of, of, of all? I, I know some states, the exam is graded the weekend of the bar exam, and, uh, uh, but they have very few applicants. Um, uh, from and all only from ABA accredited law schools and uh, a very different dynamic than, than our state. And I think we're very careful in our grading, but we, we do take. Um, we, we are, we are, we do tend to be the ones who do take the longest. Keep in mind, we do have the number of our applicants. I think only New York uh, has, has potentially uh, more as well as we have three phases of grading. And, and now two phases of grading, right? right. Mm -hmm. So uh, members, so the, 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 if, if we take these things uh, in components, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, State Bar staff has proposed that we eliminate the phase three uh, grading for the reasons that Lisa's shared today. Um, would anybody make that motion that we adopt the staff recommendation to eliminate the phase three of the grading based on the presentation? Sorry, I just to be, uh, that motion was already made um, at oh. the last meeting. Oh, I'm sorry, am I? There are two, the motions are different on this agenda. They are. Oh, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let me get to this. I'm on the wrong. I'm on the wrong page here. That we have already done. I apologize. Well, but wasn't staff saying we could revisit that decision? I'm not saying that I want to, but. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the, the, well, as I said, Amy, there are three staff recommendations to, well, there are two recommendations and one uh, for the committee to make a, a decision regarding the, the regrade band in light of the Supreme Court lowering the, um, the cut score. But I think uh, uh, one of the recommendations is that we continue with eliminating a phase three of the grading. I, I know we this was discussed last time, but it was presented again by Lisa's report. So uh, uh, I suppose there's, we can revisit that ourselves as a group. It, would, would anyone may make that motion? We're kind of re revisiting that again. I'll move that. Uh, so that may, motion made by Ms. Heisinger, any second? Robbie, I'm sorry. Can you say what the motion was again? To uh, to continue uh, the CBE's uh, position that we eliminate phase three of the grading. So 
So moved. Would you, would you second. second that motion? Oh, Mr. Chan seconds that motion. All right, let's go ahead and take our uh, uh, roll call uh, vote, Ms. So Wong. Helene. Um, Anjali Agapta. Yes. James Bolton. Yes. Michael Ko. Michael Ko. Yes. Alex Chen. Yes. Jim Efting. Yes. Yes. Loris Heisinger. Yes. Michael Iseri. Yes. Larry Kaplan. Yes. Paul Kramer. Yes. Alex Lawrence. Yes. Bethany P. No. Vince Reyes. Yes. The motion passes. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so let's take a look the the second uh, component of the staff recommendation is uh, uh, again that we add uh, two graders to the uh, grading team with the flexibility of adding uh, two more graders uh, as needed and and I think these have, based on the discussion this morning, we think that they may be needed given the very large uh, increase in the number of uh, applicants for uh, the October bar exam. So that's as many as four. And, and I think, Lisa, that your recommendation presumes that these are qualified graders, that they exist and they can be called upon to participate in the grading if needed. Yeah, and it always it also assumes the numbers stay the same in terms of the number of applicants or around there. So if the applicants turn out to be less because of withdrawals or whatever, then you would not need the additional two. Correct. It would just be the two that were approved last time. Correct. So the motion then uh, before the committee is uh, to approve giving the uh, staff the flexibility to add two additional graders for the October uh, 2020 bar exam that we're going to be administering remotely. Uh, I have a quick comment, Mr. Chair. Who's that speaking? Uh, uh, Kareem. Oh, I'm sorry again. I, the snow and I, just, I can't see it. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Mr. Gongora. I just had a question in regards to um, how I guess the I guess the idea is that the grading will be conducted by the end of December. Um, is that correct? Uh, Christina, I, I think so. Yeah. So no, um, oh, we will not be able to make the end of December unless we make some modifications to the grading process, which includes uh, adding additional graders up to 16 and eliminating that third phase. Right now, if we were to keep at our regular schedule of 16 weeks, which is what would it, it would take for us to grade 9,000 applicants, not 12,000, but 9,000 applicants, um, we would finish by January 29th of 2021. Okay, and then uh, my additional question is, how many uh, uh, tests is each um, grader um, reviewing? Uh, so that will depend on numbers, uh, but if we are talking uh, a regular July exam with um, 9,000 applicants, that is approximately 900 um, answer files per grader over a uh, eight or nine week period. Of course, assuming that we take 16 graders instead of 12 graders, uh, that will reduce the number of answer files uh, to about 600 to 700 per grader. Awesome. Thank you for that information. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I will. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. I was Christine. going to make the motion, oh. but go ahead, Christine. I um, just wanted to jump in too because uh, Paul had asked some questions um, and uh, Dr. Agatep had also asked about the number of graders. 
if you refer to Roger's report from the previous um, meeting where we uh, did a vote as uh, whether we should eliminate the third read and add in more graders, um, Roger's report said that adding additional graders um, had no effect on the reliability or validity of the exam. And in fact, it might increase uh, the reliability of the exam. So I just wanted to uh, point that out, that that's in the report from Dr. Bolas previously. And Del Dolores, I just wanted to kind of piggyback on what you said. I, I agree with you that the Zoom approach we lose a little something in the uh, the process we had before with everybody sitting around the table. I suppose by the same token that applies to our CVE meetings where it's not quite the same. Uh, I think that I and you and other members are doing the best they can to make it as much like uh, our old meetings as we can. And I, and I think uh, Lisa, that your team is endeavoring to do the same thing, even though uh, the grading is now remote. So I, I, I just, I think, Dolores, although I agree with you, my impression over the years is that Lisa's Lisa Cummings standards are so high for that staff that they're going to not let the remote component uh, detract from uh, doing it doing it fairly. Uh, uh, Robbie, so. I just want to point out. I think you're you you're directing your comments to Angeli, not me. Oh, uh, I, I'm I'm sorry. I was I, I'm uh, Angeli. I, was supposed to. I Angeli, I I agree that well, you know what I said, and now you know what I <laughs> Thank mean. Thank you, um, um, Robbie. Oh. Yeah, uh, the way you stated the motion, you limited the additional two graders only to the October exam. Correct. And I would prefer that that just be a general authority to staff to do that whenever they encounter the need for it. For instance, uh, February might be another case, uh, rather than say it's a one-time only deal for, for October. I think that's an excellent uh, uh, rebuke to me. So thank you. Paul, because we'll leave that to the discretion of Christina and Lisa. So then the motion uh, is uh, that we, if approved by the CBE, that we give uh, State Bar staff the flexibility to add as many as four graders as needed to the grading team for the upcoming exam and, and the future. Okay, okay and I'll make, I'll make the motion. Um, just to, to be clear, though, it's it's add two permanently and as needed an addi additional two for Correct. specific exams. Correct. Any second to that motion? I'll, I'll second. Second. Kareem. second from Mr. Gongora. Uh, Ms. Wong, do you want to go ahead and take that vote? Yes. Esther Lin? Yes. Anjali Agatha? Yes. James Bolton? Yes. Michael Cole? Yes. Alex Shen? Yes. James Effing? Yes. Karim Gongora? Yes. Dolores Heisinger? Yes. Michael Iseri? Yes. Larry Kaplan? Yes. Paul Kramer? Yes. Alex Lawrence? Yes. Bethany Pitt? Yes. Vince Reyes? Yes. Motion passes. Okay, thank you very much. That was a very thoughtful discussion on that issue. So I think we might be able to, uh, well, let's have our uh, goal examination goals. Uh, Mr. Kramer, that is uh, oh. attachment 202. You missed the last element on yeah. um, the item we were on. And that's the- Oh, further. I'm sorry, I apologize. So the third, uh, uh, component of the staff recommendation uh, is to address whether or not to adjust the regrade band in light of our new uh, passing score. Paul, what would be your uh, motion on that uh, subject? Well, um, I'm I'm fairly comfortable with the 40-point range. 
Um, but we have an absence of data. So if anybody is not comfortable with that, what we could do is go back to 50, but then have Dr. Bolas um, study it after maybe two, um, two uh, exam cycles and see if anybody in that last 10 points um, is making it through to um, bar membership. And if not, then we could maybe cut it back. Mm -hmm. But but I guess the danger in that is it might add a few days to the grading process because more people will need to be regraded. I'm not, maybe it won't because they're, the numbers are low enough. And of course, now we'll have more graders um, to do the second read, but um, um, I can go either way. Um, but I, I I, I don't have a real problem with 40 points. It's it's unfortunate that we don't have data, but it's also because um, we've we don't have data. Well, let's see. Uh, would there be a to maintain the status quo, which uh, sometimes is the sure and steadiest for now? Would there be a motion to maintain the 40 point regrade band? This is what our committee, the CBE, adopted at the April meeting. Would there be a motion to maintain that band of regray of, of a second look uh, for the uh, future board exams? I'll move that, Robbie. Thank you, Ms. Heisinger. Any second to that? Second, second from Angeli. Second from Dr. Agatep. Um, Okay, Ms. Wong, I'm going to give you a break. I'm going to do the roll call vote for this one so I can call the names in a fun order. Uh, Ms. Peek? Were you a yes? Yes. I yeah, sorry. And uh, how about Dr. Cow? Yes. And Mr. Efting? Yes, I'm still here. Okay. Uh, how about uh, uh, Ms. Heisinger? Yes. And Mr. Kramer? Yes. Mr. Kaplan? Yes. Uh, Dr. Agatep? Yes. And Dr. Bolton? Yes. And uh, Mr. Chan Brody? Yes. Uh, Mr. Gongora? Yes. Yeah. And Mr. Isiri? Abstain. Abstain? All right. I think we have everyone. The motion passed. You, you uh, forgot me. Did I forget? Oh, Mr. Uh, Reyes, I am so sorry. Yes. Uh, he's a yes. I'll, okay. I'll vote yes. And also, yeah. um, Mr. Lawrence. What's Lawrence? Oh, my goodness. That's okay. You can pay me later. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> what about uh, um, Ms. Lin, Pastor Lin? Yes. The motion passes. Okay. Well, we can see I'm no good at that uh, process. <laughs> it was fun, though. Now to the uh, goals. Uh, which I imagine are, are lofty ones, uh, Paul. Yeah, just briefly. Um, uh, last time I had a question about um, what is now goal number two, which says consider draft reports to the Supreme Court on February and July California bar exams, which include analyses by psychometrician. And I pointed out that I think the last time we approved um, the reports, there was no psychometricians analysis. And I'd ask staff to check and see if um, that was going, to, we were no longer going to be receiving the psychometrician reports in the future. And if so, we should modify the goal for the next time. So Lisa, what say you? Uh, I don't know, Amy has made a decision on that. I mean, traditionally, um, what I've seen of that particular item is that normally it's just the draft part, which is the, you know, the part about, um, um, statistics, I mean, statistics in the sense of how many people uh, are at the exam, how many testing accommodations, things like that, that are in just the first few pages of the report. And um, so I, I don't know if it's the timing, maybe, you know, if you want to receive the psychometrician's report, whether we do the timing of that report a little bit later, but I'll leave it to Amy in terms of, you know, how she wants to handle that. I don't think we have plans to change um, the dissemination of any of the reports. So Roger Bolas gives us a report on the psychometric kind of um, characteristic of each exam um, administration. And we're going to continue uh, providing that to the committee. OK, good. Uh, does anyone else have any other questions? Uh, I would just offer an observation that this particular report at, or, uh, uh, at the end of our uh, committee year,
because it includes in bold uh, explanation of what we actually did is kind of a good thing to to maybe save for reference because you can uh, use it as an easy way to determine um, for instance if you want to remember what we did quite often it says which agenda it was on and it makes it easier for you to go back and look up the item if for some reason you need to uh, as opposed to the other um, goals that we review every meeting which don't have this information so any questions from anyone else or comments yeah i have a comment this is kareem go ahead mr gongora thank you i had a question um i noticed on the um a lot of the goals that we referenced dr bolus's um reports um has there been anyone else that we've engaged on analyzing our um, activities or is dr bolus kind of the only person that is um utilizing this aspect He, he's been our psychometrician historically, but um, we are planning on um, on uh, solicit soliciting for other um, psychometricians. You know, he has been planning to retire, so uh, we are um, going to be in the process of um, putting out an RFP for um, that service for um, in the coming year. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right. Thanks very much. And thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul uh, and Lisa. Now, let's see. Um, um, Robbie, apparently um, we're supposed to to adopt these, um, approve the goals and accomplishments. Oh, I see. And I would so move. I see. Any second to adopting the, the goals as set forth by uh, a Paul for us? Any second? I'll second. I'll second. Second by Mr. Uh, Reyes. Um, okay. All right, Ms. Wong, I, I got to give it to your trusty hands. Sure. Esther Lin? Yes. Anjali Agatha? Yes. James Bolton? Yes. Michael Kao? Yes. Alex Chin? Yes. James Efting? Yes. Karim Gongara? Mr. Gongora? Dolores Heisinger? I see, yes. Yes. Michael Iseri? Yes. Larry Kaplan? Yes. Paul Kramer? Mr. Kramer? Yes. Alex Lawrence? Yes. Bethany Pitt? Yes. Vince Reyes? Yes. The motion passes. OK, thank you very much. Uh, let's see, it's 1136. I'd like to uh, get through our operations and management section before we break for lunch and then we can come back to Ed Standards, which is a, a, a healthy program. Well, my, my bird agrees, but I don't know about the uh, committee members. Is that okay? Can we go through uh, O&M before we have our, our break for lunch? Okay, hearing no, Alex Chan is saying yes. You go, Chan. All right. And speaking of, it is Alex, Chan, and Tammy who are going to be making that presentation. Let's take a look at item 0300. That's the uh, cost analysis of the uh, bar exam we just gave, the first year bar exam. Wow, this is hot off the press. So Tammy and Mr. Ms. Campbell and Mr. Chan, please go ahead. Uh, for the June 2020 first year exam, uh, we of course historically have always administered this exam in person across four different test centers uh, in California. Uh, but in light of the COVID pandemic and the guidelines around what we can do, we did move uh, the majority of our applicants for the June first year exam to the online format. Uh, with the online format, we um, had a few testing accommodation applicants that did test in the online uh, modality, but for those testing accommodation applicants that did need to test in person, we did have a small group of applicants who tested in the LA and San Francisco State Bar offices. And we also had a few who had extenuating circumstances that uh, joined at those locations as well. 
uh, as you will see in the agenda item, the total cost for administering the June 2020 first year exam was $29,108 for 267 applicants. That is in comparison to uh, the June 2019 exam where we administered it to 323 applicants at a cost of $164,615. Uh, there was a decline in the applicant uh, total population from 2019 to this year of 17.34%. Some of the highlights uh, for this cost analysis, which usually I try just to give a little bit of a higher overview of what the agenda item includes in it, but because we had to change uh, the way the cost analysis was done based on us going to the online format. I'm going to go over this in a little bit more detail. Uh, so the first highlight is the June 2019 exam. Uh, approximately at that point in person, we had 59% of the overall capacity of our facilities was used to the, administer that exam. With the shift to the majority of our applicants being online, uh, we now were utilizing 68% of what we had established was our max capacity for the first year. Normally, 72% of our total costs are comprised of the costs related to the facility rental, the electrical, and the proctors. These costs were not, of course, applicable for the June 2020 in-person test centers due to us using the State Bar Conference Rooms. Uh, applicants uh, in the State Bar Conference students did not require additional electrical outlets, and we did not use our standard proctor pool for this exam. We used our actual admissions staff who did a great job of administering this exam under the circumstances that we were dealt with. Uh, they were also, um, these costs were not necessary, of course, for online exam. And then when you look at it, this exam, the majority of the costs, the direct costs, were 90% associated with the online exam as a whole. And that's because we had the laptop license fee for the online exam applicants. And now we had added in the exam monitoring fees for the video. Uh, with the June 2019 exam, it usually would cost approximately 42% of the total exam cost to administer the exam at a testing accommodation test center. But uh, with this exam, we only had seven applicants in the state bar conference rooms. So this basically, with the extenuating circumstances applicants included in that number, uh, did definitely change our cost for the in-person side of it. And of the applicants who tested in person, only they made up only 2.6% of the total number of our applicants. And now the cost to administer the exam to the in-person was only about 10% of the total exam cost. And the last highlight on the list here is uh, for June 2019, it cost approximately $279 to administer the first year exam to an applicant taking the exam at a non-testing accommodation test center compared to $3,842 for each applicant taking it at a testing accommodation test center. And for this June exam, it was approximately $93 per applicant to administer the first year exam um, for the non, uh, for the TA applicants versus $283 now for the applicants taking it in person. So the overall cost per applicant for June 2020 was only $100 per applicant as a whole versus in June 2019, excuse me, 2019 was approximately $509 per applicant. So there was a shift in how these numbers uh, represented from an in-person to uh, a majority online. And some of the other things to point out with this, uh, being that this was administered mostly online with no direct facility or proctor cost to administer it um, in the state bar conference rooms. Uh, the majority of the costs, of course, associated with administering the exam uh, with the laptop license fees and the additional fee for the exam monitoring. And it's also important to note that these figures didn't factor in the indirect costs, uh, which include the time that staff spent preparing for the exam before administering the exam during, and finalizing the exam afterwards. 
The process of reviewing all of the flagged videos by all staff after the exam was a, definitely a manual process. It included the completion of incident reports, issuing and affirming chapter six notice of violations and required the staff to work overtime to complete this task in a timely manner while trying to meet their normal day-to-day -day work duties. This report along with previous exam administration uh, financial reports do not include costs for staff data dedicated year round to exam administration, such as our eligibility team, applicant services, testing accommodations, and exam support. It doesn't include miscellaneous exam supplies that we do send when we do an in-person exam. Does not include our testing accommodation consultant fees, printing costs for any printed exam materials, our graders, the psychometric services, or for staff who do overtime during and post exam to make sure that everything uh, is able to work and, and be done the right way. So uh, that's all I have. And if there's any questions. Hey, Tammy, I have a question. So looking at the numbers, clearly there is some amount of savings when we <clears throat> conduct remote exam versus in-person exam. Um, and perhaps maybe Amy should be looked into this question too. The question I have is, should we and can we consider shifting a percentage of those savings onto applicants by reducing their fees, especially for those perhaps who decide to take remote exams. I mean, not necessarily for those who require on-site proctoring, but certainly for those who choose the remote option. So I'll, I'll take that, Amy. Oh, um, sure, Donna. I think, I think Alex, um, that's something that we absolutely need to look at in the future. Um, we need to, to look at if the remote exam becomes a, uh, is something that we're going to continue to do or continue to do in part, what are the costs to the organization of administering that exam and then, uh, and then reducing, it, um, reducing the cost to the applicant if, for example, our facilities costs are, are significantly different, then absolutely that should be accounted for. Yeah. Um, what we don't, one of the problems with these reports that Tani was highlighting at the end is that they don't actually give you a real picture of the cost of administering the exam. Mm -hmm. We have, you know, eligibility staff, you know, some portion of eligibility staff, um, uh, you know, salary benefits, et cetera, um, uh, should be attributed to the first year exam. Some portion of, of that should be attributed to the bar exam. There's a portion of overhead, sort of all of that, and so the, these reports are um, uh, are giving you a, a very small piece of the, a, a slice of the pie. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what the, these direct costs that these reports are showing you is is that it looks like there is a decrease. Um, and um, and if that is true with the remote bar exam, um, you know we're going to have to I think bring on a bunch of uh, attempts, potentially hire some permanent staff. For the video reviews, um, to um, you know, to to do a sort of a variety of things to make sure that we get ready for the exam and can process the exam afterwards. Maybe more staff who do chapter six notices, etc. So, so I think after this exam, we'll be able to figure out what are our, what were our real costs for the exam. What are the when you add the extra staff that's needed, um, when you subtract out the facilities costs that we that we may not need anymore. And then I think we can, you know, we should be looking at the February exam for is there an opportunity to reduce the um, to to reduce the amount of fee yeah. fees that go to the applicants to take into account um, potentially uh, reduced and adjusted costs to the state bar. And I want to note that maybe it's not on paper, but for my colleagues, you know, with the remote option, a lot of the staff members actually spend a lot of hours on reviewing videos, you know, paying a lot of, uh, uh, taking a lot of their time just to making sure that all the videos are reviewed and, and flagged appropriately. And, and so those times or extra times are not always reflected on paper. And so, yeah, there's certainly, even the, re the remote option seems to reduce a lot of the expenses that we would have for in-person exams. It doesn't speak the entire story. If anything, it also increases expenses in certain areas. And so I I'm glad you, you, you mentioned mentioned is Donna. I just want to make sure that we consider all factors and it sounds like you're really you know, on top of that. So thank you. Thanks, Alex. This is Angela. I do want to ask a few questions and I want to, I guess, um, coordinate with this issue. 
of how many hours of video did each individual staff member have to review. I know we're going to be talking about this um, in a minute, Tammy. I don't know if you want to shift the gear now or you want to talk about that now. Um, yeah, I'll be going over this in more detail when we do the exam report. However, uh, you know, we were looking at roughly of trying to get all of the exam videos for the first year reviewed in roughly about a week or a little over a week. And when I say that, I mean business days because, of course, we didn't weekends the staff are normally not working and so we had roughly I'll say about seven to nine business days that we had staff who really were kind of trying to drop the majority of their regular everyday tasks to review the videos could I tell you how many exact videos or hours of video they reviewed I don't have that number because it would be uh, very tedious to go through and add up every single applicant and how many videos were flagged. But it definitely was very tedious. And then after the staff went through, I mean, we had 24 teams of two people uh, working on it to try to get it done. It was all hands on deck. And once we did get through it, there was another level that required Amy, Audrey, Lisa, and myself to now go through and review the chapter six notice of violations and determine whether or not a sanction should have been, um, you know, imposed. So it, it definitely took a lot of time and staff did work over time because unfortunately there are day-to-day -day jobs that couldn't just stop on a regular everyday basis. Thank you, Thank you Tammy. I, I have and, a question. Angelie, did you have another a follow up there? Or when we keep I, I guess in hearing that, um, it seemed like there was a business week involved. I guess in throwing out this generic question, do you think that the business of the bar underwent, I guess, a significant slowdown during that business week? So, yes, in my opinion, it did. Uh, Amy could weigh in on this if she would like further, but I would say, yes, definitely, there was a slowdown. Staff were not able to focus 100% on their normal day-to-day -day activities because reviewing the videos was the most important factor because you know the, the release of the results was not a very time, long time period after the exam, so it really took a lot for us to get it done in order for us to have everything in place by the time the results were released. I think we could talk a little bit more about the process in closed session when we talk about, um, you know, uh, what it took to get there. However, I think the most important thing that um, impacts uh, this analysis um, and that's not reflected in there is the fact that we had to prioritize it to ensure that we, uh, you know, whatever decisions came out of the uh, of the review um, impact that may have impacted grading uh, did not, you know, so for example, if somebody got some kind of violation that led to a, a sanction of getting a scoring a zero on a certain part of the exam, that that happened um, and, uh, and also happened in timely fashion for a results release, uh, because that's, that happened, um, you know, in early August. So, um, what that meant for us um, in, in operations was that we had to prioritize this. So staff um, it did create a backlog um, in the work that they had, so this had to get prioritized. And they, uh, the reviews varied, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in closed session. So um, it did have an operational and budgetary impact. And I would just like to add one more thing um, with regards to the actual spreadsheet that shows all the breakdown of costs. Uh, this was something new that I did this time that I'll be continuing to do moving forward is that I did add a column for expected number of testers. And although it wasn't uh, probably as much of an impact for the way that we uh, administered this exam being online for the majority. However, just so that there can be some sights on the fact that, you know, everything we do pay for facilities, tables, chairs, everything is based on the number of applicants who are uh, at that point expected to sit for the exam uh, when we're planning and doing this. And basically our actual number of testers is not uh, going to include anybody who has been a no-show or anything along that line. So just to make a point about that. 
th th thank you very, very much. And Tammy, I wondered, it, I, I know this is a small number that take the, uh, uh, this, this bar, but uh, I wanted to make sure that I was clear. Everyone that did not take the bar remotely took the exam at the LA or San Francisco State Bar offices. We didn't need to use any hotel facilities for this baby bar. That is correct. All done at the state bar offices, and it was a very small group. But yes, everybody was online except for those. Are Are you planning? I don't want to get ahead of the game, but to utilize the state bar offices for the upcoming October exam for those that uh, require outside facilities. Uh, we are still looking at trying to finalize where we're going to be holding this. Of course, uh, the state bar offices do have limitations on how many people we can put in there, but it is something that is definitely being considered with all of our other facilities that we would normally use for testing accommodations. And, and again, just so I know you and Alex both touched on this. So what you did to uh, proctor the individuals taking the bar exam at the LA or state bar offices was take staff that ordinarily have other jobs and ask them to be proctors for those days for those applicants. Is, is that what happened? Uh, yes, and it is standard protocol that our staff would go. Some of our staff would go to the in-person to be a staff representative or a staff member in charge, but we did pull more staff in to cover for the proctor aspects. Interesting. And again, I, I, I don't want to get ahead of the, the game again, uh, Amy, but just in, in, in transparency, then the review uh, of did anyone cheat on the bar exam is first done by the AI software and then done by multiple people at, at the bar. Is that right, Tammy? That is correct. So there is the AI that does the initial flagging, and then there's also a human proctor that reviews what the AI did. And then when it did uh, eventually get over to the state bar side for admissions, there were uh, three, in essence, three levels of review going uh, for any of those flags that had to be considered. And again, I think these are some specifications that we should probably cover in closed session. Okay, I'm, I just wanted to get yet a general idea of what, what the process is like because we're all so new to it. Oh yeah, well, and the other thing I wanted to mention um, about that process too is that um, part of our effort um, for this round, you know, um, J June was our pilot, was to also bring on staff who, you know, uh, will be hands-on for July. July is always our um, um, all staff, um, all hands on deck exam, uh, meaning that all staff, we even have program managers that go out to exam sites in July. This is, uh, but we wanted everybody to experience a remote process and, and that's what, um, that's why we had so many staff assigned um, in person, uh, but as well as um, do, conducting the video proctoring. So, um, you know, I just want to put that out there that it was a way of us getting uh, prepared um, for uh, a larger exam um, and having more specificity as to what will be required of proctors uh, that are moving from in-person to remote testing and what that proctoring will look like. Okay, uh, thank you. Let's see, um, uh, Mr. Chan, do you wanna share your, uh, your goals and accomplishments? Oh, Mr. Chan? Uh, not yet. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Mr. Chair, we need to take a motion for 0300. Oh, oh uh, I'm sorry. So let's see, the motion would be to uh, approve the uh, cost analysis that we have just been uh, discussing. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to shortcut that. Would anyone make a motion to approve that analysis prepared by Tammy? Yes, so moved. Uh, moved by Mr. Reyes, any second? Second, second. this is Esther. Second. Second by Ms. Lin. Okay, let's go ahead and take our vote, Ms. Wong. Yes, Esther Lin. Yes. Anjali Agapta. Yes. James Bolton. Yes. Michael Kao. Yes. Alex Chen. Yes. James Efting. Yes. Karim Gongara. Yes. 
Dolores Heisinger? Yes. Michael Iseri? Yes. Larry Kaplan? Yes. Paul Kramer? Yes. Alex Lawrence? Yes. Bethany Pick? Yes. Vince Reyes? Yes. The motion passes. Okay, thanks very much. I can't wait to get to Alex Chan's goals. That's why I was uh, uh, ahead of myself, the caboose ahead of the, the engine. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So we have a lot of goals. Um, as you may note, some of the goals have to be um, uh, postponed until the next um, year, precisely because we um, have postponed the July 2020 California Bar Examination. And so for those, we're going to have, we'll, we'll continue to uh, monitor <clears throat> um, their progress. But one thing I do wanted to bring up is that previously the subcommittee wants, uh, one of the goals we listed here is to consider the proposed guidelines for interpretation of the emission rules. Um, that also, um, uh, I, I guess I was hoping to talk about today, but um, I, I do note that the Office of General Counsel and, and the State Bar um, is uh, they're in the process of reviewing the guidelines related to eligibility um, by this month. And hopefully by the next meeting, we'll have a further discussion um, as to where that is in terms of progress. Um, Tammy, do you have anything to add about that specific goal? Um, I definitely know we want to look at the rules that pertain to eligibility. Uh, it is definitely moving. It's going to continue into the 2020-2021 year. Um, and so it's going to be a matter of uh, just making sure we put time together to work on it around the October exam. So I don't know if it'll necessarily be something that we start right away for the next exam, but it's definitely something that we're going to be looking at for the next round. Okay. Thanks very much. And I think we need a motion then to approve these, uh, these, uh, these goals. Thank you, Tammy and, and Alex. Will anyone make that motion? So moved. Yes, Paul. Moved by uh, Mr. Kramer and seconded by Ms. Lynn. Okay, Ms. Wong, if you wanna go ahead then. Um, Esther Lynn. Yes. Anjali Agatha. Yes. James Bolton. Yes. Michael Cow. Yes. Alex Chen. James Efting. Yes. Mr. Chen. Kareem Gongara. Yes. Dolores Heisinger. Yes. Michael Iseri. Yes. Larry Kaplan. Yes. Paul Kramer. Yes. Alex Lawrence. Yes. Bethany Pick. Yes. Vince Reyes. Yes. Going back to Mr. Chen. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I don't know what happened to my audio. Yes. Okay, the motion passes. Okay, thanks very much. I think now it is 12 o'clock. Hey, Mr. Efting, I heard that you've got a court appearance. Will you be gone the whole afternoon or are you going to come back when you are able? Supposedly I'm pre approved, so it should only take about 10 minutes. So I hopefully be back by 1.15. Oh, okay. Well, let's take our uh, break before we go to Ed uh, Sanders. Thank you, Tammy and Alex. I, again, I, I know it sounds like I'm log rolling with, with the staff, but Tammy Campbell had to put so much together in a ver something that would ordinarily be planned a year in advance in a, a matter of weeks. And, uh, you know, you, you, you can't please everyone as uh, I'm sure you all know from all the public the comments that we get, but Tammy really pulled it together in a in a quick fashion, and my hat is is, is off to you. So thank thank you thank you, Tammy. Um, Thanks, but it really was a team effort with all of the staff and the management. So I I think it just goes to all of admissions. Uh, a thanks for everything that happened to make it work. All right, let's take uh, uh, our break for uh, 30 minutes. Is that okay? Is that gonna be enough time? We can make this a, uh, a working lunch if you bring food back uh, to your uh, table. Of course, that is absolutely acceptable, um, except for you, Alex. Uh, so let's come back around 1235. Is that okay? And then we'll get into Ed standards and um, We'll have an interesting afternoon. Okay, thanks very much. I'll see everybody soon. Thank you.
All right, let's see. I think um, I'm seeing everybody. Almost everybody. Looks like it. Where is Mr. Lawrence, the, the co-star of this show? Oh, there he is. Whew. Um, okay, let's see. Um, Kim, could I ask you to, uh, to take roll before we start our afternoon session? Sure. Esther Lynn. Miss Lynn. <coughs> Here. Dr. Oh, okay. Dr. Agata. Here. Dr. Bolton. Dr. Kao? Here. Mr. Chen? Present. Mr. Efting? Here. Mr. Gongora? Here. Ms. Heisinger? Here. Mr. Iseri? Here. Mr. Kaplan? Mr. Kramer? Here. Mr. Lawrence? Here. Ms. Pick? Mr. Reyes? Here. Ms. Pick? Bethany Peak, you're muted. Oh, maybe purposefully so. Okay. Is that everybody? Yes. And I'm here. Okay. Well, we let we are back uh, on the record on our afternoon uh, session uh, for Friday, August 21st, of the Committee of Bar Examiners. We are ready to go to the uh, Ed Standards uh, presentation of today's meeting with um, uh, the irrepressible Natalie Leonard and uh, Alex Lawrence, who needs no introduction. So let's go first then to, let's see, item uh, a four, 400, is that right? That's correct. Uh, oh, 400, that's the uh, uh, JFK University School of Law. Okay, go ahead, uh, many. Lawrence and Ms. Leonard. Great, thank you. Appreciate everybody coming back from lunch. And I uh, know we have a lot of material, so uh, bear with us in this uh, post-lunch info session, so to speak. So agenda item 0400, action on a minimum cumulative bar passage rate reporting for accredited law schools issuance of notices of non-compliance to John F. Kennedy University School of Law, Lincoln Law School of San Jose and San Francisco Law School. And just as a reminder, California accredited law schools must maintain a minimum cumulative five-year bar passage rate of 40% or more under the accredited law school calculations using the formula set forth in the accredited law school guidelines. 12 of the 16 California accredited law schools have reported a compliant NPR of 40% or more, and it is recommended that these reports be accepted as evidence of full compliance. Three currently accredited law schools have reported an NPR below 40%, with John F. Kennedy University, University School of Law reporting 39.7%, Lincoln Law School, San Jose reporting 30.9% and San Francisco Law School reporting 36%. A fourth school is no longer accredited. Attachment A contains a list of 2020 NPRs reported by each accredited school, as well as each school's 2018 and 2019 NPR values for comparison purposes. And again, just as a reminder, when a law school is found to be out of compliance with one or more of the accredited law school rules and guidelines for accredited law school rules, the CBA follows a specific process. There's no need to issue a notice to Pacific Coast University because the committee has already terminated that school's accreditation effective August 20th of 2020. The reigning three schools, however, should be issued a notice of non-compliance. 
And again, just keep in mind uh, that if a law school's accreditation is terminated, either directly or after a period of unsuccessful probation, a school may seek registration as an unaccredited law school if it can establish compliance with the rules. Uh, Ms. Leonard, do you have any additional information you want to share? I know further, but available for questions. Okay, thank you. Any, uh, any comments uh, or questions for Mr. Lawrence or Ms. Leonard about the action, proposed action on the John F. Kennedy uh, School of Law? Hmm. Uh, okay. Let me see, do we need a specific motion on that particular item? There is a staff recommendation that could be chosen. Okay, hold on for one second. I'm just, uh, I'm just pulling this up here on 0400. Just give me a moment. <clears throat> so the uh, staff recommends that the uh, committee of bar examiners issue a notice of non-compliance to the John F. Kennedy University uh, School of Law. Uh, and the uh, Lincoln Law School of San Jose and the San Francisco Law School uh, based on these uh, uh, lower NPR uh, values. So the proposed motion is that the 2020 minimum cumulative five-year bar passage reports provided by each California accredited law school be received and filed, and that these values be posted on the state bar's website and incorporated into each law school's disclosure documents. Further, that this committee make a finding that the following schools reported MPR minimum pass rate values below the required minimum of 40% and should each be issued a notice of non-compliance. So that's JFK University School of Law, Lincoln Law School of San Jose, and San Francisco Law School with their reporting percentages. Uh, further, that the MPR values of all other currently accredited law schools reported in 2020 be accepted as in compliance. Uh, will anyone make uh, that motion as I've stated it? Kramer will move. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kramer. Any second? Second. Second by Dr. Agatep. Okay, I'm gonna give it another try doing the, uh, calling the roll myself. Let's take a peek here. Um, Dr. Cow, what do you say about that? Yes. And how about you, Ms. Lynn? Yes. Mr. Efting? Are you yes. Still yeah, okay, great. And Mr. Gongora? Yes. Ms. Peak? Ms. Pete, Bethany Peak, not back yet. Mr. Reyes? Yes. Uh, Ms. Heisinger? Yes. And Mr. Isiri? Yes. Mr. Kramer? Yes. And Dr. Agatev? Yes. Dr. Bolton? Dr. Bolton? I think, uh, all right. How about, Mr. how about Mr. Kaplan? Yes. Okay. Well, all, all yeses of those that are present, motion passes. I've been forgotten, but I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, yes I'm well. sorry, Mr. Brody. I mean, Mr. Chan. <laughs> were, were you also a yeah. yes? I, I am a yes. All right. Thank you, you very can, much. You so, can throw the other. You can throw the other Alex in too. I I'd like to vote yes. Oh yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. The the one that did all the work. I apologize. Okay. Well, that motion passes. Let's go to item zero. 40401. This is the inspection report and accreditation of Concord Law School. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you. So Concord Law School at Purdue University Global is an 
unaccredited distance law school that is seeking provisional or full accreditation. The CBE requested that an inspection be conducted after it made a finding that the school appeared to demonstrate at least substantial compliance with the rules and guidelines. On April 1st through the 3rd of 2020, the school was inspected and the inspection team observed that the school appeared to be in compliance with the rules and guidelines for accredited law schools and recommended granting accreditation. The CB considered Concord's initial application in January 2020. After reviewing Concord's detailed application, the CB concluded that the Concord had demonstrated at least substantial compliance with the accredited law school rules and directed that inspection be conducted. The team included the State Bar Consultant Heather Jardakis and CBE member Dr. Agatep, along with Linda Keller, the Dean of Tom Jefferson School of Law. Though the inspection was conducted remotely, all elements that are typically part of an inspection were included. There were a number of mandatory recommendations, uh, including some other guidelines that they would like to uh, see the school put into action, uh, but I believe Looking at the report, it was pretty straightforward. Ms. Leonard, do you have any additional information you want to share? Um, just a, a little bit of framing. You'll receive three requests that are very similar to this, uh, three schools that are at a similar point in the process, this being the first of the three. Uh, there were a very small number of recommendations on this report, and uh, the school actually satisfied all of those recommendations and uh, provided documented proof prior to this meeting. Okay, Ms. Uh, Leonard, do you think we can uh, look at those three schools collectively because the recommendations are, are quite similar? I'll defer to Mr. Lawrence, uh, but I believe that you could. I, I, I think that it seems uh, appropriate to me, but Mr. Lawrence, you're, you are the boss here, so. You're muted though, you're a muted boss. Oh boy. Um, good need for that bingo slot. Uh, so I think we can do that. I just know, looking at my notes, uh, that of the schools, you know, some just have more recommended mandatory actions than others, but I think we can put all of them in one, as you're suggesting. Just uh, these three schools. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. right, I, I reviewed that and it seemed very similar to me, but if there are any distinctions, we'll go through them when it's time to make the motion. But for now, let's go forward then, if that's okay, to item uh, uh, 0402. This is the inspection report and accreditation of Northwestern California University School of Law. Yes, so... This school is an unaccredited law school that is in the process also seeking provisional or full accreditation. The team conducting this inspection on April 1st through the 3rd of this year as well. Uh, the school applied for a provisional or full accreditation in January 2020. The committee reviewed the school's detailed application as well as an extensive staff analysis addressing all aspects of the school's operations. Uh, this time, the team included the State Bar Consultant Heather Jargakis and CB member Kareem Gungora. And again, uh, the recommendation, well, the staff made a recommendation that you can read there. So I don't know if there's any, anybody has any questions that they want to ask. Um, no, I don't think so. Anything else that you wanted to uh, Add to that, Mr. Gongora, you participated in that, that one. Yeah, um, just that it was a great experience. It was um, a little after uh, we went into the Safer at Home initiative. And uh, one of the things that I learned was about the capacity that our distance learning um, institutions have developed over time. And so this is one of those that has a pretty elaborate system. Um, and so I was just very thankful for the opportunity to learn more and thankful to Natalie for the support as well as Heather Georgiakis, who is a consummate professional and I have nothing but praise for her. Um, I also was involved with another um, 
uh, site visit with her, and and I just I just wanted to sing her praises because she is a really great asset to the uh, the state bar. Okay, very good. And Dr. Cow, I'm remembering back to when I first joined the CBE before the orientation, listening to this part of the meeting, like what, what? So all will become clear at our next meeting, but as you can see, it is the responsibility of staff on this committee to uh, thoroughly vet uh, the unaccredited law schools to assure they meet uh, minimum standards for, for their students and graduates. And that's the process we're going through right now. So um, FYI. <laughs> Thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Lawrence, then it, in keeping with my idea about grouping these three together, let's go to item D, which is 0403. That is the inspection report and accreditation of the St. Francis Law School. Sure, it's an unaccredited distance law school. In April, the CB reviewed the law school's initial application on June 9th through the 11th of this year, the school was inspected. And again, the team, the inspection team observed that the school appears to be in compliance with the rules and guidelines and therefore recommends granting accreditation as well. And let me see, uh, I don't know, Natalie, do you have anything else to add? Only that we would be remiss if we did not also thank uh, Dr. Anjali Hagetep for her role in the Concord inspection, as well as Paul Kramer uh, for his role in uh, this inspection. Okay, any comments on uh, this particular school? And Natalie, is, is this school in any way connected with St. Francis, a rather prestigious private school here in LA? In fact, it's connected with Baker College, uh, which is a school that is uh, based in Michigan, very uh, long time in service to students. But it's not connected to the St. Francis here, huh? I'm not that I'm aware. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, well, let's see, CBE members. That, as I said, the recommendations for these three uh, uh, reports and accreditations of Concord, Northwestern, and St. Francis are uh, quite uh, similar. I, I don't think I'm going to, to uh, bore everybody by reading them out loud, but there are recommended actions in each one of those staff reports, 401, 402, and 403, that have been um, uh, outlined by Ms. Leonard and Mr. Lawrence, along with some recommendations for those schools to follow. Is there a, a motion to adopt uh, these uh, staff recommendations at this time? So moved. So moved. moved by uh, Mr. Chan and, and seconded by, I'm sorry, was that you, Dr. Agatep? Yeah. Dr. Lawrence. Oh, seconded by Ms. Heisker. I'm sorry, you're, you, I can't see you anymore. So I, uh, uh, I, didn't, I, I didn't see the motion. All right, made by Mr. Chan, there we go. And seconded by Ms. Heisinger. Uh, Ms. Wong, let, let's go ahead and take a vote. Then this is for these three schools uh, summarized in 401, 402, and 403. Go ahead, Ms. Wong. Ms. Lin? Yes. Dr. Agata? Yes. Dr. Bolton? Dr. Ch Kao? Yes. Mr. Chen? Yes. Mr. Ed Efting? Mr. Gongora? Yes. Ms. Heisinger? Yes. Ms. Mr. Isseri? Yes. Mr. Kaplan? Yes. Mr. Kramer? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Ms. Pick? Mr. Reyes? Yes. Dr. Bolton? The motion passes. Okay, thank you very much. Let's move to our uh, next item, uh, item uh, E. Uh, this is the 
application for accreditation for registration as an unaccredited law school, Pacific Coast University School of Law. That's uh, 0404. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Lawrence. And Great. Great. Thank you. So the school requests that the CD approve its application to register as an unaccredited fixed facility law school has operated as an unaccredited law school until transitioning to accredited status in 2010. Uh, as a reminder, the CB terminated the school's accreditation effective August 20th, 2020, because the school had been out of compliance for an extended period of years with the accredited rule requiring that accredited schools maintain a minimum cumulative five year bar exam passage rate of at least 40%. The school had its last complete inspection in 2016 and would have been due for a periodic inspection in 2021. It went, the school underwent a limited purpose inspection in October 2019, focused solely on the school's plans to improve its bar passage rate. The school has applied to operate as a registered, unaccredited fixed law, fixed facility law school and is prepared to offer classes starting as early as September 14th in 2020 if the CBE approved its application. The school submitted a complete application for registration, uh, addressing all aspects of it and responding promptly and fully to all the questions to staff. Uh, staff reviewed the attached application in detail and summarized the key notes uh, being that the school has hired a compliant dean and faculty the school's proposed fixed facility J, JD education program appears to be a, a compliant enhanced version of its prior program. And the school will maintain its physical facilities and student services while seeking a waiver to update its library. You can see uh, the recommendation from the staff in more detail as well as the proposed motion. Um, Ms. Leonard, do you have any additional information that you wanna share with the group? And similarly for FRAME, I would say that you're about to consider two similar requests. This first one that you've heard from Pacific Coast and soon one from the Southern California Institute of Law. At the preference of the chair, you may wish to take these as a, a single motion. Does anybody have any uh, comments or questions about uh, Pacific Coast? Yeah, I, I had a question. Uh, go, just go more, ahead, Mr. Just more of a, a clarification. Uh, was this their status before they became accredited? Do they automatically go, go back to that or it, the motion is to formalize them going back to that? It was their status before. They were accredited for a number of years. Um, generally, a school that is transitioning from Cal status back to registered status will meet the requirements. Um, and what we're looking for in particular in these applications is to make sure that um, in order to uh, follow the four-year rule, the specific schedule requirements of Business 6060, we're making sure that their accredited curriculum has been modified to correctly qualify them for the bar in a registered status. Okay, I see. Thank you. But Natalie, this is the very school from which we removed accreditation recently. Yes, that's correct. And the reason for that was because the school was not in compliance with the minimum passage rate. Um, the registered category of schools does not have a minimum pass rate. Uh, so there are basically two different kinds of schools, um, two different categories, and the school will properly represent to the public the services that it's offering in a registered category because it will meet all of those requirements. Uh. I, I see. But has the school done anything differently since their accreditation was removed for failure to meet those minimum pass rate? Because that just happened. So right. um, not much could have changed. And it's only been a, a month. 
Two things. Uh, the first, certainly no one's taken the bar exam since then, so their bar passage rates haven't changed. Um, the good news is they actually will go forward with their full slate of uh, bar exam remediation efforts that they planned to do, um, no matter which status they will be in. Uh, but also uh, that requirement is removed from them. So though they no longer need to meet that particular requirement, um, they are going to do all of those things and do um, manifest a strong intent to uh, improve the bar exam. Everything from changing the schedule to childcare grants uh, to a lot of very creative things, um, allowing private tutoring if someone doesn't want to re reveal their status as not passing. They really are taking um, a large number of steps and there's a section of the application um, that crystallizes those steps. There are actually as many as 40. Mm, I see. I have a quick question. Oh, go ahead. That how how soon before they are eligible to apply again for um, uh, Cal State accreditation? Yeah. Uh, there's no specific time frame, uh, but the first thing they would need to do is uh, to return to a compliant NPR status. Um, I would guess that um, based on conversations that they will be monitoring their NPR as an estimate, um, as did the three schools that just became accredited a few minutes ago, and uh, they may consider applying for that in the future. Okay, I thought you said that the non-accredited don't have an, an MPR. That's right. So they won't be required to report it to the state bar, but they know what the calculation would be. And so they can keep track or, and they can check in with the bar to verify what that calculation would be. Um, and uh, the schools that uh, just applied uh, did that also. And when they do apply, that's um, the first tab of the application. They complete that process first. It, and it, if the staff recommendation was not to approve this, would that mean that that school could not operate in our state? Uh, that's correct, because they no longer have an accredited status or degree granting authority at this particular moment. Um, and so they would be seeking a means to uh, continue to operate in California through this motion. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. I, I think I want to take these schools separately. Okay. Um, this is a little different than before. Uh, is there a, a, a motion to approve the a staff recommendation, which is to uh, grant this uh, non-accredited uh, status? Well, let me, I'm just going to read this proposed motion. Uh, the motion by staff is that the application of Pacific Coast University School of Law seeking registration and degree granting authority as an unaccredited fixed facility law school be received and filed and that the application be granted effective immediately for two years subject to the school's agreement to undergo an inspection as soon as practical in 2021 and that the school be granted a waiver to take up to one year to fully update its hard copy library with evidence of compliance to be submitted as part of the school's 2021 annual report. Will anyone make that motion? I'll move the motion. Okay, Mr. Reyes made the motion and seconded. Any second? Second. Second by Ms. Heisinger. All right, let's go ahead, Ms. Wong, with our roll call. Ms. Lin? Yes. Dr. Agate? Yes. Dr. Bolton? Dr. Kao? Yes. Mr. Chen? Yes. Mr. Efting? Mr. Gongora? Yes. Ms. Heisinger? Yes. Mr. Iseri? Yes. Mr. Kaplan? Yes. Mr. Kramer? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Ms. Pick? Mr. Reyes? Yes. Ms. Pick? Bethany, are you there? Okay. The motion passes. All right. Thank you very much.
Ms. Wong. So let's go on. Similarly, uh, 0405, this is a, a similar application for registration as an unaccredited law school. This is the Southern California Institute School of Law. Okay, uh, Mr. Uh, Lawrence, while you, you, you and Ms. Leonard really have the laboring oar here and uh, it's much appreciated. This okay, is go agenda ahead. item 0405. Yes. Right. Yes, yeah, so Southern California Institute of Law requests that the CB approve its application again to register as an unaccredited fixed facility law school. It is operated uh, as a fixed facility unaccredited law school until transitioning to accredited status as a fixed facility school in 1995. School's main campuses in both Santa Barbara and Ventura, California, it was last inspected in March 2017 and would have been due for an inspection in 2022 in its prior accredited fixed facility format. Instead, the CBE terminated the school's accreditation effective June 1st, 2020, because the school had been out of compliance for an extended period of years with the requirement that accredited schools maintain a passage rate of at least 40%. Now, uh, the school has applied to operate as a registered unaccredited distance learning law school located in Ventura. The school proposes that the classes will be taught via synchronous internet delivery if the CBE should approve. The school Santa Barbara campus has closed and its plans are for the program are, are evolving. It's submitted several versions of its application. The staff have been uh, doing a great job putting the pieces together uh, for this, uh, making has the most current plan that it intends to pursue. Uh, but having said that, the, the school does appear to have the intent and capacity to uh, offer a compliant, unaccredited distance education program. Uh, the dean and faculty will continue in their roles. Um, the school's proposed fixed facility JD education program appears to have a compliant schedule that includes all bar tested subjects. Um, the school will maintain um, its electronic library um, as well. Um, just looking at my notes, I think that's it. Unless, Ms. Leonard, do you have any additional information you want to share? Um, yeah, with regard to the inspection, it's requested that this also be ex um, inspected on a, a reasonably quick time frame, primarily because they're switching their form. They're going from a fixed facility uh, to a um, an online status, so making sure they've done that correctly and um, effectively and on the correct timeline. Hmm. Any comments uh, or... Mr. Lawrence or Ms. Leonard about this particular school. Ms. Leonard, I was kind of surprised to see that the, the dean, who I presume owns the school, is not even a licensed attorney uh, himself. His, um, he earned his uh, degree outside of the United States um, and uh, has not practiced. He works in concert with uh, Dean Eric Palmer who is a California licensee um, attorney. But the Dean Poole is the one that owns the school, is that right? Generally, the deans are the owners in these schools? Not generally, but um, in this case, I, I do believe that, that, I believe there's a corporate entity, but I believe that he is the owner. Huh. So there's no requirement that the school owner be a licensed attorney in California or any other U.S. state? Um, I can pull up the text. Uh, it's actually been discussed before as to him because he's not admitted to practice here and yeah. previously the committee has allowed him to serve because he does um, have a foreign uh, degree in law and has um, taught at law schools in the U.S. Um, so it, it's something that has come to the committee before but has caught the notice of the committee before as well. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to re-dread that. It's just when I s reviewed your report, I was surprised to see that the dean and owner, presumably, is, is not a licensed uh, California attorney. Um, mm -hmm. 
Okay. Well, here, uh, CBE, is the proposed motion. It, it, it's near identical to the one that we just uh, approved for the uh, other school uh, that went from accredited to unaccredited. So the motion here is that the application of Southern California Institute of Law seeking registration as an unaccredited distance law school and degree granting authority pursuant to that status be received and filed and that the application be granted effective immediately for a period of two years subject to the school's agreement to undergo an inspection as soon as practical and no later than the end of 2021 and the school's agreement to provide to the state bar students and staff updated copies of its faculty and student manuals prior to the expected start of classes currently set for September 14, 2020, just in a couple weeks. Uh, will anyone uh, make that motion? <clears throat> Any CBE members move to approve that granting of unaccredited school status to the school we've been discussing, Southern California Institute. So moved. Moved by who? I'm sorry, Mr. Chan, thank you. And any second there? All second. Seconded by Mr. Reyes. All right, let's go ahead with our vote then, Ms. Wong. Ms. Lim? Yes. Dr. Agatha? No. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Dr. Kao? Yes. Mr. Chen? Yes. Mr. Efting? I'm going to abstain on this one because I only part of, heard part of it. Mr. Gongora? I'm going to, I'm going to abstain. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what Mr. Gongora said. Uh, abstain. Oh. Thank you. Ms. Heisinger? Yes. Mr. Isari? Yes. Mr. Chaplin? Yes. Mr. Kramer? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Ms. Pick? Mr. Reyes? Yes. How about you, uh, Mr. Chair? Uh, I'll vote yes. The motion passes. Thank you very much. And thank you again for such uh, solid uh, work. Uh, I, I know committee members, you know, by the time it gets to us, they put poured hours into this. And I'm very res respectful of that, which is why I usually vote yes to a staff recommendation in the Ed Standards Department. Let's go on then to uh, item G, which is 0406. This is the periodic inspection report for People's College of Law. Go ahead, Mr. Great. Lawrence. Thank you. So the People's College of Law underwent a five-year inspection on January 14th through the 16th of 2020. While numerous issues were uncovered during the inspection, the school focused its efforts to address and complete nearly all of them. As a result, the inspection report recommends that the school's registration be continued. Several options are presented as to the timing of the school's next inspection. Again, just a little bit of uh, background. Uh, People's College of Law is a registered unaccredited fixed facility law school located here in Los Angeles. Um, it's always focused on preparing students for practice and public uh, interest law. Uh, uh, the state bar consultant, uh, Heather Sorgakis, uh, was the person who conducted that inspection. Um, you, again, you have a copy there of the report. Um, I don't think there was anything that really did jump out, but I'll, I'll mention that um, there was a uh, comment that, you know, at a minimum, um, the school should be inspected again no later than the fall of 2024. Uh, the school's original 
uh, fall 2019 inspection was delayed to allow time for the school to complete its self-study. Um, the school self-study was delivered late in 2009. Um, and let me see, Ms. Leonard, do you want to add any additional information? Sure. Um, let me explain the context of this one. This is an exceedingly unusual inspection. And I will also comment that the Dean, Dean Iris Biro, um, is here uh, as an attendee. Um, he wanted the group to know that he's available to um, answer questions. Um, so the People's College of Law is um, a school that if we were to look at this inspection uh, in and of itself, uh, it had a very large number of recommendations, much more than would normally be seen. Um, the school was very receptive to the State Bar um, recommendations. They took major action at this time, uh, concurrent with the pandemic, to make significant changes on short notice, uh, including installing a brand new um, ERP computer system, uh, moving to a proper lockdown situation for exam taking, um, much like the State Bar does here with ExamSoft, et cetera. Um, so they provided updates as to each recommendation. But with that said, if we look at this in context, uh, over the last three inspections, um, this school, which works largely with the help of volunteers, um, including a volunteer dean uh, and a single paid administrator, um, has had a very large number of recommendations each time. Um, has responded to those recommendations each time, but has not sustained those recommendations, and we see many of them come back. So there's a point in the inspection that talks about that time frame. Um, so here, their response was uh, significant and swift and full and effective. Um, but with that said, it's important to know that it's sustained. Um, and as a result, uh, this uh, inspection report brings three choices back to the committee. Uh, a normal inspection uh, at this time would uh, set a new inspection in five years. Uh, but really the choices before that are recommended to the committee, although uh, they can choose the five year, is to choose um, a fall 2024 inspection. Uh, the reason for that was one of the issues was problematic um, administration and limited administrative capacity. And as a result, they were not able to finish their self-study on time. They were upfront about that. We worked with them. They improved the self-study so that the inspection could be conducted, but it resulted in a delay, which shouldn't um, delay their future oversight. Um, a second possibility that you could add is uh, normally a school would update and confirm their completion in their annual report, but perhaps it's appropriate for this school to do so every year, even once they have achieved compliance, to make sure that it's sustained. Um, the, a closer level of oversight could um, set an intermediate inspection uh, in 2022, halfway there. Uh, the school would bear the cost for that if they did do that, uh, but it gives three levels of options to make sure that it is sustained. So um, the most standard is five years. Uh, here we recommend uh, approximately four, four and a half years, perhaps monitoring every year perhaps an intermediate inspection, uh, and we seek committee input um, in this very unusual situation. Um, thank you, Natalie. Natalie, do, do, do the schools have advance notice of these inspections? Uh, they do. Uh, we, tell, we tell the schools at the beginning of the year um, that their inspection is coming up that year, and then we set up a meeting with them uh, to do a kickoff. And so we set a time frame. Um, and uh, the school had hoped to have the materials by a certain date, but it wasn't possible. Because um, I, I, I do note your report is, is unusual in that the, 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 uh, the, the, the recommended actions, there are 19 uh, yes. as opposed to one or two. Right, and uh, I, oh, oh, sorry, please do. No, go, go ahead. I just, uh, I, I, I'm just not used to seeing such a large number. So this was not a surprise inspection where you show up, we're here, the, the school had advance notice of the items to be addressed. 
That's correct. And you are correct in noting that that is a much larger number than we would see at most schools. And if you were to look back at their two prior inspection reports, um, you would see a large number, some of them similar. Uh, so your analysis is um, absolutely correct. And uh, that is part of why we're bringing several choices um, to the committee, uh, because it, this uh, does warrant that level of discussion. <clears throat> Okay, I didn't mean to step on my fellow committee members. What did anyone have any uh, comments or questions for either Natalie or uh, I suppose the dean uh, who's present? Um, I have a quick question. Go ahead, Ms. Heisinger. Um, how many how many students do they have? It's a small school, um, generally anywhere from um, 18 to 30 students. Okay. Um, just as an aside, it would be helpful uh, to me to get a, an idea of, of some of these schools if in the background information of your executive summary you included their most recent enrollment. Sure. Just to get an idea. I'd be happy to do that. Um, Let's see. Uh, um, I have uh, a question. This is Angela. Go ahead, Dr. Agatev. How many different individuals were named Dean within the last 10 years for this school? I, you know, I'm, I'm not certain. I know that uh, the current Dean, uh, who is actually elected at this school, was elected in 2017 and has served since then. Um, I, I would not know without checking um, prior to that how long the prior dean served. I will say that there was um, significant turnover in the registrar position um, in just the time that I've been working with the schools the last two years, uh, there were at least three. Uh -huh. hmm. Well, uh, um, and uh, you, I'm sorry, you said the dean is, was, was present? Yes, that's Dean Iris Byro, and he yes. is here. I see, uh, you know, committee members, um, if it's okay, is that this is really not a report that we are used to seeing with these many points of concern. I'm gonna ask the dean if mm -hmm. he wishes to briefly address uh, the committee on this issue, which directly involves the school, which I presume he is a principal in. So you, uh, let me see. Um, uh, um, I'm trying to unmute you, Caroline or... Um, Mr. Chair, I can ask Devin to, um, un to oh, give... Okay. I, I had that power, but it was taken away from me, uh, apparently, because I was a bad boy. Uh, and for Devin, if she needs to do a search, his last name is Spiro, S-P-I-R-O. He's he at the top be. of my uh, feed here, but I'm not, if I click on the chat button, oh, there we go. Okay, uh, Dean uh, Spiro, you, you've you been unmuted, and uh, if you'd like to address the, the committee on the issues raised by uh, uh, this agenda item, uh, please please do so at this time. Sure, thank you. Um, uh, first of all, about the number of uh, uh, items, as we're calling them, they're, 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 it's a euphemism a bit, they're, they're deficiencies in compliance. Um, uh, the, there are, those are a lot, there were actually 20. We received a draft report um, that had 20 items on it. Um, one was dropped, I guess, but, uh, um, we worked very hard after receiving that, very, very, very hard, um, and sent a, uh, it was called a progress report in at, uh, at the request of the State Bar. And in it, uh, we reported that all the, uh, 20 of the 24 were rectified and we were in compliance on all 20 of those. Um, and we 
we're still working on compliance with others. There's one that has to do with the library that's, uh, well, I can talk about it if, uh, if you like. Um, about the number, I agree with what Ms. Leonard says. Um, I'd like to give you a little history. Oh, first one point of clarification. I am not a principal of the school. There are no principals of the school. It's a non, P-A-L-S, that is. Um, it's, it's a nonprofit corporation. So nobody owns it. Um, and in fact, nobody is paid anything for their work. That includes me, the faculty, except for the administrator. It's a fairly low paid job. All right. Um, uh, as far as the number of the, of, um, uh, I'll call them violations, but they are. Um, I, I need to give you some history. In, in, um, in the fall of, uh, spring, fall of 2017, uh, there was an, an election in May. But in order to get that election of the board, in order to get that election, there were there had there was litigation because there had not been a, an election since 2011, even though our bylaws call for yearly elections. Um, the election was very was, was cataclysmic really for the school because previously the school had been run in a somewhat um, lawless way, I have to say. Uh, um, there, and the question about how many deans, it's been me since May of 2017. Before that, uh, for many, many years, there, were, uh, there was a dean who did not function as dean. And then upon the 20, 2009 inspection, it was recommended that uh, the chair of the board become the quote, academic dean, and that's what happened. Um, uh, so when I was selected by the board as dean in May 2017. Um, I had a whole lot to do. Uh, I didn't volunteer for this position, but I accepted. And uh, so I studied the, the rules, the, the guidelines, that's the state bar's rules and guidelines and the statutes and the 20, 2009 inspection report. And I saw that there was a ton to do and we started doing it, but there was so much to do that there was a lot left undone. And some things I didn't really appreciate uh, were, were undone until the, this most recent inspection report, which was a great, great help to us, really it was. Um, uh, all right, I think uh, if anybody has questions, I'll answer anything. But where, where is your school, Dean? It's about a mile west of uh, downtown Los Angeles. And it, it, is that a building that you rent space in, or is that your space, or what is that? We own the building. Uh, uh, we've owned the building uh, for something like thirty-five years. So, do you do you, do you represent your school as a place for students to go to to be prepared to sit, uh, take, and pass the California bar exam? Certainly, if they if they. Uh, uh, past the uh, first year, uh, our uh, first year law students examination. So si since you've been Dean 2017, have you had students who have become members of the bar? Yes, I, we have. A, uh, I put that in that the progress report that, that you all members uh, might not have seen it, but on the first page, I have um, I put in some statistics about our bar passage rate. Now, it's, we have people from years and years before still taking the bar. One has taken it 20 some times. But uh, I, I, I made a study myself to calculate in the last few graduating classes, what percentage of those people in those classes passed the bar exam. 2015 class, 25%. 2016, 0%. 2017, 37 and a half percent. 2018, 42.9 percent. 2019, uh, only two have taken it so far. Neither of them has passed. And Dean, it sounds like you know the lay of the land in in LA, because you're you're down there. If you're if you're uh, 
if the registration of your school was not renewed, where would you recommend that your students go? Mm. In, in LA, you're, I assume a lot of them are working adults. Almost who, all of them. Who um, live it and work in LA. Where, where, what recommendation would you have? There, there are a number of other unaccredited law schools in LA. What, what, what would you recommend? Yeah. Your school's well, not renewed. It's a really difficult question because our tuition, our, our total charge is at $5,800 a year. It's far lower than any other school. Um, and that's because we want to turn out what kind of we informally call people's lawyers so they don't have a lot of debt when they uh, and have to take higher paying jobs. But anyway, where would they go? Um, I suppose to uh, the least expensive online school they can find because um, the, the uh, fixed facility schools are so expensive. Even the least, uh, well, no, there's, no. There, there's, a, there's one in, um, in Ventura that is somewhere between 10 and 15,000 a year or 12 and 15. And the one you, you all just voted on, uh, Pacific Coast um, is, uh, I think somewhere between 12 and 15,000. Uh, I mean, I, I certainly appreciate, not only do I appreciate you being here and speaking today, but I appreciate that many of the issues with your school were an in inherited by you, uh, uh, that you know, have been an issue long, you know, long before you assumed the helm. So yeah. are, are, do you own the building or? Me? No, the school you? owns the building. Uh, I see. And do you offer other programs there that do not uh, represent to lead to sitting for the bar exam? Or is that, it's only just a law school? It's only a law school. We have a tenant that's a, a nonprofit dealing with uh, uh, immigration and, 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 and uh, Salvadoran immigrants, but uh, that's a tenant. Uh -huh. I see. I also wanted to say, may I, may I say this on, uh, I did a similar study for our, uh, percentages of passing the first year law students examination. So very quickly, the, the, the first year class of 2016-17, 50% passed. The first year class of 2017-2018, 67% passed. First year class of 2018-2019, 57% passed. We don't have our, our letter yet from the uh, state bar, at least I don't think we do, uh, about this most recent now those are way, way, way higher than the average on that test uh, statewide, which I Ms. Leonard can say, but I think it's around 25%. I believe this time the pass rate was 22.5. I'll defer to Ms. Dole. So I think you're doing a good job. <laughs> uh, I, again, uh, Dean Spear, when I, I, I'm, I'm sorry if my question sound, sound unsophisticated, but you say that, that everybody at the school works for free. So that means that the instructors of the classes volunteer their time? They do, and they are all uh, practicing attorneys in, in the area, except for two co-teachers who are law graduates art of our school. So what do, what do they do for books and such? You mean what do the students Expo, do? Right. What do the students use to learn their their subjects? Are do they use textbooks similar to those used in other law schools, or yes. are they just? Yeah, they do. Uh huh. I taught uh, three different courses there: um, uh, uh, contracts, uh, well, mainly constitutional law and civil procedure. I used regular textbooks. Well, one of them was this cases and and uh, examples series. Um, one course I taught on uh, my specialty, Wage an Hour, I used my own materials. And then do, do your graduates traditionally use Barbary or other of the commercially available bar prep classes? Yes, they do. They, they got to save up money for them, but they do. Right, that's not provided by the school. It's not. Uh -huh. uh, we've talked about it. Uh, our, our budget is extremely small. We'd have to raise the tuition to do that. And, and, and we, I proposed it, but uh, some of the students said, listen, I don't want to use that one or that one. So I'll just buy my own. So that 
my my motion on that to the board uh, didn't pass. Uh -huh. I see. Well, the cost certainly sounds uh, uh, more readily available, but I, I suppose it's a question of the time commitment. Students that choose your school are choosing that over other schools, and are they getting the value? And I, I guess you, you believe that they are. Yeah, yeah for sure. Uh -huh. I see. Okay. I, did anyone else have anything for Dean Spiro? It's a little unusual, but uh, you know he he was present, and uh, uh, if we were all in person, we would I would have invited him to speak. So thank you, committee members, for letting us do that uh, here. Um, the thank you, Dean. Thank so you. The, the 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 motion here for the CBE is that uh, uh, the CBE file, the periodic inspection report of People's College of Law, that it adopt all recommendations contained therein, which is quite lengthy, and accept the school's documented progress as to each of those recommendations with the exception of the library requirement and that it renew the school's registration and in, as an unaccredited law school through fall 2024, that the school be granted a waiver regarding its library facilities to allow the use of online resources in the LA County Law Library, it's not that far, with the understanding that the school will submit an updated plan to return to compliance with guideline 6.2 acceptable to the committee as part of its 2020 annual report and document actual compliance in its 2021 annual report. Failure to do so will result in an issue of non-compliance and further that the school provide in each annual report a detailed update as to its compliance status with each of the recommendations noted above which is those 19, with the understanding that failure to demonstrate continuing compliance will result in issuing a notice of non-compliance. And finally, that the registration be renewed and that a next inspection set for, and then that time to be determined by the committee of bar examiners, if any. The possible time is fall 2024, which is four years from now, uh, but subject to uh, an earlier date as per the Committee of Bar Examiners. So that is the, the, the motion. And before I ask if anyone will make it, Natalie, can you remind me and maybe everybody else, what's the library requirement in this digital age of online everything. What is the um, The library requirement has been stable for quite some time. Uh, for a fixed facility school, um, it is required to have um, and own and maintain its own hard copy library. Um, the challenges here are that the school's hard copy library housing in the building that it owns unfortunately burned. Um, and has not been fully restored. So they're working on recreating a space um, and then uh, updating the books that were not burned um, and uh, receiving others. And they've received um, alumni donations of books. In the meantime, while they're teaching school online through Zoom, um, they've been giving students access to the LA County Library and the online resources uh, because for that school, just as many others, uh, their physical buildings are not having the students inside. But what, what is what is required to be in that library? Is it the whole Cal App series? Is it the U.S. Supreme Court? Uh, I, I honestly don't, I don't know. All the horn books? Or... Yeah, it's a specific set of the general reporters um, oh. that you would find and they can choose West um, or uh, Deering's, things like that. Um, and, they, and there is still a requirement to teach not only um, electronic research, but, but 
but recommendations by the papers. And later today, we'll be talking about updating the accredited rules, and we will turn next to these as well. I mean, for this particular year, because the students are not present in class, uh, they're probably not uh, harmed by not having the physical books there uh, because they're also not there. And so the school is asking for a year to begin to purchase those books again while the students are away. So what would be the, because the time frame is, is open, so I haven't really completed what this proposed motion would be. What's the earliest time that you think is reasonable, you and Mr. Lawrence think is reasonable and appropriate for an, an update? I mean, I'm, I'm just concerned about these students that are committing their time to peoples as opposed to another school and hopefully not to their detriment. Um, well, that's up to the committee. I'll make a suggestion. Uh, the school had filed one update, as uh, Dean Spiro mentioned. They will be filing another update with their annual report in November to be seen in December. Um, so the, the committee might choose a time now, but could actually revisit the time based on the results of that update in the inspection report. Um, so you've got uh, two chances. You can make an estimate and you can check the progress as of the fall um, to uh, validate that estimate. Well, do you think a time frame of one year from now, fall 2021, as opposed to four years, is too soon? I, mean, I don't I think so, particularly if they are put on notice at this point, absolutely. Um, they have made all of the policy changes, they have purchased all of the systems, and in a year you should be able to see if those plans um, have been implemented as planned. Uh -huh. Yes, so I think that that can absolutely work. So, uh, I'm sorry, did someone want to say something? Yeah. yeah. Oh, go ahead, Donna. Yeah, so I just I just want to say that I um I I really appreciate the concerns that you've raised um, because I have the same concerns as I'm looking at the significantly long list of uh, of issues that were found during the inspection. Um, you know, first I was uh, appeased by the fact that that the school responded very positively to that and implemented a lot of changes right away. What, what really sort of concerned me, however, was the finding that's included in your um, agenda item that, uh, that a lot of these issues have come up over the past couple of uh, inspections. Uh, they've been identified, plans have been made to fix them, and, and, the, the, um, and, and the remedy hasn't been maintained. And so we're having the same issues, and I'm, I'd be very concerned about Ex uh, about using a, a four-year time frame for um, for an inspection um, for the very reasons that you raised. I think it's an important um, discussion point that, that you brought to the committee that seeing these happen sort of over, over and over again um, uh, should give us a, a little pause and want to make sure um, that the great plans that People's College put in place immediately after this inspection hold um, and are continued, continue to be provided to support the students. Okay, and committee members, I, I, I know it goes without saying that, that we are truly the gatekeepers here for those that wish to offer instruction purportedly leading to a license to practice law. And I think all of us can appreciate a uh, low cost school for working adults that, uh, that makes this kind of education available to all or, or many, many more than say an accredited law school. However, there must be some value to it or those students are uh, unfairly being subjected to a time commitment that could be best used elsewhere. Um, um, so I, uh, I, I think we really, you know, as the committee of bar examiners are the ones we really are deciding right now uh, the status and the future of a school holding itself out as a bar exam preparation um, 
you know, that's got a number of holes. Uh, I, I suppose I would ask if anyone will make the motion with a one year timeline. Uh, Natalie, I just don't think it's fair to the CBE to have to revisit this every other meeting. Um, but uh, if, 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 well, would anyone Mr. make Chair. that motion? That would be a provisional uh, granting of non Mr. Chair, status. you mentioned, uh, the, so you're saying the next inspection being fall 2021? Well, yes, that's- Okay. The, I, I what, do you, what do you think uh, about that, Mr. Lawrence? I, I think that's fair. I'm sorry, uh, the, the, go ahead. I have, a I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, for the uh, for for 19 items are in one year are we expecting that all of them be completed or the more critical ones is there some cat how these are categorized or is this a, a merely an update well i think that what you'll find is that um they have in fact um completed them but sometimes that means um updating a policy and then what you'll see in a year is implementing that policy so I, I do think that um, the school, uh, if they implement what they say, will demonstrate full compliance as to all of these. I don't think that there is a reason to um, expect that it be scaled, um, other than that they may be purchasing uh, the final or receiving donations of the final books in the library. Um, and I think had they not taken the um, the open and significant actions that they did, this might even uh, be a different type of non-compliance type of conversation. Uh, so only because they took the steps to um, facially establish, but need to maintain compliance. That yeah, it's, it's, it now. seems like uh, sustainability of the, uh, all of the points is what's important uh, for this committee to, to be looking well, at. Mr. Reyes, when I said would anyone uh, make that motion. My what I presumed was that all 19 points would be complied with. That was really my intent. Not some or most or this is this is it. I think that even a one year is an accommodation, and I I totally get it, and I'm so appreciative that the dean uh, himself is present. But you know we need to. We are representing the bar here. We are approving, and anyone can look to it and see that the State Bar of California has approved this school as a non-accredited law school, with true law school. So uh, I think that caution is, well, I think that, the, what, Mr. Reyes, would you make that motion now that we've kind of honed it down that those things need to be satisfied to this committee and staff by the next next inspection one mr year. mr brody mr chair if i may just jump in for a second before yeah. we uh uh formally make the motion you know given covid I, I i'm just a little concerned that if we would give them one year we're basically setting it up for a failure i i think one year with the hurdle of COVID, um, it might be difficult to uh, to really ask the school to comply with all the guidelines. Uh, with that said, I'm, I'm hoping we could give them some wiggle room, perhaps with extra three to six months, again, given a COVID, um, uh, for them to bring themselves into full compliance. That being said, you know, I, I have heard, uh, Dean Spiro, what you said, I, I think your effort is commandable and the school certainly has come a long way since 2017. And despite all the hurdles and roadblocks and the details of which are available online, I certainly have seen progress and progress certainly has been made to date and it's very encouraging. And, you know, we have schools with more financial resources yet do not meet our requirements, but here it is, you know, there's a school that has shown its courage and promise to bring itself into substantial compliance. So with that, you know, I'm, I'm hoping on our end, we would at least facilitate or provide the school with some assistance instead of setting them up for failure, knowing that it, it will be tremendously difficult for not just this school, but for any schools to bring themselves into full compliance on 19 different issues. I, I honestly don't think this would be, you know, I think a year later it would have come back and vote on this issue. We, I highly doubt that the school would be able to meet all these guidelines. And so 
you know, this is just my thinking. What Donna said is well-founded. I think we need to understand that there's a consumer protection aspect to what we do. But at the same time, we need to make sure that we're not setting them up or ourselves for failure. And so with that said, I'll yield back my time. So, uh, Robbie, this is Dolores. Yes, go ahead, Ms. Heisen. Um, I'd like to jump on uh, Alex's bandwagon. I think he's right on. Um, there's so many unknowns with COVID. We don't know what's going to happen in, even within the next year, whether we're still going to be wearing our masks for the next five years. Um, I, I wonder if you would um, consider a two-year time period rather than a one-year. Is that, are you making that, uh, that, mo that sort of piggybacking on the motion that I asked if anyone would make? Yes, I, I would move a two-year period. Okay, so essentially then, committee members, the motion is uh, 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 allow People's College two years, so that would be an inspection in two years instead of four for compliance with the items uh, outlined in uh, Natalie's uh, staff recommendation. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second, I'll, I'll second that motion. That's second by Mr. Uh, Reyes. Uh, uh, any, uh, I appreciate, uh, I know I prolonged this a little bit, but you know, I, I have strong feelings about, about our role uh, here. Um, any other comments or let's go ahead and call for a vote then? Angela, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, does that, will it also compel them to give us yearly reports? So yes. we would get a report at the end of this year and then next year we'll get a yearly report and then the following we get to do the inspection. Is that correct? That's correct. And uh, when we receive those reports as a matter of course, uh, we review them in the interim. So should something change drastically, uh, then that will be brought to the committee even prior to two years. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Oh, go ahead, Dr. Cow. May I ask a question? Is that, um, is there a reciprocity between law schools? So that if one law school is no, able, no longer able to take care of their students, is there a reciprocity where other law schools would be able to absorb their students? That's a great question, uh, Dr. Cal. Natalie, do you wanna speak to that? You're talking about if a school were to go under or not, their license not be renewed, what would be the fate of this, those students and the time they've already put in? Yes, yes. sir. Go, go ahead, Natalie. I, uh, yes, Dr. Cao, they can transfer um, to other registered or perhaps accredited schools if they qualify. And what we've seen in the past is that if a school um, did close uh, for whatever reason, then other schools did step in uh, to provide those students a place to complete their study. And in fact, there'll be a motion today um, where a school uh, is merging with another school and changing its format. And so an additional school has stepped in to provide um, a fixed facility place for those students to complete their exam. That'll be a, a real life example. May I ask a second question as well, uh, Natalie, is that if a school is able to absorb a student uh, from an unlicensed school, um, does the uh, American Bar Association or the State Bar California have funding to uh, make up the difference in tuition for students? Um, they generally would not be going to an ABA approved school. Um, that would be an extremely unusual situation. Um, generally, uh, the scores and the preferences of the students would take them to another registered or accredited. Um, and often that's a similar tuition level, although in this case, um, Dean Spiro was correct, that tuition is very modest. And so other, uh, most, uh, but not all, other registered schools would cost more as uh, would the accredited schools. I'm not aware of a particular funding source for students from uh, the state bar. I think they would have to look to traditional funding. Thank you. Okay, so let's go ahead then and take our vote, which is uh, um, uh, approving non-accredited status with a two-year uh, review, formal review uh, by staff. Uh, Ms. Wong, let's go ahead then. Ms. Lin? Yes. Dr. Agata? Yes. Dr. Bolton? 
Dr. Kao? Abstain. Mr. Chen? Yes. Mr. Afting? Yes. Mr. Gongora? Ms. Heisinger? Yes. Mr. Isari? Yes. Mr. Kaplan? Yes. Mr. Kramer? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Ms. Peek? Yes. Ms. Mr. Reyes? Yes. Mr. Gongora? Dr. Bolton? Yes. The motion passes. Okay. Th thank you very much. And thank you, committee members. You know, with so much discussion on the, the bar exam and such, uh, sometimes we forget that this is a, a, an equally important part of what we do at the CBE. Uh, and I very much appreciate the, the, the thought that went into all, all of these, especially this one. Uh, so thank you. Moving on, and thank you again, Dean uh, Spiro. Let's go to item H. I think they get a little bit less, a little easier. Uh, this is uh, action on major changes of ownership and location for the Western Sierra Law School, uh, 0407. Mr. Lawrence? Sure. So Western Sierra Law School is a registered, unaccredited, fixed facility law school located in San Diego. The current owner seeks approval seeks advance approval from the Committee of Bar Examiners for two major changes, changing the, the ownership of the school by transferring it from its current owner, Angela Saldariaga, to Western Sierra Law School, LLC, owned by school alumni, Joshua and Erica Schoonover, and, changing, and number two, changing the location of the school from San Diego to an address in Ocean in Oceanside and the mailing address to Bonsall, California. The school has provided a detailed plan documenting how the purchasers will ensure continued compliance with the rules and guidelines for accredited for unaccredited law schools. Uh, the proposal purchase entity Western Sierra Law School LC is owned by alumni. Joshua and Erica Schoonover, the purchasers plan to relocate the campus to Oceanside, which is 35 miles from the school's current location. In the, in the short term, the school plans to continue to utilize the committee's waiver to allow fixed facility schools to teach classes online through August 31st, 2020, due to the pandemic, until it is possible to return to offering fixed facility classes the school's 15 enrolled students have been taking their classes online via Zoom. While preparing their joint application, the purchasers reviewed the school's operations and concluded and confirmed that they would continue operations in a manner largely unchanged from current operations. The school's JD core structure and calendar will continue as will most of the other operating and record keeping functions. The purchasers plan to make the following changes that are not expected to reduce compliance. As I mentioned earlier, the school relocate from San Diego to Oceanside in classroom facilities with adequate space for the current student body and the option to lease additional space nearby for physical distancing if needed. The offices and classrooms will be located in separate locations in the same suite. Also, the school will continue to teach classes remotely through August 31st under the CBE's general waiver. The purchaser, purchasers plan to make changes to increase compliance, including transfer ownership of the school's library and purchase updates for it. Uh, they will be assisted by an advisory board consisting of the schoonovers and an additional attorney. The current owner, has agreed to continue to assist through a transition period as well. All parties hope to execute the purchase and change of location and address as soon as possible. They have agreed to advise the State Bar when the purchase is complete, as well as when the physical move of facilities is complete. 
and to participate in a video call to confirm the move's completion. The school is tentatively set for periodic inspection in winter 2021, and it's recommended that an inspection be conducted as soon as possible in 2021 as the circumstances of the pandemic allow. Um, Ms. Leonard, do you have any additional information you want to share? And no further. Uh, Registrar Erica Schoonover is here uh, if there are questions. Um, okay, uh, committee members. Um, as I said, this seems more straightforward. Uh, any discussion here or uh, let me uh, present the proposed motion then that the application of Western Sierra Law School seeking major changes to transfer ownership of the school to Western Sierra Law School LLC, change the location to Seagate Way in Oceanside and the mailing address to a post office box in Bonsal be received and filed, that the request be granted, conditioned upon the school advising the state bar within 30 days of the date of closing of the purchase and again within 30 days of the date of the move and consenting to undergo a periodic inspection as soon as practical in 2021, subject to the fees stated in the schedule of charges. This permission will lapse if the purchase is not conclude, concluded within one year of today's date. That is the staff uh, recommendation. Will anyone make that motion? So moved, Angela. Moved by Dr. Agatep. Any second? I can't ask her. Second by Ms. Uh, Lynn. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and take the vote. Uh, again, I think this is more, more straightforward. Ms. Wong? Ms. Lynn? Yes. Dr. Agatep? Yes. Dr. Bolton? Dr. Kao? Yes. Mr. Chen? Yes. Mr. Efting? Yes. Mr. Gongara? Ms. Heisinger? Yes. Mr. Mr. Iseri? Yes. Mr. Kaplan? Yes. Mr. Kramer? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Ms. Pitt? Yes. Mr. Reyes? Yes. Mr. Gongora? Dr. Bolton? Yes. The motion passes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's go now to um, another, I think, uh, easy one. This is uh, item number, uh, item I, action on major change, adding or changing JD programs to expand online offerings Closing Santa Cruz Satellite Campus, progress update on pilot hybrid JD program, Monterey College of Law. This is item 0408. Okay, Great. Mr. Lawrence. Thank you. Monterey College of Law is accredited, is a California accredited law school operating campuses in Bakersfield, San Luis Obispo and Seaside. The school was last inspected in 2018 and to be and found to be operating compliantly. Its accreditation was renewed through 2023. The school's minimum cumulative bar passage rate is also compliant and exceeds the 40% minimum. In 2018, the NPR was 47.9, while it's 20. 2019 NPR was 54.3% and its 2020 was 53.7%. MCL filed this major change request seeking several requests providing the CBA with a progress report on the first two years of operation of its pilot hybrid JD program requesting permission to offer a permanent and more flexible version of the hybrid JD program requesting permission to adjust the school's separate traditional classroom JD program to allow its students to take any number of online courses as part of their JD education and advising the CB, 
this MCL is closing the Santa Cruz satellite. In 2018, the CB approved MCL's request to offer a pilot hybrid JD program and asked the school to provide a progress report after one year. MCL also seeks permission to allow students in the fixed facility JD program to incorporate unlimited online classes. As I mentioned, MCL satellite campus in Santa Cruz has closed permanently. The school has established that its requests are compliant and will not adversely affect the school's overall compliance. Ms. Leonard, do you have any additional information you want to provide? And no further, but just to make sure that people understand the, the trajectory of events here, the school was approved uh, to have a pilot hybrid JD in a particular format. Um, they executed that. It took time for them to start, and their first year of their design program was um, a physical location, so they weren't going online until their second year. They now are. Um, they appreciated their experience with it, and they're asking for permission to expand going forward. They were required to file the progress report, and now they're asking for um, an expansion. Thank you very much, uh, Natalie and Alex. Any comments on this uh, proposed uh, change? Okay, let me uh, present the proposed motion of staff then uh, that the CBE receive and file Monterey College of Laws report regarding its pilot hybrid JD program and the closing of its Santa Cruz campus and accept those reports that the committee receive and file the law school's request to offer an expanded hybrid JD curriculum, as well as to allow students in the fixed facility JD program to incorporate an unlimited number of online classes into their JD programs, and that these requests be granted effective immediately. Will anyone make that motion with respect to this school? This is Bethany, I'll make the motion. Okay, motion made by Ms. Peek, any second? I shall second. Second by Mr. Chan. All right, let's go ahead, Ms. Wong, with the with the, our vote today. Ms. Lin? Yes. Dr. Agatha? Yes. Dr. Bolton? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can, doctor. Okay. Yes. Dr. Kao? Yes. Mr. Chan? Mr. Efting? Yes. Mr. Chen? Ms. Heisinger? Yes. Mr. Isseri? Yes. Mr. Kaplan? Yes. Mr. Kramer? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Ms. Pig? Yes. Mr. Rios? Yes. The motion passes. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you again, Alex and Natalie. Let's go to the next item. It's been a very busy committee, uh, which is a 0409 action on major change, adding a new full-time JD program to the San Francisco Law School. Uh, Alex and Natalie. Thank you, San Francisco. Law School is an accredited fixed facility law school offering a JD degree through its campuses in Emeryville and San Diego. Each campus offers a part-time evening JD program over four years. It comprised largely of fixed facility classes and a few online classes as well. Uh, the school seeks the committee's approval of a major change request to offer a full-time JD program at its Emeryville campus starting this fall. The school seeks to offer this program in order to assist students who wish to transfer from John F. Kennedy University School of Law because that school is closing and the students wish to complete their studies in a fixed facility JD program near their homes. The school was approached by 10 students from JFK School of Law because these students were seeking a fixed facility school where they could finish their degree and San Francisco Law School is the only other accredited law school program in the East Bay area. John F. Kennedy University School of Law will be closing at the end of this year discontinuing its fixed facility JD program and transferring its online JD program to North Central University. 
while all students at that school were offering were offered the opportunity to transfer to the online JD program, some students preferred to continue their study in a fixed facility classroom program. Full-time program would be based at the Emeryville campus and would be would begin by offering classes to second year and third year full-time students. Uh, last thing I'll say is uh, the, the overall requirements for graduation would be the same for both full-time and part-time students, except that the full-time students would take a compressed schedule. Ms. Leonard, do you have any additional information you want to provide? Um, yes. So just to highlight the, uh, the challenge of this particular request, uh, first of all, it addresses an example of uh, Dr. Cao's earlier question. Um, there is another school not mentioned it, mentioned by um, Alex Lawrence, but not the subject of the motion that is uh, merging. It, it has an online and a fixed facility program. It's merging with another school and will go forward only with the online. Um, so the fixed facility students transferred in part to an ABA school that's here in San Francisco, but for those who did not have the option to transfer to an ABA school, they wanted to stay in a classroom program. Uh, and this is very understandable and the school stepped up. Um, at the same time, this, uh, this school, San Francisco Law School, is going through several challenges. Uh, the first you saw today, uh, the school's NPR is below 40% at 36. Uh, and the school is undergoing an inspection right now um, in which there are likely to be a large number of recommendations made. And much as you see with Peoples, uh, they are uh, very quickly taking a large response, but they will have many steps to take. Um, this will likely be on the committee's agenda uh, for October. And as a result, that is where the staff recommendation comes from to suggest that a compromise may be to allow the transfer of these students, uh, but uh, to um, defer any consideration of adding an additional program a main issue in the inspection uh, that you'll see in October um, is that there was a question as to whether there was sufficient administrative capacity at the school. Um, since that inspection, they retired an assistant registrar and hired an experienced full-time registrar. And they also hired an additional full-time faculty member who also advises. But those um, headcount were in part addressing prior deficiencies. Um, they have tried to um, maximize the resources here. Uh, these students that will be coming for the fixed facility program will attend night school with the current students, adding just a few classes during the day uh, to try to limit um, and be efficient. Uh, but it will be an additional step as they're facing those challenges. So just want to make that context clear. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, any uh, comments on uh, this proposal? Hmm. Okay, then uh, I'm going to go ahead and present this, uh, this motion. Hold on for one second because I just, uh, I flipped it off my screen. So, excuse me one second while I pull it up again. Okay, here we go. Um, so the motion, the proposed motion from staff is that the CBE receive and file San Francisco Law School's request for a major change to add a full-time online program. Further move that the request be granted in part and denied in part. The request is granted to allow the school to offer a full-time program as a teach-out option for those students transferring from the John F. Kennedy School of Law because that school is closing. The request is denied in part as permission is not yet granted to add a permanent full-time JD program in order to allow the school to focus its efforts on retaining accreditation and protecting, a stu protecting students in the event that the school's accreditation lapses and it is required to end the full-time program. So that is the uh, proposed uh, motion, a recommendation from staff. Will anyone make that motion? Supported by Natalie and Alex's comments today. Anyone make that motion? Move. Um, made, made by Dr. Bolton. Any second? 
I'll second it, Bethany. Second by Ms. Peek. All right, uh, Ms. Wong, let's go ahead then. Ms. Lin? Yes. Dr. Agata? Yes. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Dr. Kao? Yes. Mr. Chen? Yes. Mr. Efting? Yes. Mr. Pahara? Ms. Heisinger? Yes. Mr. F Mr. Iseri? Yes. Mr. Kaplan? Yes. Mr. Kramer? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Ms. Pitt? Yes. Mr. Rios? Yes. The motion passes. All right, thank you very much. Uh, moving along to our next item, which is 0410. Now this is an action on a proposal for new rules to replace the rules for accredited law schools. You see my bird has a plenty to say about these new proposed uh, rules that uh, have been long in, in the making. Uh, Alex and uh, uh, Natalie, and I think maybe Mr. Gongora worked on these also, but go ahead, team. Sure. Yeah, sure, so uh, I'll tee it up here. Um, so this item proposes options to the committee to replace the rules for accredited law schools with an updated rule set that supports a new philosophy of accreditation grounded and focused on ensuring four key goals, consumer protection and transparency, student success, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and preparation for licensure and professionalism as an attorney. Uh, just again, give a little bit of background. Um, in January 2019, the Board of Trustees created the Committee of State Bar Accredited and Registered Schools, CS Bars, and included um, as part of its charge providing feedback to the committee and State Bar on matters relating to the promotion of new or amended accredited law school rules and the guidelines for accredited law school rules. The membership of CS Bars includes representatives from the Committee of Bar Examiners, uh, both registered and accredited law schools, and an expert in accreditation who has participated on teams involved in admissions and law school regulation at, at both the State Bar of California and the American Bar Association, ABA. And then I know that there were other members of the committee who uh, say participated as subject uh, matter team, so to speak. I know, I believe uh, Vince, uh, Dr. Agatha, Kareem, of course, mentioned earlier, Alex Chan, Esther, and Paul Kramer uh, participated in looking at some of this material as well. Um, I'm going to ask Natalie in a few minutes. We have a couple of slides to show that between uh, what CS Bars did uh, put together, um, staff also. Uh, has in uh, attachment B the resulting rules proposal created by both groups um, so that everyone can at least see where there is uh, some overlap um, between the proposals that were mentioned or that, that are being presented and then just some uh, differences as well. You know, as, as the committee reviews the proposals today, uh, it might be helpful to review um, the steps relating to uh, promoting the rules. Uh, the committee may recommend rules to the board for consideration and adoption after the rules are posted for public comment. That's generally from 60 to uh, 90 days. I don't know if everybody can hear me, but got somebody else on the line there. So, um, Let's see, I, maybe at this time, uh, Ms. Leonard, can you pull up the information, share the screen that does show uh, the slides? Sure, and um, if appropriate, uh, the chair of the CS Bars, uh, Jackie, Dean Jackie Gardena is here. Uh, would it be possible to um, recognize her while I'm preparing the slides? I think uh, she would like to thank the committee. Absolutely, absolutely. I don't know who has control of her mic, so Dean Gardena, if you could possibly raise your hand to help Devin uh, find your name in the list of attendees. She's, she's 
uh, I, I believe right I, I have been discovered. Perfect. So thank Perfect. you. Um, so thank you for this opportunity to address the committee. And, and I'm sorry, Natalie may have given you the impression I was going to thank you guys when really what I want to thank is the CS bars and all those involved. Although having sat through this um, meeting, I am um, incredibly impressed and thankful for how thoughtful you take um, you take your position on the CBE. So thank you for that. So when CS bars launched last year, we were given the opportunity to revise the accreditation rules. And I want to thank the state bar for opening the door for this project. So in concert with state bar staff, the committee entered the process with the goal to simplify the rules so that both you and the law schools could easily identify their responsibilities, modernize the rules to really insert best practices in accreditation, such as a focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and student assessment and learning, uh, and then provide room for innovation. Higher education and legal education is evolving quickly. Um, and it's accelerated in part by COVID, but also informed by research on student learning and effective teaching practices. We wanted to leave room for schools to innovate and evolve and avoid overly prescriptive rules. Um, you have before you the CS bars proposal, and I want to take a moment to thank the CS bars members who put in significant thought, time, and energy to the final product. And that's Dean Brian Pertil, Dean Greg Brandis, Dean Marty Pritkin, Dean Jay Frickberg, Greg Murphy, an outside expert with significant accreditation experience in other arenas, and then of course, Kareem Gangora, a CBE member, uh, who was a valued member of our committee. And then our, our diversity, equity, and inclusion section was shaped with the help of uh, Elizabeth Hamm, uh, Office of Access and Inclusion, and Christine Razi and, and Donna Shuley uh, of the Council of Access and Fairness. And quite honestly, our work would not have been remotely possible without Natalie Leonard. I recognize that all the state bar staff have been working under extremely stressful conditions, and she has been extraordinary during this process and should be commended for her work and getting us to this point. You will also have before you the staff proposals in addition to the CS bars proposals. And CS bars met yesterday, but we didn't have access to the staff's proposed changes until Wednesday night or late afternoon. So we weren't able to provide feedback on all of the proposed changes um, and differences between the state bar staff's proposed changes uh, and the CS bars original proposal. We did have some lively discussions yesterday on certain items that I'm sure will be incorporated into today's presentation. But I think the CBE and the Board of Trustees can anticipate that additional comments will be brought forth about our concerns uh, about some of those changes and how they impact the overall goals that we tried uh, to live by as we crafted these. So again, I want to thank everyone for the effort that they put in, those on the committee, uh, as well as the State Bar staff. I think it's an extraordinary effort to redesign um, the accreditation system and going back to the chair statement just a little while ago, this is the other really important role that you guys play. Um, the Cal accredited law schools play a really important role uh, in the legal profession here in California and I am appreciative that this pathway into the legal profession exists because you're willing to make it happen. So uh, I will pass um, on uh, my time back to the chair and I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Uh, thanks very much. Always nice to hear from you, Jackie. Jackie and I both uh, were on the CAPA committee uh, together looking at the future of um, or our bar exam here in California. Any uh, comments about uh, these uh, proposals? Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, if I wanted to give Natalie an opportunity to share a couple of more pieces oh. of information. Oh, so I'm sorry. Go ahead. Really yeah. Sorry about that. Natalie, you're muted. Much better. I have a little presentation that I'm going to show you. Um, I would encourage you during the discussion uh, with the permission of the chair to ask questions as I'm going along. I think that that might be easier if, if that works for you, Chair Brody. 
Yes, that's fine, Natalie. Okay, great. So this is just a little bit of background um, about the rules and, and the process that uh, was undertaken to get here, and also to explain a little bit of the difference between the staff proposal um, and the CSBAR's proposal. They are quite similar in many respects. There uh, is an enormous amount of overlap, um, especially as to the core principles, uh, but there are some um, elements that are different, and, uh, and we'll talk about them here. So this process started uh, with a board directive from the Board of Trustees at the beginning of last year. Uh, the Board of Trustees asked uh, for the review of the registration and accredited sta accreditation standards, and we started with the accreditation standards, uh, to modify those as needed to comport with best practices, and also to recognize regional and national accreditation from entities authorized to accredit in the first degree in law, uh, local entities doing that that you may know or you may have heard from are WASC, um, the Western Association of Schools and Colleges, as well as uh, DIAC, the Distance Education Accrediting Commission, a national organization. Um, and if those were to be recognized, what are the additional state bar requirements that should also be satisfied by those schools in order for those schools to operate law schools in California? Okay, so um, the CS bars uh, was formed in April of uh, last year and began this work. And each meeting was conducted uh, compliant with Bagley Keene requirements. Each was open. Uh, public comment was taken from anyone attending, uh, not only law school participants, but any other public comment. Uh, they started by reviewing the state bars mission and history as a regulator of law schools. Uh, they moved on to review the best practices of a wide range of accreditors. You'll see uh, who they are in a moment. Um, and moved to identify what the purposes for state bar accreditation. Why does the committee do this work? And to make sure that the rules were set up to implement and monitor those purposes. Okay, uh, so this is just a little bit of the layout um, of the schedule. Highlights of that experience, uh, meeting by meeting, included um, have, hearing from the president of WASC, uh, hearing from members of COAF, um, and really just uh, becoming uh, accreditation experts themselves. Uh, once they uh, got their background at the beginning of this year, uh, they began to draft this rule set that you'll see today. Uh, back in December, the committee heard about the four key purposes um, that were identified uh, in, the, in the rules, the consumer uh, protection and transparency, student success, diversity, equity, inclusion, and preparation for a licensure. Um, it's particularly interesting to look at the diversity, equity, and inclusion. I would say that most of the schools would identify that as a core value, but uh, never in the state bar rules um, did, was there uh, an accreditation requirement or a metric. Um, and so this is terrific to see, and it was really nice to see the ways that other accreditors are looking at this area and so interesting to see how different the frameworks were. Now, a few uh, background facts that will help you to uh, better understand and comment on um, the proposals are the following. Uh, both proposals have the same structure. Um, for the first thing that you'll notice is that they are shorter. But the second thing you'll notice is that you've only been presented with rules. And if you've read the prior, as I'm sure you so frequently do, um, you remember that there was a large set of rules um, supported by a larger set of guidelines, uh, further supported by a series of uh, policies and agreements uh, that the schools would follow. Um, while this did work well um, in terms of bringing about compliance, here what we've tried to do is actually just consolidate all of the key requirements in one place and make sure that they are all focused on these four key purposes. Uh, there still will be the possibility to create guidelines to interpret those rules where more detail is needed, uh, but we're imagining that under these proposals, far fewer guidelines uh, will be needed. Uh, there, is a there are several, primarily three major differences between the staff proposal 
and uh, the CSBARS proposal, and one of them lies here. The, uh, the committee currently has the authority uh, after the Board of Trustees creates a rule to adopt its guidelines to interpret that rule after a period of public comment and submitting that rule for feedback, uh, that guideline for feedback to CSBARS. Uh, what CSBARS suggested is that uh, the rules uh, be the the rules be the compass and that the guidelines not be enforceable uh, but rather suggested so for example the the guidelines might suggest that a school had to do a certain thing to satisfy the rules the schools may choose a different path and they may say we do not comply with the guideline but we comply with the intent intent of the rule through another method uh, the staff felt that the authority could stay with the commission to decide when it was important to give a specific guideline versus when the committee could say uh, this could be a safe harbor for the school. If the school wants to do something else in satisfaction, the committee is open to that. So this will be the first moment where I'll pause for a second. Uh, a main difference between the proposals is whether the committee's guidelines uh, can be enforced uh, or whether they will be advisory only. Um, the staff proposal would say enforced, the CSBARS proposal would say advisory. Are there any questions about that? Okay. All right, so I'll continue. Uh, the rules are structured with a safe harbor transition time period um, so that the schools can transition in an orderly fashion. Uh, we've got uh, three types of accreditation, including the new recognition of the regional accreditors. Uh, we'll talk about the process of accrediting, how to become accredited, uh, core rules of the accreditation process, which will help us to divine substantial compliance for the first time, and then uh, the non-compliance process as well. Uh, Jackie has already so eloquently uh, made all of the thank yous. There could be many. Um, I would really thank people for their time, their care, their respect, and their engagement um, in the midst of all of the things going on during this process. Um, here, this is just a quote from one of those accreditors, WASC, um, Jamie Ann Studley, who happens to also be an attorney. And um, really, this is not uh, necessarily a part of the rules, but it talks about accreditation in this current world where so much is changing so quickly. It's hoped that uh, these rules will live up to this standard, that one of the strengths of accreditation is broad concepts applied, applied to very, very different specific examples of educational pursuits and institutions. Um, so the hope was to allow a wide range of types of law schools uh, but also to provide sufficient guidelines uh, so that the consumers do get the value and so that customers of the graduates um, understand how these students were trained. Uh, just quickly, just to give you an idea, uh, this is a commission that really did the work. Um, they went through the practices of a large number of um, different accreditors, uh, really starting with very large laundry lists of um, things that were important about accreditation and boiling them down to that small level just quickly. Uh, they looked at the guiding principles of a very large number of accreditors and for every line you see here, there are probably 300 pages and additional interviews of time that went into learning um, how other groups are doing it. Okay. So this is a little bit about how the rules are organized and uh, as we go through each section, uh, we'll talk about uh, what the differences are, if any, uh, between the staff and CSBAR's proposal. I would encourage questions or for those that previewed the rules, um, if you have any comments to share, uh, please do. And at this point, I'll ask uh, Mr. Lawrence if he has any comments before I start. Yes, thanks, thanks Natalie. So um, I want to circle back to also, uh, I had mentioned that there were a number of people who had also looked at from say a subject matter, so to speak, uh, standpoint. Uh, so not to pick on anyone in particular, but um, Paul, would you have any comment? 
Um, yeah, I do. Um, I, I'll try to be uh, as quick as I can here. Um, uh, I haven't been looking at these rules for a long time. Uh, I looked briefly at them at an earlier draft at the beginning of the month when I knew I was going to be asked to, re to review a portion of them. Um, and then uh, I got them as, as the CS bars members did apparently um, Wednesday afternoon. And given that, given my career as somebody who quite often was drafting regulations and for counties and for state government, um, you know, I just couldn't look at the part of it. And, um, and my eyes automatically go to things like typographic areas or errors or inconsistencies in terminology. And so I really went through these things and discovered that um, there's, um, there's some work to be done. Um, much of it is just organizing, writing clearly. Um, uh, and there are courses, Natalie will go through a few uh, instances of policy disagreement. But um, but I think it's also important to move move forward rather than just um, put this whole thing off to another meeting so it can be worked on. What I propose is that we um, we hear about all the areas of disagreement today. We try to give um, some direction to staff about uh, what we feel how that we feel they should be resolved, and then. We, we give it to a very small working group, which I'm willing to participate in to, uh, to make the language conform to that direction. And then we bring it back um, at our next meeting. Um, and uh, in addition to what Natalie is gonna highlight, I may have two items of my own if she doesn't highlight them. But um, I would be opposed to adopting these today, but I would be equally opposed to continuing to kick the can down the road without at least um, looking it over and, and doing a little work on it. Thanks, Paul. And I also uh, think we should get some uh, feedback or input uh, from Kareem, who also obviously has put a lot of time effort, as been mentioned earlier. Um, is Kareem still with us? Yes, uh, I'm here. Sorry about that. Today is um, an interesting day. My kids start school on Monday. So distance learning is being managed in my household. So I apologize if I've been gone. Um, but I do want to speak to the process and I uh, want to thank the members of CS Bars, as well as the chair um, of, of the group, uh, Jackie Gardina, who guided us through this process. Uh, one of the things that I think I extracted from this is that our deans have valuable input. They have really legitimate concerns but they also care um, a lot about their students and about their organizations and about the influence that we all have um, in our communities. And I, I, while I know there's gonna be some additional revisions, maybe some little small tweaks, um, I do wanna say um, thank you to the committee for allowing me to participate in this process. It was a really long journey, it was a lot of reading, but I think it was most helpful for me to come in as a public member and just be neutral um, and give input, but also provide the deans uh, the ability to uh, assert what they uh, deemed was uh, very important and also help us learn all together about how we could restructure or reevaluate um, the systems that we're developing and moving forward with. And so um, overall, um, I, I, I think there's a lot to take on, right? The rules, it's a complete revamp, uh, but I think it, it, was, it, was a very, um, it was a very interesting process that we engaged in. And, you know, um, I think it's something that, you know, we could consider moving forward. So thank you for the opportunity to speak, but uh, for the most part, thank you, Natalie. Um, I can't say this enough, but you're beyond responsive. You were beyond, um, you know, uh, collaborative and you listen and you provide feedback and you um, make it an emphasis to, to really hear people out. And so I really have to praise you for the work you've done on this because I know while we're all, um, you know, participating, um, a lot of it was centered around our staff support. So thank you for that. Welcome. Uh, Thanks. Okay, anything else from Alex or Natalie? Well, I'll, I'll just make one comment. I, I echo uh, some of what Paul had mentioned too about um, exploring and looking at the differences uh, between the two uh, proposals now versus, or try to look at some of it now versus uh, pushing it off to another meeting um, as well. And uh, would definitely 
want to, if, if all those differences sort of exploring um, the, the process for addressing the non-compliance uh, areas uh, in particular. So, and, and I like that idea of, you know, from the standpoint of uh, some type of working group to sort of working with staff as well to kind of um, uh, upgrade the rules uh, a little bit, just um, some of the text and, and things that Paul mentioned earlier. So I'll just make that mention of that. Uh, well, so, and Natalie, was there anything else that you wanted to share at this time? Uh, what I had planned was to go through the sections to point the differences um, at a high level. Uh, between the uh, the staff proposal and the CS bars proposal to get some direction from the committee. Well, um, Paul, was your proposal that you and maybe one or two other CBE members uh, take a closer look at this for a presentation at the next CBE meeting uh, in October? No, well, um, but to resolve as best we can the policy differences and what our take as a committee is on them um, to inform that writing exercise with the hope that um, we could bring back something in October that um, could be adopted. Um, so, so, Natalie, yeah, maybe you want to highlight then what, where the divergent points are? Well, I believe... Uh, I believe Natalie's slides will do most of it. And if, at most, I may have two other items to point out at the end. Robbie, I promise not to recreate the 10 separate five hour meetings of CS bars in this presentation. No, uh, uh, I'm sure you won't, but I'm, I'm just wondering, we, we have been uh, at our meeting this afternoon for more than two hours, mm -hmm. uh, which is a little long. And I wonder if we might, if this would be a good time to just take a break for 10 minutes to uh, refuel and then come back on. I'm getting a thumbs up from Paul, which is a, a rarity. So <laughs> I, I think I should capitalize uh, on that. Let's all just uh, spread, uh, you know, stretch our legs and such and meet back, uh, say, at, you know, five minutes to, to three, and we'll finish up uh, this very, you know, this is another, wow, you know, really a, a big deal for the CBE. I, I'm, I'm so proud of us uh, for working on this stuff. So let's come back uh, at about five minutes too and we'll finish this up and then we'll finish up our, our open session of the meeting. Okay, see everybody soon.
Okay, we are coming back on. I got my snacks. I got my Dr. Hauschka. Let's see everybody. Let me see Dr. Cow, Paul, Dr. Agatep, Ms. Heisinger, Mr. Reyes, Mr. Efting, Ms. Peak, Mr. Brody Chan, Dr. Isiri, Mr. Gangura, Mr. Kaplan, Dr. Bolton, and Ms. Lynn. Looks like everybody is back. Mr. Efting, are you back from your hearing already? Yes. Oh, awesome. Okay. All right. Um, let's go back on the record on our uh, August 21st uh, Committee of Bar Examiners meeting. We are talking about uh, uh, Ed standards, and we are uh, in item number 0410. These are new rules proposed for accredited uh, law schools. And uh, I think I interrupted you, Natalie, in the middle of presenting, so please uh, continue. Okay, thank you, Robbie. Um, always your prerogative, Mr. Chair. Go, go. Okay, here we go. Okay, so um, in terms of the process that we went through to make these rules, um, as they were being developed uh, for the proposals, uh, we used a large grid. There would be two columns in the grid. Uh, the first one would be a um, CS bars proposal. The second would be a staff comment. And then we uh, very quickly learned we needed to add uh, further comment sections for each. And so for each of these sections, um, there is difference between the proposals in some ways, uh, but those differences have been discussed um, over the course of the drafting period um, since the beginning of the year. Uh, the CS bars proposal was uh, finalized in um, June and much as Mr. Kramer has suggested here was sent to an editing team of two. Um, and those issues that remained unresolved uh, between staff and CS bars uh, were placed into the um, into the staff proposal um, after discussing them over the course of the last about eight or nine months, about half of the process. Um, okay, so the the first difference, as I mentioned, is between uh, the rules and the guidelines. Um, the staff proposal would have guidelines as enforceable. Uh, the state bar proposal would have them as, a, as advisory. Uh, the school could establish its compliance as a rebuttable presumption if they could show I'm not in compliance with the guideline, but I am in compliance with uh, the core nature of the rule. Um, so this would be one of those topics, like Paul mentioned, that could go forward. Um, I asked if there were any questions earlier. Um, I don't know if there is any uh, direction that the committee would like to give on this topic. I said keep moving, Natalie. Okay, great. And, and if the comment is not here, then I would understand that it could be delegated to the editing team that Mr. Kramer has suggested. Um, in terms of the transition period, a five-year transition, progress tracked in the annual reporting so that they don't wait until the end of the time. Um, the staff and uh, CS bar is very similar. Um, just want clarity that if the school is moving to the new proposal, it's the new set of rules uh, and any guidelines that may be created. If it's the old, it's the old proposal and the old guidelines. Uh, yesterday, CS bar suggested a little bit of cleanup language that um, I think is a good idea. Okay, um, whoops, okay. We talked about the three types of accreditation, the current uh, fully deemed accredited status for ABA, the state bar accreditation, and a new deemed accredited status for those that are accredited by regional and national accreditors. 
So uh, what would those regional and national accreditors have to do in addition to their, um, their institutional accreditation? And you can see that here. These are core uh, rules or procedures that either um, help the state bar to do its regulatory work, uh, help consumers to understand what they'll be receiving as part of their education or what their responsibilities will be, uh, and make sure that, um, that the schools will produce graduates that are eligible to take the bar. Um, so CS bars reviewed the rules and identified uh, these nine core rules, and we'll use these nine core rules here and in another context in a moment. Um, the schools would generally uh, establish their compliance with these rules if they're in a deemed status uh, through the annual report and the annual report or periodic report would be reviewed to make sure that all of these elements were adequately addressed. Um, the other way that these rules would be used is that a substantial compliance definition is proposed for the first time. For some time now, the committee has indicated that there are certain rules um, which are, uh, are so important that no level of non-compliance may be allowed. And these are the rules that are suggested for that. Um, you see that in practice when you look at the NPR as this committee acted today. And now by designating these as core rules uh, where any deviation can risk accreditation, uh, you make a clear statement. I think it was always the committee's intention, but it's clarified. Natalie, um, can you go back? Sure. Yes. Okay, so 4.160C is the diversity um, and inclusion policies. Um, that is actually not on the list in the draft. I'm sorry, that's correct. I actually just meant to bring that up for a quick comment. You are correct. Um, the 4.160C is not recommended for inclusion, and you may query why, uh, because it is new uh, and it is unanimously supported. Um, reason being, the regional accreditors generally have support in this area, and also unlike the other elements, this is not a specific metric. It asks the schools to create a plan, uh, to have metrics in those plans, and to evaluate and respond to the findings. So it's uh, characteristically different than the others. I apologize, I meant to highlight, and I, I thank you, Paul. Um, as to the four different areas, um, in terms of consumer protection and transparency, uh, the staff and CS bars proposal uh, were very close to each other. Um, in terms of that, making sure that the school has clear policies, uh, clear and fair advertising, um, those sort of background things, and it maintains the level of disclosures that are currently required. In terms of student success, uh, this is a much slimmed down list from what you saw pre previously, um, but it is one of the two, the three areas of the most disagreement with CS bars. Um, this student success area includes the elements that are required for students to be eligible for the bar, and it gives baseline standards uh, for the various programs. It keeps the recently adopted uh, standards that this body adopted last year, uh, through board ratification in May uh, regarding a JD being at least an 80 credit program that can translate into 1200 hours of engagement to allow for the online programs. Um, and uh, just a moment to say, this was a very historic day for the committee, accrediting for the first time three online programs. And that could only happen because of your creation of this rule, excuse me, there we go. Um, the staff proposal returned uh, to this area several sections uh, that were addressed by the eligibility department of the agency uh, largely um, to ensure that uh, that transcripts that documents uh, were uh, what we needed for ultimate eligibility and so that schools could as often as possible preserve a student's opportunity to use the four-year rule if they didn't graduate with JDs. Um, in the conversation yesterday, uh, CS bars uh, generally rejected those changes um, which are in the staff proposal, um, finding them prescriptive and finding them that um, would be something that would uh, be included 
in their practice at, on a normal possibility, but uh, felt that there was too much direction from the state bar um, in the staff proposal. And I'm going to just check in with Paul and Alex at this point to see if I've adequately described uh, that issue or if there's anything that they would like to add at this point. And I see that Paul is on mute. Are you, are you going to explain in more detail the deemed accredited status at, uh, later? Um, I was not beyond what I was going to do, so I'd be happy to address any question that you have. No, go ahead. Um, I'll just fill in at the end if I think okay. we need to. Okay. Uh, the diversity, equity, and inclusion section was one where uh, both sides agreed completely, and it has the full support of the Office of Access and Inclusion, as well as the working group formed from the Committee on Access and Fairness. It allows the school to create a mission-appropriate plan, identify metrics, requires the school to evaluate that plan, and adjust based on its findings. Um, the final section, preparation for licensure and professionalism, uh, is largely uh, about two areas. Number one, uh, preparing students to be able to take the bar should they choose to do so, uh, and ensuring a level of success as measured by the MPR requirement. Also requiring practical skills training um, and the sorts of things that will prepare um, an, a student for ethical, competent, professional practice. Largely, CSBAR's uh, proposal tracked the staff proposal, vice versa. Mm. Um, this uh, third area, accreditation and continuing compliance, was um, relatively uh, similar mm -hmm. as between the two. It suggested through a few changes versus now, um, allowing the committee the latitude to increase the time between inspections if a school implements, um, it has an exemplary performance at an inspection, uh, but not if uh, it does not. And there would also continue to be periodic reporting. Uh, the, the wording was changed from annual to periodic to allow the committee to offer less frequent reporting if it chose to do so, but wouldn't be required to do so. That would be the sort of thing that would be covered in a guideline. Uh, the most area of disagreement was found uh, relative to assessing and addressing uh, non-compliance. And the easiest way that I could think of to do that was to lay out some of the steps um, in the process. And so uh, I, with uh, all due respect to, Mr. to Dr. Cow arriving today, uh, the other members of the committee ex had some experience with the non-compliance process in a couple of instances over the course of this calendar year. So it may be fresh in your mind. Uh, the staff proposal was designed to address some of the feedback that was received by staff during that process. Uh, that feedback included uh, being sure that, uh, the, uh, that it could take action when it felt action needed to be taken, um, that when schools were offered intermediate opportunities to respond, that the response contains the type of information that the committee needed to uh, make an effective decision and to be able to carry out that decision. Um, in addition, uh, when termination uh, is a sanction, which the committee suggested would be a very infrequent sanction, uh, they endorsed the possibility for the school as a result to transition to registered status. Um, if you would compare the ABA status, they would generally allow a school an opportunity to teach out, but they do not have a registered or alternate status. And so the teach out plan is offered because otherwise the, the school would simply close the door um, and lock it, uh, leaving the students with an option. But um, the committee structure is already more flexible. Uh, also, it, it focuses the hearing uh, to the termination sanction, uh, offering the school an opportunity to respond at points that I'll describe in a moment, um, but focusing the hearing uh, only if there is a termination decision. Uh, after the termination, there could be a hearing and in any case apply to the California Supreme Court. Uh, the CS bars proposal uh, would act, so this would somewhat streamline the framework. 
the CSBARS proposal would um, expand the framework and offer additional opportunities for the school to respond. They would add the gray uh, areas here, a notice of intent to make findings of non-compliance. Uh, the committee, based on informal feedback uh, interpreted through staff, and uh, pointed out that very often when the committee's making a non-compliance decision, it's because you've already got an inspection before you, or you've already got uh, stipulated data before you. And so uh, it was felt that you could move to the notice of non-compliance. Uh, the response under the staff proposal would either establish the school's compliance, if the committee is mistaken, uh, or it would require the school to give its best available estimate and plan to return to compliance. Um, so the committee would have specifics. Uh, the CS bars proposal would allow at each step, each bullet point here up through um, interim monitoring, uh, the school to request not only a response, uh, but also an inspection. So you would have notice of intent to make finding of non-compliance response, inspection, a notice of non-compliance, response, inspection. Um, if it was not solved and there would be a notice of in intent to impose sanctions, response, inspection. Um, so position, Natalie, is, yeah. is, you, is your color coding off there? It seems to me the notice of intent to impose sanctions should be gray because that's a CS bars proposal. Is that right? Um, no, uh, well, uh, oops, here you go. No, I wasn't intending to do that. Uh, I was intending for this to be black uh, because it's thought that there would be a notice, uh, then the school would respond, and then this is where the committee would, would make either their probation with the proper level or their termination. So uh, this would actually stay. But it's something, it's a step the committee has to go through. I, I was... It Maybe I'm wrong process. here, but I was guessing that your color coding is the black is the streamlined process that the new rules would require, and the gray are other features that the um, CS bars would like to add to the process. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So how can notice of intent be black and imposition of sanctions um, not be black because obviously we have to. Uh, here it should be like this. This one. There you go. Okay, that makes sense. So, and uh, so what we what staff is proposing is, you give your notice. And you just you go to right right to the notice. You don't you don't give them a warning or that we're about to think about uh, giving a notice. And if once we decide that we want to sanction, we don't have to first say, "Hey, we're thinking about sanctioning you." We can just do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's correct. Uh, but also, just to be clear, I don't think the committee is intending to jump out and yell surprise and issue a notice of noncompliance it's considered that there would be an inspection um, as a matter of course, the way that you always do, and that there would be a lot of discussion or reports submitted where the numbers are stipulated. And so the school would have been well aware and there would have been discussions at minimum with staff, if not also uh, with the school beforehand. And then as far as the sanctions, uh, the schools would propose the addition of an interim monitoring option, which is optional. Uh, that could be to prevent a problem or to deal with a, a minor problem. Um, and then after completing the optional interim monitoring, uh, there would be a move to probation for two years that could be extended for two more. Um, and ultimately, if the school did not reach compliance after those steps, uh, the, the accreditation could be terminated, but it would be a best practice to have notice of at least 180 days in part to allow uh, a teach out plan. Uh, so these are markedly different in their strategies. Um, one would offer the committee the ability to respond more quickly to noncompliance. Um, the other would allow more steps. 
of process and response uh, for the schools. But it doesn't require um, speed. It just allows it where we think it's appropriate. That's correct. And at any point in the process, the committee could say, we'd like to pause here so as to get more information, either through a data request or through an inspection. But the CS bars, do, does their proposal make it mandatory that we, we step through interim monitoring before we can impose probation? Not interim monitoring. Uh, interim monitoring is set as optional in the proposal. Um, I do wonder if it could be a challenge uh, to differentiate between the conditions that would belong in the interim monitoring versus probation. Um, another issue is that many other accreditors do use interim monitoring. It's a really standard thing. But the difference is most of them use it much like a private reproval in discipline. It is uh, private, the school doesn't post it, and it's in secret. And so it's an incentive for the school to act very quickly so that it does not become public. Um, and here, the committee actually wouldn't have that option because it would be imposed in a public forum under this public process and the terms would be public. Uh, so it, it, it's a little bit different. It doesn't uh, necessarily comport with committee circumstances. Okay. Um, any, any questions about uh, this area of sharp divergence uh, between CS bars and, um, and, and the committee proposal, I'm sorry, the staff proposal? Natalie, this is Robbie. Again, I, I just want to make sure that I'm clear on your highlighting that the notice of non-compliance is not sprung on the school. It is part of a process that the school is aware of and involved in. Uh, yes, yeah, so very much like what you saw today with the inspections and such, uh, circumstances are brought back to you and you can see the collaborative process that staff goes through with the schools, uh, giving notice, uh, explaining the problem clearly, um, accepting progress reports while the committee is waiting to schedule the item, and uh, that, that would continue. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Kramer, did you have additional items that you wanted to distinguish from the staff recommendations uh, in the what Natalie just presented? or did we cover them? No, um, one I alluded to, but, uh, um, and that was that in the list of, uh, well, let me go back. Okay. We've, we're creating this concept of deemed approved um, schools or deemed accredited schools. And apparently some people really think that term is great. And, and so I believe we're stuck with keeping it. I think it's confusing. Because uh, what it is, is a school who must already be accredited by us, um, it then gets accredited by WASC or some other accrediting entity, um, then is deemed accredited. So you might think that you could just go to WASC and get accredited, and then you would be deemed accredited with us. That's not the case. I think the rules are clear enough, but you, I, I imagine staff is going to get the occasional question from somebody, and they're going to have to walk them through why that's the case. Um, but, uh, but then uh, she put up earlier, and I pointed out that there was a list of core um, requirements. And um, those, those are the ones that apply to um, these deemed accredited schools. The other requirements in our standards do not apply, including that they don't have to be inspected or uh, or including an exemption from inspection. And the thought there is that the, although WASC doesn't look at the details of the law curriculum, they, they are, their standards are generally thought by us to be more uh, comprehensive, thorough, um, and wide reaching than our standards. And so we are assuming that if WASC uh, goes over them and determines they comply with WASC standards and accredits them, that our, our goals will be met. Um, I would just point out that we say in our definition 
that any um, a creditor that's recognized uh, by the uh, United States Department of Education and authorized by DOE to accredit schools offering a professional degree in law could accredit a law school, one of our law schools, and and get them into this status. Um, I don't want to get into all the controversy about what the U.S. Department of Education has been doing lately, but um, uh, I'll just point out that we are making that um, uh, we are putting that our confidence in that agency that it will um, not approve accreditors that are um, uh, whose standards are are less than we are assuming. Um, my other comment and my last one to point out. So, uh, so the core requirements don't don't include actually they don't mention the diversity requirements, and that's um, that struck me as odd given the emphasis. Uh, that, you know, we've had um, uh, over time uh, in those issues. Uh, on the one hand, the thought is that WASC will have standards that will be at least as good. And therefore, we, um, we don't need to mention it in this context. But as a statement of our values, it just strikes me as odd. And I would also point out that the standards um, really what they require is that the schools have a plan and processes, not that they be, they're not particularly prescriptive about what those plans say and do. And so it should be fairly easy to meet the requirement. Um, I could go either way um, on whether that should be in the list, but I, I just noted it as a, you know, it just struck me when I saw it that it was odd that it was not among uh, those core um, objectives and requirements that we were identifying. And in my final, um, well, my final comment about the rules is if I can share my screen, um, it is in, okay, let me try again. It is in the evidentiary standard for a hearing. You seen it? Yeah, so thank you. I appreciate that. We were also talking about that. So when the draft rules talk about an evidentiary hearing um, before the committee on, um, for instance, termination, um, they say this, they have this first paragraph here, any relevant evidence is admissible, but in the event of a dispute as to admissibility, evidence will not, will not be excluded, but will be heard subject to an instruction to the panel to disregard the evidence in making the decision. That, to use a legal term, is, um, nod with me, Robbie, goofy. Mm. It's basically letting either party exclude evidence um, by just saying I dispute it. But even more odd, well, it doesn't allow for any, anybody to, to decide whether the evidence should be excluded or not. And then it says, let's say it, but then let's pretend we didn't hear it. Um, what I would propose to add in there in its place is a standard that comes from the government code. Um, your agency may be subject to this, Robbie, maybe not, but many administrative agencies are. I know we adopted this or similar language at the Energy Commission. And it says any relevant evidence shall be admitted if it is, in the, is the sort of evidence upon which responsible persons are accustomed to rely in the conduct of serious affairs. And then there's a um, and it says, regardless of the existence of any common law or statutory rule, which might make it improper if we were in a civil court. Um, I'm not sure we need that last part, but um, uh, but certainly I think the first part is, is the appropriate standard and um, certainly much better than what was in the draft. Um, and then my final comment is, um, I really would like us to at least ask of the Board of Trustees that they refer, they loop the, um, the comments that are received uh, on the, um, uh, the, the draft, the final draft when it is uh, put out for public comment back through us. So we get an opportunity to review those and offer our thoughts to the Board of Trustees about what the appropriate responses should be. We don't have the final say, but if this isn't policy making, I don't know what is. And, 
they have of late freed us, supposedly freed our time to make policy. So I say, let's do it. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, Alex, what, Natalie, was there anything else that either of you wish to add? Well, I, I have a question more. So Natalie, um, just with respect to the interim monitoring, I know that in many of us, it kind of says not to exceed a certain time frame. But is that time period that is specified uh, up to the committee, right? Uh, yes, in, in and it would generally tend to be a shorter time period. Okay, got it. Thank you. So, <clears throat> committee members, the proposal from staff is that the revised rules, as presented in Natalie's proposal, be recommended to the Board of Trustees to circulate for a 90-day public comment period and further consideration for adoption by the Board of Trustees. I have uh, a quick comment before we go there. Okay, Mr. Gangora. Thank you so out. much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Natalie, there's on page 27 of 0410, there was an edit we made yesterday in regards to language. Um, is this the appropriate opportunity to discuss that or how would you prefer to receive it? Um, yesterday, the uh, materials that were received were recorded as public comment from the CS bars. Uh, so this 0410 um, was not changed uh, to reflect anything that was discussed yesterday. Okay, uh, just for the record, um, I think we wanted uh, may versus should um, as a possible change in there. So I think that was recorded in yesterday or how would, how would that be recorded? And the, and the rule 4.162 periodic inspection. Uh, that would be uh, recorded along with uh, other similar types of requests um, as part of the CS bars minutes. And um, if a working group is created here, it would also be shared with them. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Okay, anybody else have any, uh, oh, and what I was saying was the uh, proposed motion is that the uh, revised accredited law school rules be recommended. So this is what Natalie has presented, uh, be presented to the Board of Trustees to circulate for a public comment period and for further uh, consideration. Um, I have a, a comment, uh, Chair. Okay, go, uh, ahead. go ahead. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, I need to thank Natalie for kind of giving me a tutorial lesson on how to even understand <laughs> uh, all of this. And there's so, there was so much work put in and I sort of uh, came in and, and last minute and had a section to look at. Uh, so I had to kind of quickly uh, understand what uh, the other accreditation or what the role of the other accreditation uh, uh, institutes are, such as WASC and DIAC. And uh, fortunately, I did. Uh, I was able to participate in one of the uh, uh, accreditation law school visits. So that's sort of, I wasn't totally in the dark, but uh, these policies are somewhat confusing. So I understand that there's, you're, you know, this is building a platform and that there's uh, some overlap between WIAC and I mean, WASC and, and, and DIAC. And uh, Natalie, in fact, brought this out yesterday and, and Paul, you're talking about it uh, today, which is uh, how we deal with a section on diversity. And uh, I'm, uh, my take on this is it, it's true that WIAC, uh, or, or I'm sorry, WASC or even DIAC may have their own set of standards and guidelines on this. And it's very difficult to be uh, prescriptive on uh, some of these issues uh, in terms of what your plan should be, because some of it's, uh, you know, regional, some of it's, you could look at as guiding principles or, or however you want to look at it. But I do think that uh, for the CS bars version or, uh, and what we look at uh, in terms of um, uh, greater emphasis on that, because this is, California and we do kind of set the standard for what other bars should be looking at and in fact what the nation might be looking at in terms of 
uh, what's important to us in terms of our values. So if there's a way to take a look at this and give it some emphasis, uh, I don't know uh, if it can be that prescriptive. Uh, again, because of what I said, some of this would be different for different schools, different institutions. But uh, I, I just, you know, I don't, I don't, didn't want to just let it go and just sort of be another point. I thought that there needs to be some emphasis with that. Thank you. So, Robbie, can I um, mention something here? So, go ahead, uh, go ahead Amy. It, it's clear that um, the committee needs more time with this material. I mean, um, Jackie mentioned it. Um, Paul mentioned it, and it, and uh, and you know that we did have a delay in getting it um, on board. Um, and the delay obviously is from the amount of work and the and that was required behind the scenes. And so, what I want to recommend, and I think um, it's been put up, it's clearly like the motion, um, you know, assumes a lot I mean, that you know a lot of this has been digested, and it's a. I mean, I think everybody's recognized there are so many different components to this. A lot of time and effort and resources were invested in getting this um, done. And so I'm wondering if it would be um, possible to maybe parse this out, you know, and, um, and bring it back. Because I think there, it sounds like there's still more questions perhaps that could uh, be raised that People aren't ready to vote on this as a final product. There are different components. Natalie's demonstrated the areas where uh, there is a, a discrepancy between, you know, or um, there is an agreement between the CS bars and the staff proposal. Paul's highlighted areas that, um, with really good suggestions that we might want to incorporate. There might be more. Um, and again, the time constraints, I think, have contributed to, um, you know, us, I think, not being able to advance this. Um, or, you know, I, I just want the committee to realize that we don't have that pressure um, if they feel that way. Um, we could buy some time um, and find uh, another way of um, advancing the product because I, I agree with what Paul said is like, you know, uh, we could take this opportunity to still find a way to um, uh, advance this um, end product. So. Um, I want to just put that out there as an alternative to the motion. I'm not making the motion. I'm just um, trying to describe the parameters, like new parameters that we could work in because the one that we have in front of us may not be feasible for everybody at this moment. Uh, okay, I, I don't have a problem with that. I, I just don't like kicking the can when so much work has, has been done. Uh, uh, and Paul, going back, did you say that you would like, you would be, uh, willing to work with another CBE member or two to fine tune what you want to present to the CBE? Was that? Yes, yes. I'm, uh, or even if it's just me, I can work with Natalie and we can, uh, we can, um, I would call it um, clarify and clean up the language. Um, and, uh, um, we haven't really received a lot of direction today, and that's fine if you know if people need more time to consider it. But but there still is work to do just organizationally um, on the the language of the rules. That um, you know if 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 that's taken care of, um, then you hear less from me the next time, and I'm pretty sure that would be welcome. Well, well you haven't heard. My, I mean, the the committee has not been asked to vote, and. Uh, uh, you know, I'm sure people do have an opinion one way or the other, but if you, uh, Natalie, do you think there would be some benefit to going back with Paul to clean up at least what is going to be the staff recommendation to the CBE? I don't want to, sub. I, I mean, I, I want to have an opportunity for everyone to uh, approve or not approve, but I don't want to substitute our judgment when you're when it's still a work in progress. Do, do you want to do that? I mean, you'd have until October. You're muted. You're muted. I think that that's a reasonable option to do, um, and then to place it out with more time for the committee. Um, to to think about it, they've learned a lot about it uh, today and could digest it and feel extremely comfortable 
um, at the next meeting. It's very rare that the committee is replacing an entire rule set and um, we could go forward, but it, we also do have the time to make sure that you're 100% invested in the product. Okay, Paul, if you don't mind, I, I don't see any reason to add another cook to the broth because you've got a firm, I mean, we've all followed your analyses today. I, I'm not sure I, I agree with all of it, but between you and Natalie, uh, I'm sure you're going to come up with a consensus to present to the CBE. Um, if there's anybody that is interested in working with Paul and Natalie, I mean, this is a big deal. This, this, these are going to be the, you know, ultimately what is used for accreditation of law schools in our state as well. If there's Mr. anybody that would, that would, oh yes, Dr. Cow. Mr. Chairman, I would be interested in working uh, on this. Okay, well, why don't you, um, uh, Natalie, you'll, you've got all the addresses, maybe get in touch with Dr. Cow and Mr. Kramer after the meeting to maybe set up a, you know, a, a, a way to pass the, uh, pass the regs around. Terrific. I'd be happy to do that. Thank you. Okay. Wow. Thanks, Dr. Cow. Thank you. The first thing you'll regret. Here we go. This will be it. <laughs> okay. Well, then uh, I'm not going to call for any motion because, well, I, and I'm not going to say we're kicking the can down the road because we're, we're kind of firming up what will be presented uh, to us. Uh, so I think then we can go to our next item, which uh, yeah, is I, I think procedurally you might have to act on it because uh, there is an action requested by the um, by the by the body. Yeah, I believe that um, we need a motion. I think you need a motion to table it uh, so we could bring it back. And is that a motion you're making? Yeah, I mean, I definitely want to see Paul uh, get into the trenches. And uh, awesome. Dr. Michael Cow as well. Any any second to that motion? The motion is to to table this to our our next meeting pending a review by a subcommittee of the CBE. Any I'll second? second the, I'll second the motion. All right, second by Mr. Ray, made by Mr. Gongora, and second by Mr. Reyes and Ms. Wong, if you wouldn't mind. Ms. Lin. Yes. Dr. Agata? Yes. Dr. Bolton? Dr. Kao? Yes. Mr. Chen? Yes. Mr. Efting? Yes. Mr. Gongora? Aye. Ms. Heisinger? Yes. Mr. Iseri? Yes. Mr. Kaplan? Yes. Mr. Kramer? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Ms. Peek? Yes. Mr. Reyes? Yes. Dr. Bolton? The motion passes. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, item L, much of which has, has been covered in previous uh, items is uh, report on new uh, administrative leadership at law schools. This is item 0411. Mr. Lawrence, if you want to highlight those promotions. Sure. Yeah, sure. No motion required on these, but uh, we have four items here. Irvine University College of Law has appointed a new registrar, Veronica Jimenez, who holds a master's degree in education from the University of Southern California. Lincoln Law School of San Jose will change its law school web domain to www.lincolnlaw.edu. San Francisco Law School has hired a new registrar and student advisor, Karen McRae, who previously served as assistant registrar at United States University and registrar at Swedish, you know, Swedish Institute, a college of health sciences. And finally, Western Sierra Law School has named both a new dean, Joshua Schoonover and a new registrar, Erica Schoonover, both are graduates of the law school who you heard about earlier. Okay, awesome. Thank you for that update and no, um, no motion required there. Finally, uh, we've got your uh, 
head standards, goals, and accomplishments. Uh, you'll be passing these along to a, a new ed standards chair, Mr. Lawrence. So go easy on he or she. Absolutely, absolutely. I think we should add a few more, but I'll just uh, make comments on the ones that are existing. Um, again, everybody has uh, the list there, but you can see some of the, it's been a busy year, some of the key highlights that accredited schools added online programs, registered schools, um, accredited online programs, um, and, uh, you know, committee passed for some forward thinking uh, waivers in light of the COVID uh, situation. So, you know, I would like to publicly thank Natalie uh, Leonard also for supporting me in this role over the past year as all the other committee members, as you can see today's, uh, I don't think, I think this has sort of been the norm, uh, at least when this is agenda items come up for Ed Standards, it goes beyond just uh, a, a few moments, but appreciate everybody's patience and input and things of that nature. So um, I don't have any other comments, but uh, like always, I wanna, Say, Ms. Leonard, do you have any other additional information or suggestions or comments? Uh, only just to thank the committee. Uh, this was a year of unprecedented um, firsts and probably unprecedented workload uh, for educational standards, and uh, you handled it admirably, doing many things for the first time, responding to a global pandemic, creating an online accreditation system, accrediting the first online schools, um, and I've appreciated the guidance, uh, the thought, the care um, as the committee takes schools into the future. So thank you. And uh, look forward to what the next year will bring. Thanks very much. And let's all use our clap hands button for the Ed Standards team, Natalie and Alex Lawrence. Wow, thanks very much, great job. Moving on to- Do we need to adopt the goal? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, would anybody make a motion to adopt those uh, those goals from Ed Standards? I'll move. This is Kareem. Moved by Mr. Gangora. And any second there? Second, Esther. Second by Ms. Uh, Lynn. Okay, Ms. Wong, if you would be so kind. Ms. Lynn? Yes. Dr. Agatha? Yes. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Dr. Kao? Yes. Mr. Chen? Mr. Efting? Yes. Mr. Gongora? Yes. Ms. Heisinger? Yes. Mr. Isari? Yes. Mr. Kaplan? Yes. Mr. Kramer? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Ms. Pick? Yes. Mr. Reyes? Yes. Mr. Chan? The motion passes. Okay, thank you very much. And now, Ms. Heisinger, I must turn the attention to you for the moral character uh, goals. Thank you. Um, I'd like to begin by also uh, acknowledging Tara Clark, and David and the entire staff of the Moral Character uh, Department. Um, this will be my last uh, chairing of this committee and I, I do want to take this last opportunity I have to, to uh, acknowledge them and thank them. Um, the other thing I wanna say is that moral character is always um, <clears throat> Uh, short and sweet compared with other committee reports. So you can be uh, grateful for that. So in reviewing our, our goals for the, this um, season, we'll be ending this, this period with uh, seven goals. We completed four of them and uh, we have three, a couple of ongoing ones, and one that uh, we're looking forward to, number five, we'll be looking forward to a uh, presentation on uh, rehabilitation as related to moral character. <clears throat> and we'll be uh, looking at that uh, in the October meeting. 
also um, will have on, an, un, an ongoing um, goal of additional trainings to look forward to in the next year. <clears throat> um, and finally, our, our seventh goal is an ongoing uh, goal in which the um, committee conducts administrative reviews of adverse moral character determinations. Um, we have two that we will discuss in closed session today, but that is the end of our uh, whole presentation. Can I just add on? Um, well, first I'd like to thank Dolores. She's always so responsive anytime we have any questions for her about cases that are in state bar court or for the administrative reviews. Um, one thing that's not reflected in the goal since it was on the staff to complete, but related to goal number one, is we did get all of the documents for the Moral Character Working Group up and on the website. So if you haven't had a look, a chance to take a look at that, um, we do encourage you to do so. We did have to play around with the names of the documents a little bit, so it's no longer called the decision matrix, since after the graphic designer got a hold of it, it, it doesn't look like a table, it's a PDF instead. Um, but there's a lot of information about moral character now online, so I would just suggest that you all take a look when you have a chance. So, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So, we, uh, we need to adopt the goals, approve the goals. Yes, is there a, a motion then to approve the goals for mor moral character today? This is Bethany, I'll move. So moved by Ms. Peek and any second? Second. Second by, uh, I'm sorry. Michael. Oh, Michael Dr. Cow. I'm sorry. Second <laughs> by Dr. Cow. Okay, Ms. Uh, Wong. Ms. Lin. Yes. Dr. Agata. Yes. Dr. Bolton. Yes. Dr. Cow. Yes. Mr. Chen. Mr. Efting? Yes. Mr. Gongora? Yes. Ms. Heisinger? Yes. Mr. Iseri? Yes. Mr. Kaplan? Yes. Mr. Kramer? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Ms. Pitt? Yes. Ms. Re Mr. Reyes? Yes. The motion passes. Okay, thank you very much. Now, CBE members, that, that concludes the uh, open session of our uh, meeting. Uh, I, I personally am inclined to uh, adjourn and start our closed session meeting uh, tomorrow morning uh, because I, I don't think we would be able to complete it today. And this is quite a long day to be sitting in front of a, a Zoom screen. Um, if the, if the committee's preference is to plow forward and begin our closed session now and go for a certain amount of time, of course, I'm, I'm happy to do that, but I have no problem uh, uh, adjourning and picking up tomorrow mm -hmm. morning at, um, at 8.30, 8.30 or 9 o'clock. What, what, what do you say about that, Larry Kaplan, which is your preference? Uh, I'd say, yeah, good idea, adjourn, and let's just pick up tomorrow. How about, how about you, Kareem Gongora in the snow? <laughs> I, I, would, I would agree with you. Um, and uh, thank you for um, opening that up to all of us because it, it has been a long day. And I'm, I'm babysitting right now. <laughs> how, how about you, Ms. Peek? I agree with you 100%. It's been a long day. Okay. Dr. Bolton, are you in agreement also? Yes. All right. Uh, and uh, Mr. Reyes? Uh, sure. Let's take a break. Okay. Ms. Heisinger? Uh, let's do it. Let's adjourn. Okay. All right. I'm not even going to go to Michael Isiri because I, I know what he would say. Oh, yes. <laughs> Just uh, one, one tiny point of clarification. So what we're going to do is uh, you as the chair will call an overnight recess because we actually have to begin with close tomorrow, but then come back into open session to adjourn like we normally do. Right. So we're to do an overnight recess of the open session begin with close tomorrow and then we'll come back to open to adjourn tomorrow right so what do you what what is the preference you can just shout out 8 30 or 9 o'clock 
eight thirty. Well, we've noticed nine, so I think we're stuck with that. Oh, we've noticed wow. nine o'clock. Oh, mm, all right. Well, then I suppose it's a closed session, so we we can adjust that because I believe if we like, I would just as soon start at eight thirty. Um, I also like nine o'clock more. Oh, you like nine o'clock more? And you want to get your twin involved and see which time he would prefer, because I don't know which one of you will, will be hearing. Dr. Cow, how about you? Um, 9 a.m., if possible. All right, then let's stick with our proposed schedule. So we, so tomorrow morning, we will be calling in to the closed session uh, Zoom uh, link that you should have received.